Hi, everybody. Welcome to Stop the FOMO. Today, we're having a calibration Wednesday. It's an all-day calibration day. I am here with Sammy Prescott. As you can see him up front, there he is. Hey, Sammy. As soon as he's done calibrating all the TVs, we're going to start talking what his observations are. Now, just real quick, what TVs do we have here? So on the very top, and I have it labeled, so let me know. Also, let's check audio as well before I get too deep into this. Check, check my audio. How's my audio? I'm trying something new today, so if the audio is off, this is the time to let me know, and I'll make my adjustments now. And let's see, great, audio is good to go. Excellent. So we have far left S95C that's being calibrated right now. The LG G3. He just finished calibrating it. He spent all morning calibrating it. <laughs> it's been here since like 8.30 to 9, and he just finished about 45 minutes ago or so. Now, just so you guys know, because the G3 uses WOLED technology, it looks, it will, its white point will not look the same as the other TVs, okay? So if you were here eyeballing it, it would look very similar white point to, let's say, the S95C or the TCLs. But because it's a WOLED, there's always going to be a blue tint that's pushing blue. So don't use the stream as a way to compare colors, but we could use it to compare luminances because at least that is something my camera can capture to a certain degree. And so listen to what we say and what Sammy says in terms of his observations uh, as far as color. But because the LG G3 is the only TV here who's WOLED, that is a WOLED panel, then it will be the one that looks the bluest or the coolest. But that's not what I see. Although right now everything else is being calibrated, so colors all over the place regardless. So the TV that has been calibrated, only one so far, is the G3. The S95C is in process, and that's a 77-inch. The Q7 is the top right-hand corner. Below that is the U7K, and below the G3 is the TCL QM8. I know you guys are excited. And before we get further, you guys are wondering, wait, what happened to the Hisense U8K? Unfortunately, it's still not here. It will be here next week. I spoke to Hisense, and they they weren't able to get it out in time. I apologize. So maybe next year we can do this event two or three weeks later, maybe at the beginning of July to make sure we have all the best TVs from Hisense. But when the U8K does come, we'll still have the comparisons and stuff. And, and you'll see how close it gets to calibrated QM8, right? Now, what else do we need to talk about first? Uh, because it's all day, eventually I'll get to your questions, so for sure. And I'm going to take my time getting into that and all that good stuff. And the funny thing is, if you see my face, right, it's in color. And the reason it's in color is I had someone complain. It's so unprofessional. You're in black and white, and it's so dark. I was like, I was hoping to make sure the TV comes out. But you know what? There's no pleasing everyone. And we might have people jump in or out, but I'm so glad you guys can all make it today. And let's see here. So let's go in and say hello to whoever's there. Thank you for showing up, though. It's going to be a long stream. So here we go. Let's get into this super chat real quick. Move it up. Here, I'll put it right there. Mac asks, thank you for the super chat, Mac. Let's get the super chat party started. Thank you. I'm waiting on the 98-inch QM8. So am I. I'm actually debating between the 98-inch QM8 and the 98-inch X90L. Obviously, on the technology standpoint, the QM8 kills the Sony X90L. However, there's something to be said about 98 inches, Sony, you know, maybe it's built to a different standard, who knows? But I haven't decided which one I'll get. I'm going to be talking to Robert and seeing for myself how they compare. It's not for me, it's for my friend, because I'm helping him with his home theater build-out. And we're still debating, what should it be? So, but the 98 inch QM8 does look like a game changer for TCL, given its high quality 98 inch mini LED. The only one out there other than the Samsung QN100B last year, which is like $30,000, right? The immersion upgrade will be huge over my 75 inch. I couldn't agree more. I'm watching a 120 inch ultra short throw right now. And even though it's only SDR, it just looks so good. But what kind of quality bump can I expect over my <laughs> Q90R, if any. I can totally compare with that. I still have the Q90R. I still use it, love the TV. It's been moved around because I has, as I bring some of these TVs home and it's replacing, the Q90R is one TV I have not 
totally gotten rid of because it's still so good. The blooming control is still excellent. Black levels are excellent. What I've noticed though, and this is the Q90R's weakness right now, its tone mapping is not as good, especially with Netflix, some of the streaming stuff with low bit rate. Its tone mapping is definitely a challenge. For example, in The Witcher, in some of those scenes where there's like candlelight and her face is reflecting off the candles, it's not tone mapping correctly. You're getting these bright hot spots on her face, but the TCL 6 series from last year and the year before did much better. I was like, oh, no, right? So the Q90R in HDR on streaming, it's tone mapping in some scenes, you can see it, but overall for SDR, it's still great. Anti-reflective, I love it. Super bright and I like the One Connect box. So what you're gonna see as a huge upgrade is definitely tone mapping of streaming content. The QM8, as we see here, its blooming control is excellent. So you're not gonna lose out on the blooming control of the Q90R. Actually, it's a little bit better, right? As good as the Q90R was, it was surpassed by the QM98 and this QM8 surpasses the QN98 and the specular highlights was the weakness of the Q90R. So the Q90R had great black levels, but it crushed the specular highlights. It's very dim. So when you get the QM8, you're going to see brighter specular highlights than you have seen on the Q90R. So if you watch my favorite one, which, and we'll have it on the samples as I run in, the Greatest Showman, her hat, the sparkles, right? QM8 brighter than the q 90 and then obviously brighter than the Q90R. So you're going to see, if you watch HDR content, Spectral Highlights, the small stuff is going to start popping. The blacks will be as deep, but the blooming control, the Ferris wheel on the QM8 is definitely better than the Q90R. So that's what you can expect. Thank you so much for that, Mac. Okay, let's see. Hello, everyone. Bush Green, all everyone showing up. Thank you for coming by. Hey, John Reformato. <laughs> He's going to be at the shootout. We cannot wait. And John, you got to be here, right? He is here to make sure we do the LG G3 right. I love it, John. You know more about the G3 than anyone else here. So yes, keep us honest for sure. Hey, Leo. Welcome, welcome. Leo, if you don't know, has the 8K Samsung QN 900C 85-inch. And I'm surprised, but only because I know you're a gamer. Otherwise, the Sony X95L would have been under consideration. But even then, I remember Brian was saying, ah, oh, the X95L looks better, but I'm a gamer. I got to go with the 85-inch Q900C. So I hope you're enjoying your AK TV, buddy. Why, why is there a man in the U7K instead of a woman? Come on. What are you talking about? You're talking about Sammy? <laughs> All right, hey, CE Critic, what's up? Which TV was the hardest to calibrate? We're gonna ask Sammy that. He's not done yet. He spent, well, okay, I'll tell you this. The G3 potentially could be harder because it's got a 3D LUT. That means there's a lot more detail. You can dive in a lot deeper. You can get it more accurate. So the more precision you have, the longer it can take, right? I mean, you could calibrate it to the nth degree. You can ask John Riffermont about that. And TVs where you have rough settings, well, you only can do what you can do, even though it may only take an hour, right? You can't dive any deeper. And that's been Samsung's thing. So we'll ask Sammy at the end which one he found most difficult to calibrate. Like last year, calibrating with a Roku app was a nightmare because it kept on changing. It, would, it wasn't linear, right? Or when he changed one thing, another, something else would change. Like, what? What happened? So the Roku took forever to calibrate because the software, calibration software was so bad. Uh, in this case, both or all three U7K, QM8, and Q7 are all using Google software. But let's see how each TV maker applies the Google software to their calibration system. G3, of course, you all know, LG's infamous or famous 3D LUT, and Samsung, good enough. We'll see how close it can get to full accuracy by the end. So, good question, CE Critic. Oh, looky, looky. Hey, Robert, welcome. Hello, everyone. Glad to see so many very excellent video enthusiasts and professionals. So for the first time, Robert Zone at Value Electronics is actually carrying the flagship TVs and projectors from Hisense and TCL, the QM8, the 98-inch QM8 from TCL, as well as the Hisense UX 85-inch and U8K. So as soon as those hit the market, what I like is Robert will be able to get you extended warranties and all that stuff for those who are concerned, and maybe even if you want, a little bit of calibration action. 
So I'm just letting it oh, rest. Oh, hey, yeah, here we go. So come oh. on by. Here we go. And oh. yeah, you like that? Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> I'm trying to up my game. So let's get Sammy in here real quick. Okay, Sammy. Yeah. What so you got, buddy? I'm just letting the S95C rest because after after letting it go for so long in HDR, it just kind of starts pumping and it doesn't start me it doesn't measure consistently. So in order to kind of fight that, I'm just basically turning it off for a little bit, and then once I get maybe about five minutes of it being off, I'm gonna turn it back on and start going back to add it. But um, yeah, I mean, so far the G3 was not anything really too different from other LGs outside of not actually having the real service menu. Now, let's um, talk about the G3 because you finished calibrating it. And I have yeah. some questions. Many people are saying this year, well, last year, the G2, C2 had issues with maybe uniformity, banding, the stuff we always talk about, the tinting. What are you seeing? Because not just on my TV, but you've been calibrating a few of these G3s and C3s. What are your thoughts about their uniformity improvements in 2023? They're the same. Same? If, if anyone tells you they're not, they're either biased or they're lying. Okay. Because they're literally the same. Okay. I mean, you still have... Is the tinting better? Yeah, slightly. You do have some better, you know, off-axis. It's wider. Um, you still have the color shift. I mean, it's still there. You still have the vertical bands like one third of the way in from the right. Like it's still there. It's been there forever. Right. They're still there. <laughs> so. It's just panel lottery meaning some are worse than others or more visible than others or they're all about the same. They're all. Well, no, they're not all about the same. Um, the 77s are generally the cleanest, followed by the 55s, followed by the 65s with the 83s being the worst. Um, they're again, it's. It's brighter and it is an impressive TV, but it's um, it's just a brighter G two. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a brighter G two. Yeah, it's right. a brighter G two. Like you still have the same issues with the uniformity. You still have okay. like the off axis issues. How about the magenta tint? Is it uh, a little bit better? Yeah, it, it is a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is a little bit better, especially considering this is a, what sixty five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is sixty five. Yeah, before the sixty five were not be, so good. Yeah, they would be. Yeah. So this is this is cleaner than the previous 60 box. What about out of the box accuracy? So I didn't touch it. Mm -hmm. It's out of the box. What do you see this year versus last year? Does it have any color biases out of the box it, this year? It measures very closely to what uh not to what visually is D65, but what is a measured like um, actual coordinate of D65 is very very close to okay. that. Okay, that's like excellent. Out of the box. Okay. And it's not too far off from um, once you make the adjustments to get it to D65, it's not too far off. Um, I mean, ultimately, you have to use, it depends on how you're going to do it, right? Because if you're going to do a, a 1D and 3D LUT with an SDR, yeah, you're totally fine. Okay. Um, the thing is, is that you still kind of, and some people will probably want to argue this, but you still kind of really can't do a 3D LUT for HDR because you can do a matrix, but why are you going to replace a factory 3D LUT with a 3x3 matrix that's actually proven to be worse? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, can you do it? Yeah, should you? Probably not. So and they're pretty much the same. They're, okay. they're good TVs. Um, they can get very accurate. It's, they're very bright. They're like I said, they're impressive. But it's, again, it's lacking in color luminance. Like, that's visible. That's it's, the thing. Yeah, it's visible. And it's Which color? Uh, primaries them. or secondaries? All of them. All of them. All of them. Okay. Yeah. Now, the S95C is resting. Yes. How many minutes or hours before it needs to rest? And how long are you going to let it rest? I'm going to let it rest for probably about five to ten minutes. Okay. Um, I already went in and made some changes that no one saw <laughs> but i did make some changes so that already put it well uh in a much better state um, okay. and it wasn't that bad to begin with either because that one actually measures very close to d65 as well. oh actually yeah so, so that's a great uh, point is although calibration is not done but out of the box again that one also 
uh, didn't touch it out of the box. How does that compare to the G3 out of the box in terms of just overall accuracy? In terms of overall accuracy, I would say out of the box, the G3 is better. It's better. Okay. Yeah, it's better. And where is the S95C off? Meaning, is it pushing any one color more? Um, your in see, no, there, mine like, in yeah, particular. Yours, right. yours in particular is going to vary, you know, unit to unit. Um, all of them are going to be, I think, kind of the same. Um, but it's they're pushing too much either like blue or magenta okay yeah all right so, so and that would be the lips might be a bit more vibrant <laughs> <laughs> pushing magenta or the whites are just a touch wider right yeah well it's it's going to look a little bit wider uh, depending on what it's pushing if it's pushing like a lot of blue but mm -hmm. if it's pushing like magenta you're like you'll you'll see it it has a very um so it's like magenta kind of across okay. the screen. Oh, and of course that Samsung being what it has been like this since BK2020 has been out, can you, uh, are we able to use that color space once you calibrate it? If I set it to BT2020, it would be yeah. accurate now, right? Yeah, okay. that's, that's what we're going to do. We're okay, gonna, Yeah, great. we're going to calibrate it to BT2020. And, and that can leave it in BT2020. Leave it in BT2020 Perfect. and then let everything map to BT2020, or great. map within BT2020. Okay. So. And of course, we haven't done the high sensor, the TCL yet, so we'll, we'll get there eventually. Yeah. All right. I want to do these two first because yeah. I figured if I'm going to have problems, it's going to be... Like, for instance, like using Calman, uploading a Adobe config file to the G3, mm -hmm. should ideally work. Oh, actually, you know what? That's speaking of Adobe Vision. So uh, we're hearing, well, I'm seeing in Adobe Vision, uh, there's a bit of crushed blacks, near black crushing. Is that something that you can calibrate out if someone is getting a calibrator? Does have you, Did you see that? Are you able to correct that in Dolby Vision? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so once you upload a Dolby config file, it's going to fix a lot of it. But like in the case, or like your case, when I first uploaded it, mm -hmm. it literally turned the screen green coming from Calman. So I had to actually go and reset it to the factory one, and then I put it on USB and then re-uploaded it. And then that fixes it. Like what pretty much what I saw is that, say with HDR, you have um, a slight, like very, very, very near black, a slight amount of crushing, mm -hmm. and then up until about, I would say maybe starting at, I'd say maybe 5%, it starts to overtract just a little bit and overtracks, mm -hmm. at least in my case, for what I've just seen right now, it just overtracks until about 15%, but it's not a lot. It's, right. it's not anything super it's very crazy, minor. but it is, right. it is too bright. And then after that, it tracks pretty much perfectly. Okay. Um, and then with Dolby Vision, it was pretty much um, until I uploaded the Dolby config file, it was over tracking on the lower end. And now it's at the very, very bottom end is slightly crushed. Okay. I mean, maybe you have to choose your poison, right? If yeah. you correct for that, then it elevates somewhere else because it's not a linear. Right. And I don't know how many hours you have on your panel yet. I didn't check. Oh, uh, they, they should have 200 hours uh, for sure. The G3 and the Samsung have over way over 200. The other ones, eh, no, probably like 100 or whatever. Okay. But yeah, the G3 should be good. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't know how much of it is still like kind of changing. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far, it's it's a nice TV. It's, yeah. it's cool. I personally want to get one, but... <laughs> oh, well, you know, let's, let's hear about that. Well, <laughs> this year, what are your thoughts as your personal TV or, you know, just anything? What, what are you enjoying or looking to get yourself because we hear so many different things from calibrators what are your thoughts i'm waiting to see the a95l um yes. depending on what that comes out and does it's either going to be a s95c or an a95l it's one of the two it's not a, it's no longer a wrgb yes it's that's not even yeah, yeah no more an lg oled panel yeah, yeah. i mean you know i would love it if say lg bought displays from samsung and started making them like that'd be great <laughs> just like samsung bought from lg right hey. yeah that, that'd be great but i mean for right now based off of what's available it's either going to be the s95c or the a95l okay fair enough and well rumor has it i know robert's here is we'll see the a95l sometime in august so yeah let us know and which one you got because i'm sure you're going to see it before you buy it yeah and yeah. what do you think Sony could bring to the table that Samsung may be lacking. You know, we're speculating, but because the two, obviously the Sony is a bit more expensive. What are you hoping to see from Sony? Um, honestly, I don't really have any real 
hopes or anything that I want to see from them. Um, I think more for me, it's just going to be uh, easier to calibrate, maybe. No, I wouldn't even say Not, that. It's just I, I would have more options like, mm, to calibrate, right. um, I think. And then I would, so like in my setup, I would be able to use like a um, Bravia cord. Or, yeah, Bravia cord. cord. Yeah, because right. I do actually have movies on there because mm -hmm. I've bought and you know, uh, Sony's before, so. You know, you just think of what you said about Bravio Core. It just hit me because we were talking about Mad VR, and I was, I'm referring to the live stream interview that Classy had with Stacy Spears, and I asked him, hey, you know, Dolby Vision, which you prefer? He goes, actually, none of them. I just plug everything into Mad VR, and I, <laughs> I do my tone <laughs> mapping myself because I know what I like, I know what my TV is capable of, and I just... I avoid it altogether. Yeah. Is that what you're planning to do with with your Sony, or do you are you okay with? Because I know you have a Mad VR. I don't yeah. know what your your use for that is. Um, so that that I primarily use in the in like my theater for my projector, mm -hmm. but I can run it to my um, display as well. I if I put it down in the theater room, then I might do that, but it kind of depends. I external video processing is always going to be superior to right. whatever. I mean, you have a PC with the RTX 4080, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, as great as these TVs are, it's like the G3 is, what, $4,500? Mm -hmm. Or do, would I rather have a purpose-built box that's $16,000 just doing just that? Just doing that. that yeah. yeah, it's like, it's going to be better. And we're talking about motion, right? Because there'd be this big thing where the GPU is now doing motion processing that eliminates stutter, but also reduces soap opera better than any TV can do because it's yeah. $16,000 with a special software and you know a lot more bandwidth. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing as they improve the software, you know, the solutions there, guys, if you guys are super sensitive to motion, <laughs> it's the it's cost of four TVs, yeah, right? It's an expensive solution, but it is a solution. Yeah. So. Okay. But I mean, for myself, I'm not really looking for anything particular from Sony. It's just kind of, I get the ability to use my, um, Bravia Core movies and now, do you find the Bravia Core movies to have a? I know it has a higher bit rate, but do you see an image quality difference or a mastering difference on Bravia Core? Some some movies do look a little bit cleaner, but I mean, for the most part, it's just that I got so many. So I bought so many Sony's and I had so many like mm -hmm. like free coupons. It's like I have a, <laughs> I have like a ton of movies on there that I actually kind of want to watch, and if I could put it downstairs on a bigger screen, that'd be right. great. But other than that, it's. Because I'm not a huge gamer. I don't game right. like I used to anymore. So right. the whole like appeal of a, a gaming dedicated like, to you. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like, well, if I'm going to game, I'm going to game on my PC downstairs. Right. I'm not going to do it on a 77 inch. So. Uh, on a monitor. Yeah. On a gaming monitor, like a 49 inch Samsung QD OLED. Right. So it's something along those lines. So. Yeah. All right. Good deal. Well, if you have any insights or anything, just hop on by. Yeah. I'm going to get back to this. So Sammy will be spending. <laughs> The day <laughs> calibrating. So let's let me get caught up. I saw we had some a few super chats, and so Vishnu, thank you for that. Thanks, Fomo, for this calibration stream. Excited to see what a calibrated TCL QM8 can do. I am too. We'll be getting the 85-inch QM8 soon. I think for twenty-three hundred dollars. That's simply just brilliant by TCL. So first of all, you can get a twenty-three hundred dollar Samsung flagship 85-inch. Mini LED, Neo QLED, but you literally have to wait until the following year. So for example, the QN90B ended up 2300 before they sold out, and the 95B, because it's one connect, is a little bit more expensive than that. But ultimately, TCL is selling you something that's so close to the Samsung Q95C this year. At the price, it would be a year from now. So depending on how its gaming features are and everything else, it may be the value of the year for flagship TVs. But the U8K obviously has something to say about that. So I'm definitely excited to see that too. Thank you for that, Vishnu. Let's see here. Get all your super chats. But thank you again, everyone, for showing up. Thank you, Mark, for the super chat. A Samsung trustworthy, question mark, Q90T, replaced panel and replaced motherboard. <laughs> My new Q90B, big yellow spots on skins and walls. Boy, you you have it bad. Remote is broken and it just replaced the panel. Bad luck. So statistically, you're going to get a lot more complaints on Samsung TVs because they sell so many, right? So, you know, people who have, and even if, let's say, the industry 
average is 3% failure rate. Even if Samsung has 2%, if Samsung sells five times more, that 2% is a lot of people still, even though it may be less than industry average. Now, as for you, Mark, statistically, you should have gotten that many bad things happen to your flagship TV, right? Because one thing tracks very well is the more you pay for your TV, the more you bump it up to a lower incidence of issues, right? So Consumer Reports in their research, uh, this is as of 2019, 2018, may still be relevant. The more you pay for a TV, the more reliable it is, but it's a diminishing return thing. Over a certain amount, it doesn't matter. So that certain amount is like $1,500, right? Over $1,500, it's clearly a more reliable TV. And under $700 is clearly a less reliable TV. And everything between $700 and $1,500, you know, it's in between. Now, there are a few brands that stood out. TCL consistently is the most reliable under $700. And Vizio is consistently the least reliable above $1,000. So those are the two <laughs> standout brands. But that was in 2018. You know, who knows how things have changed for the better or for the worse in 2023, especially given Samsung's new entry into QD OLED. Not much experience with that. And more and more people buying W OLED, just OLED in general, they're going to be putting it through use cases where an LCD TV may not have issues, but you run CNN all day long, you're going to get what ratings is seeing, right? They're seeing burn-in because of their accelerated aging, where they're just running CNN all day long in a hot room. I mean, just pushing it. And on an LCD TV, well, it failed too, except it's not burning. It's just the board completely fails, right? So it's just something to consider because it's hard to choose a TV based on reliability. Like I've had Hisense TCL TVs every year since 2019, 2018, and only once, maybe twice, did I have a warranty replacement on the H9F. I had a brown spot, but then after that, it's been fine. TCL, I had a replacement, the original 8 Series Mini LED, the Roku just kept on rebooting. <laughs> it just wouldn't stop, right? It was a loop. Unplugged it, plugged it back in, just kept on going. So I had to return that. But those were the two biggest issues I had with high sense of TCL, but they've been fine since then. And then, of course, Samsung last year, the QN90B, we all saw how I had the local dimming bud bug on the hardware side. Uh, but it wasn't just me. That one actually affected a lot of people. It was a software firmware issue and a hardware issue where it just didn't work, right? The local dimming just did not turn on regardless of the firmware update. So it happens. Uh, Sony's, it happens. So it's, it really is luck of the draw. I think you're still safer going with slightly more expensive because the parts they use to get it that bright, you know, heat sink, a, a better, more robust PSU, a power unit to drive the brightness. So there's just more robust parts when the TV's brighter at a higher end. And the hope is that helps the TV last longer. No guarantee though, but yeah, thanks for that. Super chat. Okay, so going down the list here. Hey, Lisa, how are you? And saying hi to everyone. Sorry, it's just jumping in there and there's just so many people. Love seeing you all here. And if you have questions, just throw it out there, guys. If I can't catch it, someone like Classy will. Hmm. So this is interesting question. I am on the second TCL Q7 with coil line. Okay, coil line. Uh, Mio, Meow, Mixes 98. Tell me, what are your settings? I have the Q7 right here. I will match those settings. I'll let you know, even with my heart of hearing, if I hear the coil line, or maybe Sam, you could help me with the coil line, right? Do we hear the coil line? Let me know, share with us your settings, and you know, we'll, we'll check it out. Let's see. And thank you, Luis, for the super chat. What does the Sony X95L do better than the QM8? So the X95L, we're talking about 85 inch, in other parts of the world, it does come in a 65 and 75. In the USA, it's only 85. Now, what does it do better? So we don't have the QM8. Well, I don't. The Value Electronics does not have the QM8 85-inch in its stores yet. If Robert's still here, he'll let you know as soon as the QM8 comes into store, then he can have the X95L next to the QM8. I can tell you right now what it does better than the QM95C. It better blooming control 
and this is based on what Brian Whisper Status told me, right? He was very impressed by the movie HDR image quality of the X95L. He felt it had better contrast, it popped more. His only disappointment was the gaming feature simply was not there. He needed a real game bar, it did not have it. He's a serious gamer, so he has to skip it. But if he was just to stream HDR and watch movie content, it would have been the Sony X95L. And so we know that the QM8 at the 65 inch size does a few things slightly better than the QN95C, which I think is the specular highlights is a touch better. But the 85 inch, things are a little bit different. Uh, the dimming zone density may be different. So we're gonna have to have that comparison at either the shootout, which we will have large TVs at the shootout. The Hisense UX 85 inch will be at the shootout versus the Sony X95L. Now the Hisense UX has over 5,000 dimming zones at the 85 inch size. It is the only mini LED TV that has that many dimming zones. Everything else taps out at over 2,000 dimming zones, the QM8 and the QM95C and the QM900C. The UX has over 5,000 dimming zones, so that'll be very cool to see. Can it brute force its way to the top? And of course, versus the Sony X95L, versus the QM95C, and versus the QM8, we're gonna have a king of 85 inch mini LED TVs, so we'll see what that ends up being at the shootout. Hoping to find out if Sony can retake the throne in the mini LED arena. Okay. But back to your question, Luis. What does it do better than the QM8? You'll find out in the shootout. I can only speculate right now because neither of them are yet calibrated. So once calibrated, sometimes that brightness is pulled back. Many of these TVs, when they're out of the box, they push the blue or the green a little bit harder to get that extra brightness bump. Once you calibrate it, it may drop by a few percentage points. So we'll see. It's not a big deal. Oh. Mac has a question. With a $10,000 sticker price, what's your best guess for the 98-inch QM8 come Black Friday with the T-Seal discounts? I would say $7,000. Uh, I know they have a huge margin on the 98-inch. I believe there's room to go down to $7,000. So the question is, will they do it on Black Friday or wait until the new year? Remember, they have no competition at this size in terms of flagship other than the Samsung, which is 30,000, right? Samsung just announced their Q80C, which is not mini LED, and it's $8,000, but it doesn't have enough dimming zones. That's not what it's competing against. So uniquely, the 98-inch QM8 is, will be the best performing mini LED based on dimming zone specs. Hisense does have a 110-inch with over 5,000 dimming zones, but that one is reserved for China and it's 8K. So maybe it'll come next year. And I think, I believe the Hisense knows that that pricing is a bit too premium. So depending on how well the U8K sells and the UX sells, they may bring the 110 inch to the USA. And that would be amazing because it would be the only and first 110 inch TV. And does it need 8K? I still would do 4K, but we'll see. I cannot wait. I saw it at CES. It was pretty awesome. Okay. Great question, Luke. And of course, guys, if I missed your question, please let me know. If I miss your super chat, please let me know. Okay, Luke, how's the wide viewing angle of the QM8 compared to other QLEDs? It is very good. As a matter of fact, when I compared the QM8 viewing angle to the U8H and the U7K, the QM8 had more color saturation off angle. And keep this in mind, this is why I like the new ADS Pro panels instead of the VA panel. VA panel off angle is going to be desaturated. So what Samsung does, and maybe a few others like Sony, they put this wide angle filter on it. But what does that do? It reduces the contrast. So you can't win them all, right? You put that wide angle filter, you reduce contrast. So your front facing on axis is compromised just so you can get off axis, not worth it. I like the ADS Pro because on axis, there is a slight compromise to contrast, but because of the number of dimming zones, it offsets that. I don't notice that. Obviously compared to an OLED, you're gonna see the contrast difference, but compared to a Q90R, a Q90A, not at all. As a matter of fact, last year, the QN85B on axis full screen looked as rich and colorful as the QN90B, but off axis, way better. 
the color saturation was preserved. And at that point, I was like, okay, Samsung, if you're going to go ADS Pro, thumbs up because it definitely was an improvement. The only shortcoming is the blooming off angle is slightly more noticeable on the Q185B. However, this is yet the next generation of ADS, ADS Pro. So we'll see if they address that. Now, none of these TVs have a VA panel. The U7K, I'm sorry, none of these TVs have an ADS panel. The U7K has a VA panel, 55 and 65 inch. I think 75 may be ADS, but the 55 and 65 are VA. The QM8, I believe, are all VA panels. And Samsung Q95C are VA panels. However, the Q90C may have ADS panels. So in this case, they will be VA. So you're going to get the max contrast possible for these TVs. All right. G3 dimmed. Yeah, why is the G3 dimming? Let me see here. I think I don't know. Let's let's check the let's let's check the settings. You think it's dimming, Sammy, because it's on a SDR? Oh wait, this is HDR. No, yeah. So filmmaker mode. Let's let's change the mode here. Game up. Okay. Interesting that it's dimming on these images. Yeah, and, and this is not a bright scene, right? But it is HDR. And you calibrated mm -hmm. uh, the the filmmaker mode, right? Yeah, yeah. everything else is off, dynamic on off. Yeah, peak brightness is high. There's no reason it should be dimming. But hey, you know, That's this is why they go in the service menu, right? <laughs> hey. Hey guys, if you guys, hey, hey, thanks for that, John. If you guys catch any of the TVs dimming, let me know because this is what you guys will be experiencing. So I, I checked the settings. This is, is there a setting I'm missing that would neutralize that dimming? Let me know. What am I missing here? Now, classy, this wasn't a paused image. Technically, the faces are moving, right? The only thing pausing is the color chart. So you guys think the color chart sitting still is considered a dimmed image maybe maybe not so let me change it to an actual demo demo scene in this so that it won't dim so yeah i think you have had enough of these wonderful ladies let's get to the demos real quick and to push them we'll go 10,000 net because creators intent that's how it's meant to be seen Stacy Spears did this content for 10,000 nits. So we'll see what they do. We'll have fun with it. If you guys see anything interesting, let me know. I'm reading the questions so I may miss any cool images. And again, if I missed your super chat, I apologize. Sometimes it just moves so fast. Here we go. Hey, Mark, thanks for that super chat. Hi, FOMO. Question number one. Is TCL C845 the European TCL QM8? The only way we know is by the number of dimming zones. So depending on the number of dimming zones, I don't believe so. I think the QM8 is a step above the C845 and a step below the C9 series, right? So the QM8 is somewhere between C8 and C9. But the number of dimming zones, the TCL QM8 has just over 1,000 dimming zones. I don't believe the C845 has that many dimming zones, whereas the C945 has like 1,300 dimming zones. So maybe the QM8 is right in between. Now, depending on how many dimming zones the 845 has, it may or may not be close to the QM8 because dimming zones are still a thing. Our TCL QM8 and high sense are okay better than the QM90D. QM8, definitely, in two respects. Deeper blacks, better blooming control, and specular highlights, right? So... The Q90B, my disappointment was the black bars were not as black as the Q90A, but overall, the Q90B was slightly brighter. You know, specular highlights was slightly improved with the Q90A, but the QM8 had the brighter specular highlights with the deeper black bars, and the blooming control is just excellent. Its blooming control is the equal, if not better, of the Q95C. The U8K, I will know next week, so we'll get the 65 inch sometime. Monday or Tuesday, so we'll see how good that is, right? But I expect the U8K to be close. It doesn't have as many dimming zones as the QM8. Well, actually it does, like a 1,000, around a 1,000 as well. So it has about 
same number of dimensions as the QM8, just over a thousand, it's the larger sizes that don't have as many dimming zones as the QM8. So I think the 65 inch U8K is going to be a great TV, which makes sense why it's priced identically to the QM8 at launch. And number three, why? Why is it better than the Q90B? So I hope I answered that. Now, gaming is a whole different set of questions. So that one really needs to be thoroughly tested. I mean, Samsung gaming, it, it is what it is, right? Samsung does a great job, but it's still a LCD TV. When you game on an LCD TV with dimming zones, you're not going to have all those dimming zones active. You will lack the contrast and the pop of an OLED TV. So I don't expect the UAK, the QM8 to be better in that respect. However, they do have game bars. So if you're a gamer, you have that. Uh, and the Q90B has four HDMI 2.1, four bandwidth ports, whereas the U8K and the QM8 only still has two. Number three, can you turn Dolby Vision on off? Yes. So I do have, I'll be, we'll run a Dolby Vision test, but we'll run it on the Spears and Muscle uh, because that one was graded in Dolby Vision. However, I don't know if you'll see a huge difference, but we'll try that. The only one that won't be showing Dolby Vision is the Samsung. So we'll go a four-way Dolby Vision test between the LG, which has had its Dolby Vision calibrated, whereas the U7K won't. So you guys can see the difference, right? But speaking of Dolby Vision, so you have three types of Dolby Vision, depending on the TV. But right now, the most modern Dolby Vision modes are Dolby Vision IQ, Dolby Vision Dark, Dolby Vision Bright, and maybe Dolby Vision Custom, whatever that means to you. But we'll start with Dolby Vision IQ. Now, apparently, Dolby Vision IQ is the best of Dolby's processing, but then it depends on its application. It's supposed to adjust to the ambient room light. So I played with that on the U7K and the U8H, and what I noticed is that you have to turn ambient light sensor on. If it is off, the Dolby Vision IQ is a bit too lifty. Like everything is just washed out. Definitely on the U7K. But even when I turn on the ambient sensor on the U7K, it still feels slightly lifted, everything, right? The contrast was just not there. And this was in a completely dark room. So you would think if it's measuring ambient light and I'm in a dark room, why is it not identical to Dolby Vision Dark? And that's that's what I don't know, because Dolby Vision Dark should be in the darkest room, and then it slowly adjusts to the brightness of the room. So in a pitch dark room, IQ should be Dolby Vision Dark, but it isn't. It is actually a bit too bright. And so in a dark room, I do prefer Dolby Vision Dark. Actually, in a dark and dim room, I would still prefer Dolby Vision Dark. But if you watch certain content, because very content specific, where you feel like, I don't know, Game of Thrones, where everything feels really dark, then maybe Dolby Vision IQ will help lift that. And another thing is on the LG TVs, Dolby Vision IQ, I believe, upscales the Dolby Vision to 4.0, right? So there's Dolby Vision 4.0, 2.9, now all these different variations of Dolby Vision. And the most recent one is 4.0. And LG in Cinema Home, it has to be in Cinema Home, and it has to be on Dolby Vision IQ, they will convert it to a Dolby Vision 4.0. But again, that has nothing to do with creator's intent. It's just, does it do a good job of adjusting to your room ambient light? Because that's the most critical part, is if you're in a bright room, why would you watch Dolby Vision Dark? Even if that's the creator's intent, it just doesn't work. So, and so I will have Dolby Vision, and maybe we can toggle between Dolby Vision IQ. Now, the room isn't necessarily that dark, even though my ceilings and walls are all painted black and everything the tvs do <laughs> create brightness among themselves so if their light sensor is affected by another tv it may think it's a bright room but you know we'll play around with it and see and lastly dolby vision is content dependent so what you see on spears and munsell was lovingly crafted by stacy spears the same cannot be said of stuff that you stream off of Netflix, right? It could be just a Dolby Vision filter. We just don't know. So it's very hard to apply a universal, hey, Dolby Vision looks great on this TV. It very, it very much is content dependent. And in <laughs> some content, I think the Sony TVs, Dolby Vision Dark is brighter than Dolby, Dolby Vision Bright. Yeah. What? So I understand what you want, Mark, but don't 
Pin your hopes on Dolby Vision. <laughs> John Hooper, let it dim, let it live long and prosper. <laughs> well, as you can see, right, as we're going through this content, because it's changing, there is no static image that is causing it to dim. So with the ladies kind of switching in and out, obviously LG does not want the, the issue that was apparent in ratings where the durability test resulted in burn -in. And so they're very cautious about these things. Oh, let me play this again. So that's, this is 10,000 nit content. Now, as you guys can see, the, the G3 looks very similar to the other TVs, right? So we're talking about a $4,500 or a $3,500 65-inch TV against a U7K and a Q7, which are both under $900, and then the QM8, which is around $1,200 right now. So let's, let's play the 2,000 nit content because most of what you see streaming and graded will be 2,000 nits. Let's see what happens. And thank you, everyone. Thank you again for coming by. I'm going to be raided by the magician. Hey, Matt, we'll see you at 145. I'll, I'll, that's another hour or so. Drop by. Maybe he'll share with us his thoughts on his favorite TVs of the year. So this is a great comment. Geiger Mass. I've been happy with my 55-inch S95C. And so you should be. It's a great TV. Maybe not the very best, but it's a great TV for gaming, and I paid thirteen hundred. So thirteen hundred aside, which is an excellent price, dude. It's literally the very best. Other than maybe, arguably, the Sony A95L may be better. But that remains to be seen. But because the A95L hasn't been released, you have literally got the very best fifty-five inch TV out there now. So we'll say, well, you know, the Sony Xenia K or the Sony X95L, but those are eighty-five inch TVs. At the fifty-five inch. I could not think of a better cost no object TV. But if you guys disagree, let me know. What is your cost no object TV under 75 inches? Okay. I think the Q7 is the European C745 based on dimming zones. I, I think you're right. Uh, it's, the thing is, they don't standardize their models. And even Samsung sometimes has a European only version. Like in Europe, we're only going to have this IPS version with the One Connect box, right? Some crazy combination. But Another thing Meow makes you have to remember is the dimming software may not be the same, right? Or they may have the same dimming zones, but in Europe, you have an ADS panel or an IPS panel. And in Europe or in the US, you have a VA panel, but it has the same dimming zones. Like, what the heck? I remember Hisense last year had double whammy, less dimming zones, and it had an ADS panel. So it doesn't benefit from the increased contrast of more dimming zones and had an ADS panel. So people were up in arms. I don't think that's happening this year, but yeah, we really have to be careful with the naming conventions and what kind of performance to expect. You really have to watch your local regional reviews to really get a feel for how they're performing. Hey, Vishnu. Good question here. Are you running the beta firmware for TCL QM8, which fixes the brightness issue? So Vishnu, I don't know about the beta. I did update it this morning. So it updated this morning. And when I run my comparisons, I'll show with you my firmware on all of them. So the S95C just updated this morning. And I forced the update, actually. So I forced the update on the S95C. So it's on its most current over the air. Hopefully, that's current. On the G3, also updated to the most current over the air available. On the QM8, also updated. Q7, I've only had it a few days, but I did check an update. And the Hisense U7K also is on its most recent update. So yeah, it should be good. I, it, it's impressing me so far. And as we get deeper into these comparisons, I will adjust the exposure so you guys can see the differences. Because right now it's on a generic exposure. That kind of gives you an idea. But you do get a sense of which TVs are brighter and which are not, just based on if it's a little washed out, arguably it could be a little bit brighter. I'm going to lower the, expo lower the exposure a touch, though, so we can separate that a little bit more. Hey, Irving, is there anything I can do to fix Black Crush? on SDR mode on LG Nano Cell. And this is why I do not recommend LG Nano Cell TVs. Never have, never liked it. They don't have enough dimming zones. Their IPS panel is really behind everyone else. And this is why LG has kind of stopped marketing their nano cells. I mean, they kind of mailed it in. So uh, you black crushing SDR mode. 
It's interesting. SGO shouldn't have black cushion. So check your contrast and maybe look at the contrast setting and raise it a bit. So, and if you have a black level on your LG Nano cell, raise the black levels and that should raise all the blacks. But generally speaking, the LG Nano cell shouldn't have black crushing. It could be that, you know what? SDR should not have that much black crushing on a nano cell. Uh, if anything, it's lifted blacks. It's OLEDs that may have black crushing issues in SDR. So Irving, what, what's your movie mode? What settings do you have? And maybe we can help you fix it, especially if you have the TV on right now. And it could be the content too. Maybe it's meant to be black. Uh, I am so sad. Not Thumbs 12 Gaming. The U8K is not arriving until Monday or maybe even Tuesday. It's just not here. Hisense was unable to get me the U8K in time. I thought they would get it here the same time as the U7K, but it came or it's coming after. That's why. Um, I'll have it next week and then we'll make comparisons then. But Generally speaking, even with calibration, we're just adjusting to the white point. The luminance and the contrast should still be very similar pre and post calibration. It's, it's more of the subtle white point and color biases. And when we do streaming or any of reviews, generally, we don't review the color. We more review the color luminance, the brightness of the color relative to other TVs and uh, blooming control. So we'll still be able to do all of that because calibration does not affect that. But yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Next year, I'm going to have to bring Sammy in July. And that point, we'll for sure have all the TVs ready. Andrew, good question here. Or a good comment. Dolby Vision versus HDR10 on the TCL R646. My Hue Sync box refuses to work with Dolby Vision when attached to an Apple 4K TV in Dolby Vision, but it works in HDR. Yes, so Dolby Vision has its own metadata format and you have to make sure that it's not stripped. When you're going from box to box to box, you have to make sure the pass through allows the Dolby Vision metadata to go through. So the best is from source to TV, for sure, you'll get your Dolby Vision. But as you send it through the different in-between boxes, there's a possibility that you strip out the Dolby Vision metadata and you're just left with a static metadata, which is just HDR10 base, right? So yeah, I don't know if I can help you with that. This is why I normally connect my source at most to a splitter, but directly to the TV. I use my TV as a switch. I don't like using an AVR as a switch. I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable, but when I can avoid it, I send my video directly to the TV and let my TV be the switch. You know, for a second, I, I thought we were going Hindu religion. I will check with Vishnu. <laughs> How long until we see the U8K and the A95L Jedi Master? So the U8K is coming next week. So we could see a live stream where I compare the U8K with all these TVs. Maybe Tuesday, Wednesday is my hope. A95L, though, it looks like an August release. So August, September, depending on when it actually hits the market. Uh, we'll let Robert tell us as we get closer to that date. But right now, the target date for the Sony A95L is mid-August. But as we all know, that remains to be seen. Isn't this amazing, John, that all four look the same? And the only way to separate it is to lower the exposure a bit. Sometimes you're, if the exposure is too high, it, it may all seem great, right? So I'm going to lower the exposure by a stop. And then, this, and then I'm going to go to HDR10. 10,000 nit one more time. Okay, so if there is any separation in the brightness the highs we should be able to see it here and i'll when i catch something i'll maybe pause it so you guys can see okay i'm going to pause it right here and this is why so you guys look at the cloud cover right all the basics all four tvs they have right the grass is green <laughs> uh the, the grass is yellow the trees are green and the snow is white okay but look at the clouds right so where we have the separations in the clouds on the right, you have the least expensive TVs, the Q7, the U7K, similar price, uh, both under $900, 65-inch. I believe the U7K, when it releases within a few weeks, it will be around $850. Street pricing, so ignore the 
1100 or whatever crazy price it is right now. The Q7 and the U7K will have a very similar price within $50 of each other. And then the G3, 65 inch, $3,500. And the QM8, this is the deal of the century at $1,200. Uh, amazing number of dimming zones, right? Say around 1,000 dimming zones. So the QM8, clearly, you see that specular highlight, right? That the brightest part of the clouds, it pops in the QM8. Now, U7K, we talked about dynamic tone mapping. What happens when I turn on dynamic tone mapping? And I'll do that for the QM8 as well. The only way it can keep up with more dimming zones is to do dynamic tone mapping. So let's do that real quick. So this is the high sense brightness. So if you guys get the U7K, don't forget. Oh, look at that. Magic, right? So then I have control mapping. And brightness settings, here we go. And it doesn't help. The Q7, oh, it does help a bit. Yeah, it does add some contrast. So we'll, we'll leave them both on. So just so everyone knows, dynamic tone mapping is now on, on both TVs. It does help a bit. So when you guys have either the Q7 or any TV with few dimming zones, Sony, talking to you, like 80 dimming zones, really? You went from 60 to 80, and these guys literally doubled, if not tripled, their dimming zones. So with dynamic tone mapping on, the U7K gets a little bit closer to the QM8 and the Q7 as well. So, but the QM8, you don't need to turn on dynamic tone mapping, right? It, it has enough dimming zones to do what it needs to do without the disadvantages of dynamic tone mapping, which as you will see, you're gonna lose some of that color gradient in, in the highlights, but you won't on the QM8. But you know what, come on, 800 bucks. What more do you want, right? I'm going to lower exposure just a bit more here. Okay. So let me catch some of your super chats here, my friends. Yeah, it's easier for me to see the super chats because it's like flashing. You got a super chat, so. Hey, Ronnie, thanks for the super chat. How big a difference is the LG G3 compared to my C10? It is a lot brighter because of the MLA. So 55, 65, 77 inch it is significantly brighter. The G or the C10 is simply, you know, it doesn't have the, <laughs> it doesn't have the MOA. So, especially the whites. Now, the question is, if you're watching SDR, it doesn't matter. If you're watching SDR, other than sports, right? So in sports, it'll be significantly brighter in sports. But if you're watching just SDR news, SDR, just basic content, streaming, not a big difference. Gaming, the G3 will be brighter, arguably if you can get into the right mode, but ooh, let me pause right here. But the, the, the magic of the G3 is by adding MLA, the whites are a lot brighter. So this is the scene, this is why I stopped. You see in the middle of those clouds, right? The dark clouds is a bright white. MLA can make this a lot brighter than the C10 can ever, ever get because, well, it just can't. However, the MLA cannot get that sun super bright and preserve the color. As a matter of fact, that color is really yellow compared to the QM8. So on the G3, it's bright, but it's just washed out yellow bright, but it's bright. Whereas the QM8 will, well, I know Sammy's in the way, but you guys will see it later. On the QM8, it's as bright, but it's a pure round circle where all the colors are there. And this is the trade-off with MLA. It gets brighter, but in content that's 
HDR, super bright, you might lose some color gradient, some color luminance. This is the color luminance we're talking about. It cannot push that luminance as high when it demands it. So, but personally, I would get the G3 if it's between that, but why not get an S90C? The S90C is $1,000 less than the G3, depending on the size, but the S90C is 99.9% .9 of the S95C for $1,000 less. So like I have the S95C 77 inch, right? Uh, if it was for me personally and not for review purposes, I'd get the S90C because the S95C in those small scenes, very few scenes, I caught it slightly brighter here and there, but because I use it as a review reference TV, okay, I'll pay the extra thousand. But if it was for me, heck no, right? Because in normal movie content, that I watch, I could not tell the difference. Even in sports, it was super bright, the S90C. So the S95C, I think the premium on the 77 inch, we're not talking 55 and 65, on the 77 inch S90C, I gotta get the 77 inch S90C over the S95C, unless you need the One Connect box, save your money. Now the 55 and 65, because they are using the Gen 1 panels, or it's a mix, who knows what you're gonna get. I mean, it might be slightly less bright, but on the 77 inch, the S90C is such a good TV. All right. So thank you for that, Ronnie. Let's move down. Is TCL QMate versus Hisense U7K TV a fair comparison? I'm considering it if I should get the QMate or the U8K. So no, it is not. The QM8 is literally $500 more or 400, right? So it's 50% it's more. The QM8 is a lot more TV. It's got more than double the dimming zones, almost three times the dimming zones. That makes a big difference. The black bars on the QM8, significantly darker. So if you watch my review, I just put it up yesterday. Uh, I redid all the corrections and reshot it and compared Dolby Vision. You'll see that the QM8 is simply a better equipped TV with more dimming zones. And the hardest thing for an LCD TV to get right black bars, right? Without crushing the specular highlights. So the U7K doesn't crush the specular highlights. Bright, slightly brighter than the QM8, but the black bars are visible. So personally, because my budget is not 900, I would pay more to get the QM8 or the U8K. Now, U8K is going to be a caveat. I don't have it yet. I'm going to assume it performs better than the U7K. The question is whether it performs better than the QM8. And it should be very close because they both have around 1,000 dimming zones. But do not cross shop the U7K with the QM8, except for one use case. If you're just watching sports, full screen, no black bars. U7K will be indistinguishable from the QM8 because, you know, sports, SDR, bright scene, same. The U7K gets as bright as the QM8 in full screen, bright content. So if you're just using it for sports over a bar, you're not watching HDR, no black bars, save money, get the U7K. But if you're watching in a slightly darker room, you have black bars, you want that better contrast, that subtlety, then the QM8 has all of that because it has almost three times the dimming zones. Right, let's see what else. You know, here's a good comment, Dan. So S90C 77 inch is not worth including. I'm finding ABL very aggressive on it. Hmm. So Danny, what, give me your content. I don't know if the S95C ABL would be any better because it's the same panel technology and the S95C doesn't have an additional heat sink to offset that. So, yeah, let me know what content you're watching that you're getting aggressive ABL. Is it gaming? Is it HDR Netflix? I would be surprised if it's Netflix streaming. But, or is it sports? Hockey? I did run the test in the S95C and did not notice ABL. I ran a bright scene and it had the same brightness sustained for quite a bit. But then again, it's use case specific. So yeah, let me know, Danny. John, you're in Austria all this time. I thought you were local. Hey, I just checked my local Hisense site in Austria. They don't even mention Mini LED. <laughs> I know, right? Well, it's like when Samsung released the QD OLED, the S95B last year, 
They don't even mention Q, QD OLED. It's just OLED, right? Yeah, sometimes marketing, they, they don't know what consumers are looking for. And maybe we're enthusiasts. Maybe they don't want to confuse the masses. Maybe it's enough for them to say, great TV, buy it. Maybe 4K is enough to change your mind, right? Because how many people really know what quantum dot means and what it brings to the table? Oh, here we go. Happy owner. I'm on my third week of owning the QM8 and happy so far. And so you should be. I've been telling people this since my first stream of the QM8. You literally have the performance of a QM95C. I mean, other than gaming applications, which is very unique to Samsung and it's great for ports of awesome, everything else, content watching, and you get Dolby Vision if that's important to you, the QM8 is phenomenal. So... Good choice, great TV, amazing price. I don't think the QN95C will ever drop to $1,300 at a 65 inch. At best, $1,600. All right, Caleb, question. 65 inch U8H or $880 or for $880 versus 55 S90C for 1200 my friend, you got to go with the S90C. <laughs> you just have to because the color luminance and the con... Okay, so first, the contrast of OLED does stand out. And the perfect black bars, it's the infinite contrast of an OLED, especially in a dim room. It doesn't have to be dark. In a dim, moderately lit room, it's going to pop. And then you add the S90C processing, which is better than UAH. There's no banding, right? There's a lot of content I'll show later where you're going to see banding on the UAH. It's not on the S90C. And it's because of the wider coverage for the BT2020. Just everything about the S90C, the processor is better. Motion, in my opinion, there's more, there's more adjustability. But overall, the S90C is a better TV. The only question is 55 versus 65. I think the two sizes are close enough that I'd go with the 55 because then you can always move it to a bedroom later and it's, it's, just, it's just a fancier, better TV overall. Now, if you're going for a 75-inch U8H, then I might go with the 75-inch because immersion, size, right? But I think 55 and 65 are so close. But what say you, crowd? What would you guys choose? And don't forget to click like if you're coming by, talking, asking questions in TVs. I'll be here all day. It's only 1245 and Sammy is still on the Samsung. We still have three more TVs to go. So hopefully we'll finish before the sun sets. That's the plan before the sun sets. So Caleb, how big do you need it? I think you could, if you can live with a 55 inch, I'd go with the S90C. I add. But you know, sometimes if your wife or your significant other wants a larger TV, she can care less. Yes, Gerald, let's wait. Before you decide between the QM8 or the U8K, let's wait for the U8K to come. So I'll have the U8K Monday, Tuesday, and I'll put it right up there. And so instead of that S95C, I'll push it back against the wall, and I'll put the U8K in its place, or I'll move it somewhere here, and then you'll get to see. Or actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the G3 off the mount, put the U8K on top of the QM8. So that way you'll have a vertical U8K on top, QM8 on the bottom, and then U7K, or Q7, U7K, all the LCD TVs there, and then I'll just move the G3 somewhere else. <laughs> where, were, where was I when he purchased the SJ8500 LG NanoCell? What a piece of junk. You know, sometimes you go to Costco, they all look great at Costco until you bring it home, right? I think that's the problem. But I'm here now. So if you have any questions, just ask. But use case. Let me know what your use case is. How bright is your room? What kind of content you watch? All that good stuff. And we'll make sure you get the right TV. And you don't waste money on things you don't need. Good question, Vishnu. When you give the calibration setting for the QM8, will you let us know how to adjust it based on how the room is lit. So it'll be a couple of things. Um, you'll be adjusting for sure. If it's an SGR, you might play with the gamma. 
And then Dolby Vision, it'll be either Dolby Vision Dark for a dark room or Dolby Vision Bright for a brighter room. Or like the lottery, play your luck, Dolby Vision IQ and see what happens. Uh, but generally speaking, we'll, we'll talk to Sammy and maybe he'll give you some suggestions about, depending on your room brightness, what should you adjust to an HDR? But let me give you a heads up, just generally speaking. On TVs like the LG, they have what's called home or cinema home. Cinema home, everything is a little bit brighter because it's for bright room watching. So on an LG OLED, the recommendation is cinema home, dynamic tone mapping on. Between those two, it should be bright enough for brighter rooms on the G3. On the QM8, dynamic tone mapping, this is HDR content, dynamic tone mapping, I don't like it the way the QM8 does it because it brightens everything and you lose detail. You might want to play with contrast, dynamic contrast. So we'll, we'll play with that and see what it does in a bright room. But generally speaking, HDR is graded in a dark room. So you want dynamic tone mapping on. It makes everything a little bit brighter. But the QM8 dynamic tone mapping is a bit aggressive. It raises the midtones too bright, in my opinion. I, I would leave it as is because the QM8 really is pretty bright. Hey Irving, follow up. Thanks, Fomo. I have it in cinema mode. Mine seems to be a VA panel because anything off center, it gets washed out. That is, actually, if it's a nano cell, it should be a little bit better off angle. But, you know, it, I thought nano cells were all IPS. But yeah, if it's a VA and you're off angle and it's washed out, that's what it is. And there's nothing you can do about it. it it's just, if it's in cinema mode, try cinema home. Maybe it'll oversaturate it for you. This is assuming you have the nano cell, right? Hey, Reverend Slim, good to see you, man. We will be able to answer this question once Sammy gets to it, but do the limited controls over color management make the QM8 harder to calibrate correctly? It looks like it has 20 point grayscale, but I haven't seen anyone mention what kind of CMS settings there are. Hang around because after we're done with the S95C, Sammy will be doing the QM8 next. That's the one right below the G3, and then we can ask him. So we won't know until Sammy gets there. We'll get there. Yeah, I should start that one in probably within that 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, yeah. Hey, Reverend, hang on. We're going to get to the QM8 in about 20 minutes or so, and then he can let you know. Oh, let me take a quick drink break here. It's so awesome that you guys are all here, by the way. Keeping me company as I get these things calibrated. You know, in the past, I used to have the TVs calibrated individually. I thought, wait a minute, isn't it better just to have it all done all at once, once I get them all in? But before, when I bought it at Best Buy, when the Best Buy delivery people came, I would have it coordinated with the calibration as well, when Best Buy used to do calibrations. And I discovered that Best Buy didn't do HDR calibrations then. And then they stopped doing calibrations altogether. But they threw in the calibrations for 50 bucks. Like 50 bucks all day long, right? Well, that deal ended a few years ago. So now I get Sammy Prescott, which is definitely an improvement. Okay, let's see. James asks, any Sony contacts FOMO? I feel obliged to wait for the A95L. Okay, so. My Sony contacts could only tell me that it's coming out in mid-August. I don't expect it to be delayed any more than that. Here's a possibility, though. We may see May, no promises. We may see a sneak peek at M-Wave. So I'll be in Kansas City next month, mid-July, for the Kansas City Midwest AV experience. I'll be handling the TV demonstrations, comparisons, and I'll be there with Brian. And at the end, once all those TVs are done, they're still demo. We, two of them will be given away to lucky winners, the U7K and the U8K. The U7K is this one. It'll be calibrated. Boom. U8K, unfortunately, won't be calibrated because it didn't come in time, but it is also a giveaway. The And then everything else will be sold as a steep demo discount. So... If you guys are interested, let me know, because if you guys want to handle shipping, we can ship it to you. And it's not the only one, right? We're going to have the S95C or S90C. We're going to have 
some amazing TVs there. I lost track which ones, but they're flagship TVs. So if you want great demo deals, let me know and keep track at M Wave. We will make sure you get it and you know we'll let you know what shipping is. But these are all 2023 TVs. My goal at the M Wave is to demonstrate these TVs. How do normally people use it, right? It's in a bright room. We're gonna demonstrate vivid mode, sports, settings. If you guys show up, we can play with the settings and you know we'll, we'll bring Brian, it's gonna be the whisper status, he's gonna bring his console, he's gonna play. You guys can check the audio because it's two days of just exploring M Wave, which is projectors, sound bars, sound systems. You're gonna compare, hey Reverend Slim, are you gonna be there? We're going to compare different DTSX or ARC versus... Last year, we did ARC versus Odyssey versus... Um, what's, what's the other room correction system? Ah, just lost... What was the other? NIROC. That's it. NIROC Live. Oh, for M-Wave? Yes, M-Wave. Yeah, last year, we had a... So we set up a room with eight speakers... And there was no ceiling. It was just the surround. I think it was no seven speakers. And we were comparing Dirac, Anthem, Arc, Odyssey. And there was one more. I forgot which, what, what it was. Perfect. Yes, Room Perfect. And it was so funny because we all knew the loudest one always wins. So we had to make sure to adjust for loudness. Because um, we just wanted to focus on the discrete object. And at the end of the day, I, I, I was just saying, they all sounded good. You know what? I have no preference because I was just so overwhelmed by the constantly moving birds flying around. But yeah, you guys could check all that out at M Wave. So Midwest AV Experience. It's being hosted by Youth Man. You guys all know him and, and his team. And Brian and I will be doing the TV stuff. So we're going to have a lot of fun. But it's not a shootout per se, right? Because these TVs aren't trying to be the best. We're trying to show, is it for you? Meaning, what is your use case? Because each TV is designed to do something better than the other TV. Like the G3, it's designed to get super bright where sports content, you know, you got white snow, white hockey. It's going to do that better than the S95C. I mean, I saw it, right, in sports uh, vivid mode. It was brighter than the S95C's dynamic mode. It just could not get that bright because so much of sports is high contrast, pushing the blue, pushing the white, and that's what the G3 does really well. It's that white subpixel. So if I was to bring an OLED into a bright room to watch basketball, football, hockey, golf, soccer, it would be the G3. But if it's critical critical movie watching, HDR, where like, like Dune, right? You have bright scenes, you have dark scenes. I choose the QD OLED. So definitely use case. And our goal is to demonstrate how these TVs compare and stand out to each other in real use cases, right? Because not everyone watches in a dark room. And we play with settings. That's very important. Sorry if I'm behind on the questions. Just kind of running through here. Oh, I stopped playing. I lost track. I had so much fun talking to you guys. Okay, JR Price. I'm an avid gamer and HDR content watcher. Currently use the 42-inch C2 for my gaming. Wanting to move to my main room and go bigger. Cine 7 is where I want to be. It's a moderately lit room. 95C or G3? 95C. I know I might get some slack for this, but I believe the S95C or the S90C, 77-inch, is the gamer's choice. I, either one, if you can afford it, get the S95C. I appreciate the One Connect box. I think it's very convenient. Some people don't like it. The audio sucks <laughs> on the S95C, so if audio is important to you, you know, make sure you get a sound bar or something that gives a bit more oomph. But other than that, the S95C for gaming is pretty easy. You don't have to do any exotic modes or anything. The SDR is super bright. It's very easy to get it right. I really like the S95C. Uh, and PC gamers, I know, love the S95C. So, but if you have a specific use case that's unique to the G3, you already know what it is. But if you're just walking in as a casual gamer that want the best gaming TV in a moderately lit room, you cannot go wrong with a 77-inch S95C, for sure. You're gonna love it. All my game gamers, my gamer reviewers who have a large budget, they all have S95Cs, and they won't go back. This is a great comment. Even with Sammy in the way, QM8 looks almost OLED. 
And yes, right? Can you see the contrast in the QMA? It looks pretty phenomenal. It, it actually may be better than OLED in a few things. And we're going to go over some scenes. Every TV has a use case. OLED does not win everything. So we have to get that out of the way. OLED wins many things, contrast, right? But if your content doesn't have contrast subtleties, then the OLED is almost wasted. Like, look at this. Like, all the TVs can do blacks really well. Black bars, they cannot do as well as an OLED. But in full screen, where there is no black bars, it's just gradients of gray, dark gray, and near black. The mini LEDs, are, or the QM8 specifically, is just phenomenal. And QM8 will be calibrated, so we'll get that contrast perfect for you guys. Q7 and H. 7K, I think you mean U7K, yeah. The Q7 U7K look washed out compared to the G3 and QM8. That's what dimming zones do. Because if it didn't, why would the price difference be there, right? The QM8, literally three times the dimming zones, right? The high sense U7K has just over 300 or a little over 300 TCLs around there. The QM8 has over 1,000 or just over 1,000, right? That's three times more dimming zones. That does make a difference. Now, an extra 100 dimming zones, unless it's Sony, may not make a difference. But when you triple the number of dimming zones, yeah, that's huge. And going from the U7K, the Q7, to the QM8, it's the number of dimming zones. Like the Q7 doesn't even have mini LED, and it is keeping up with the U7K. All the mini LED does is potentially make it brighter while using less energy. So mini LEDs is more of an efficiency solution, an energy efficiency solution and not necessarily an image performance solution. What's cool is the Q7 and the U7K look nearly identical in contrast because the dimming zones are so close. Whereas the QM8, I think the rule is if you have over a thousand dimming zones and your software is halfway competent, you're gonna look almost OLED-like. And we'll get Sammy's uh, opinion on that once he finishes calibrating the QM8. Because last year, I thought the U8H looked great, but this is even better than the U8H. So that's why you don't see the U8H. It is officially out, and in is the QM8, and maybe the U8K may replace that. We'll see how good that is. Hey, Ronnie, thank you for the super chat. How sharper is this G3 picture than my C10? Not sharper. Self emissive, each pixel will be well rendered. If anything, the G3 might get so bright that you might lose some sharpness in the gradients, right? But the reality is it's the sharpness doesn't change because they have infinite contrast. Oftentimes, infinite contrast, people confuse infinite contrast with resolution because it looks sharper. So case in point, if I have an 8K LCD TV, the Z9K, against a 8K OLED, Everyone says, oh, the OLED looks, looks so much better, right? The Z2 from LG. The Z2 8K OLED looks so much better than the Sony Z9K. No, it's not because it's 8K OLED. If I put the same size 4K OLED against the Z9K, it would still look better. Because the contrast, when you have self-emissive and the contrast is infinite, that looks like it has a higher resolution. So before you ever upgrade to 8K, you have to upgrade to self-emissive, get your contrast maxed out, then we look at pixel resolution. Because if you can get infinite contrast, it will always look sharper. But because the C10 and the G, or I'm sorry, yeah, the C10 and the G3 are both OLED self emissive, I cannot en envision the G3 being sharper. Brighter, more specular highlights, HDR power, pop, yes, but not sharper. So if you are uh, using this as a monitor, then a 42 inch C10 10 or C3 is fine. C2, C3, 42 inch, perfect. Uh, if you need HDR though at that size, then you're gonna have to upgrade to something that gets a little bit brighter. But yeah, I'm not too worried about sharpness on different generations of OLED. Unless it's processing, upscaling, then you know, Sony has this way of processing, upscaling, getting rid of the jaggies and so forth. Hey, thanks for dropping by Crypto Color Lights. Hey, you know, I'm spending the day here with you guys, answering questions, enjoying. And Reverend Slim, 
I am thinking the 85 inch QM8 is in the sweet spot to replace my Vizio. <laughs> It's still working. Congratulations. Which randomly reboots itself several times a night. Maybe not. <laughs> if I'm upgrading, I might as well go big. Dude, I could not agree more. Now, the question is, okay, so 85-inch QM8 is $2,300. Yeah, you know what? That price is just too good. I cannot envision a better price for an 85-inch that has such HDR impact and the number of dimming zones, everything. So it seems the Samsung Q95C is the beast of 2023 so far. Crypto, q very close, very close. Now for gaming, probably not. But for HDR content, streaming content, very close. And for the premium, I would take the q to save some money. It's that close. And the U8K, I expect great things. But I don't want to set myself up for disappointment. So we'll see next Tuesday when I get it. I really don't know what Sony's doing. You know what, Miyako, best girl? I don't know either. I, I know what Sony's doing, actually. It's they are saving money. The reality is creating a new... Uh, the, the difficulty is release... So we're back to 2000 content, so you guys can see the difference. The difficulty of releasing a new model every year, it is very expensive. First of all, where are you improving, right? So Samsung has its own chip design, foundry, whatever you want to call it, as, as OG. So they're able to make AI improvements here, maybe improve processing there. And so those chips are then spread out across their lineup, so they're able to save money at scale. Sony doesn't want to do that because they don't have their own chip foundry. They have to buy from MediaTek, and if MediaTek doesn't upgrade anything, they're not going to upgrade anything. And additionally, if you notice, Sony doesn't want to source from the best suppliers. The Sony X90L went from 60 dimming zones to 80, that's 20 more dimming zones. That's completely pointless. Whereas the U7K doubled its dimming zones, and then the U8K also doubled its dimming zones. So the U8K is 1,000 dimming zones, and the U7K is now over 300 dimming zones. And the X90L is more expensive than the TCL Q7 or the Hisense U7K, and it has one third the dimming zones. And now I know where y'all see, oh, it's all about the software and so forth. There's only so much you could do with software. I understand it's the software, but Sony. How hard is it to get sourced from the same supplier 300 dimming zones for your X90L? Oh, wait, yeah, then that would beat your X95K, wouldn't it? So that's the issue. Is Sony's trying to separate this lineup, but also make money in their TVs. And making money in TVs is hard, by the way. So Sony needs to charge you a lot, but give you kind of drop-down <laughs> hardware specs. Its flagships are good, right? $5,000, X95L. Same price as the Q95C, so it's up there. It's fine. It's great. Z9K. But as you go down Sony's lineup, I would avoid mid-tier Sony's for that reason. Flagship Sony's, cost no object, A95L, X95L, all day long. But when you drop down to the mid-tiers, you, you have to go with the high sensor TCL. And, and Samsung is okay. Their mid-tiers are actually pretty competitive. It's still expensive, but at least it's good, right? But LG and, well, LG, forget their mini LEDs. They're no bueno. But LG is all OLED now, so Sony just needs to find a better business model. Otherwise, it's going to disappear altogether as a TV company because you can't make money selling only flagship products. And eventually, people will choose a QM8 over an X90L. Look at the price of the X90L versus the QM8. It's the same price. It's insane. It's got 1,000 dimming zones, and Sony has 80. It's like one-tenth the dimming zone. It's... No bueno, Sony. No bueno. Ah, still trying to catch up with your comments and questions. Thank you. Lisa, you will see that at the shootout. Robert Zone is going to host a 85-inch shootout. 4K TVs, mini LEDs, of course. It will be QM8. UX, the Hisense or U10, versus the Sony X95L, the big three. And I think we might be able to fit in the Samsung Q95C. I am also looking forward to that. TCL QM8, does it have good viewing angles? Yes. Now, not as good as OLED, but off angle, it has better saturation than U8H. So the viewing angle in the QM8 is definitely more saturated off angle than the U8H. 
So if you want the best, get an OLED. But among LCD TVs, I think the QMate's phenomenal. Especially if you're getting 85-inch, that extra viewing angle improvement is definitely a good thing. I'm glad that these TV companies actually improve their product year to year. Hey, next gen. Samsung is super sharp in game mode. Lies. <laughs> What do you mean by super sharp, right? Do you mean contrast? You, you can't get LCD TVs unless it's the S95C. I think S95C game mode is awesome. But if you're talking like the Neo QLEDs, yeah, come on. The drop down in image quality is crazy. And here we have another happy owner, Joshua Washburn, chimes in. TCL QMate viewing angles are great. Yeah, it is. It's, I'm, I'm not unhappy at all. Could you name the pricing of these TVs just to get a fair comparison? Yes. S95C, because the 77 inch is 4,500, but 65 inch is 3,500. The G3, same price, 3,500 as well for the 65 inch. Also at the 77 inch is 4,500. The TCL-Q M8 is right now street pricing around $1,200. TCL-Q7 and the U7K are both under 900. So somewhere between 850 and 900, depending on where you're at. But let's just say, let's say 800. At some point, it'll be $800. So the Q7, U7K, just over $800. So they are the 65-inch TVs that you would look at for under 1000 solidly under 1000 The QM8, for those whose budget is just above $1,000, let us say $1,200, that's the QM8. Or you're getting a heavily discounted QN90B. I would choose the QM8 over the QN90B for $1,400. Because the Q90B, if it's still around 65 minutes, should be around 14, 1500. I take the QM8 all day long. And yeah, so we have kind of pricing all over the place. The G3 represents the best LG OLED you can buy this year. 3500 is that price premium. But the S95C also represents that $3,500 price premium premium for the 65 inch so between those two you just choose what you prefer but if it's pure image quality it's definitely the s95c the q and the s95c to me represents the best tv money can buy this year assuming your use case is my hdr movie content and just bright room or dark room watching i just think it's phenomenal all around gaming it's really a good all-around tv the g3 does better in sports slightly brighter and it's it's low bit rate scaling is a little bit better. So the G3 does have its benefits, right? It has more settings. If you like playing with settings, the G3's got it. It's got the 3D LUT. Some people like playing with that. But ultimately, though, plug and play, image quality, SNA5C, no tweaking, nails it. And the QM8, for $1,200, you are not going to find a better TV right now. Now, once the U8K releases, arguably, U8K may be right there. But right now, because the U8K has not been released yet, if you need to buy a TV for around $1,200, the QM8 beats all comers at that price for the 65-inch size and all the other sizes, 85-inch. And under $900, the Q7 and the U7K are my choices right now because they look nearly identical <laughs> on my monitor. So, yes, thanks for the reminder, John. Yes, Don. I have been watching a lot of sci-fi movies with dark scenes, and QMate is awesome. Hey, Don, are you streaming uh, with an external streamer, or are you streaming internal apps? Let us know. And what channel are you watching? Is it Netflix? Is it HDR? Is it SDR? Because that definitely has uh, an effect. Or is it Dolby Vision, right? Yeah, share with us. Isaiah Gaines asks, would you say the TCL Q7 is the better choice than the Samsung? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the U8000 Crystal Series is fine, but it has no local dimming zones. It's a direct LED TV. It, the U8000 for me is the budget bare minimum TV without dimming zones. Um, and very similar to kind of the Sony X85, X80 series. Great for what it is, but... The Q7 is going to give you HDR, specular highlights. It, it's designed to be a great streaming TV. Whereas the U8000 is designed to be a Costco TV. You get an 85 inch. So 
if you need an 85 inch TV and immersion is your thing, get the U8000 because that immersion is great. 85 or 86 inch has some weird sizes. But if you want a critical HDR movie watching TV, it starts with the Q7 or the U7K. I would not go any lower than that because Q7, U7K, their HDR is better than the Sony X90L or X90K by virtue of their dimming zones. And well, in the case of the, Q, of the U7K, it's actually got mini LEDs to make it slightly brighter for less, right? Less energy, that is. So, um, Oh, we're on the QM8 now. What, what you got? Yeah. So finish. Here we go. Okay, okay, so you finished the Samsung, so let's yeah. let's talk Samsung calibrations. Calibrated, what, what, what are your observations? Um, it's a lot better than the S95B was. Um, what, what are the differences? Like, what, what changed year to year? Well, so, how can I put it? The be you have a better starting point, I oh, guess. It's, okay. The controls still are not the best. Mm -hmm. Like, the one thing I noticed is... The biggest problem before is was the granularity. Um, the controls were didn't have enough granularity. Now they're almost too granular to the point <laughs> where it doesn't. Where it's looking to make a how can I put this? It's looking to make um, very small measurable changes, and it doesn't. So I guess it's still somewhat too coarse. Mm, so, so it's it's it acts like it's precise, but not really. Yeah, so like for instance, you'll get to God, say I'm adjusting CMS and I go through and I get to 68 and it will do nothing. And then 69, I hit it and then it just has a large jump. Mm -hmm. And then if I go from 69, and 69 will put me about where I want to be, but then says like, okay, I want to move it just a little bit more. And then I'll make some changes and say I get to, you know, 76. And then all of a sudden it makes another large jump again. Mm, okay. So with that being the case, it's it's more serviceable than it was before. Great. Because um, in certain scenarios with the S95B, it was legitimately just didn't work mm -hmm. like at all. Now it at least kind of works and it works really well in BT 2020. So BT 2020 can now be made accurate before there was a complaint that the coordinates were oversaturated. It's there, good you're now? still going to have some of that. Okay. You're, you're still going to have some of that. It's, you pretty much have to pick what you want to sacrifice. Mm. So, so, so what did you pick to sacrifice today? Um, the hundred percent saturated like areas. Okay. So I focused on like 25, 50%, 70% so on um and then once you start getting like upwards past like 85 percent it's just going to be oversaturated but it's not all color mm. it's primarily at least from what i'm seeing is primarily red um and magenta that's oversaturated yes okay once you start getting towards like 80 percent stimulus and higher so in the bright scenes you're going to have that slight magenta push in those super bright scenes no right? that's right. no that would that would be dictated by your white balance oh, this is okay. just going to be something that's if it's something magenta it's just going to be just oversaturated very... yeah oh, got it okay um, okay so in terms of accuracy you have a better starting point um a lot of things still hold true from the s95b so with the samsung it's kind of a less is more type approach can you do cms yeah should you like really go like full on in on it Probably not, because you're gonna you're gonna probably uh, get banding or posterization. Mm -hmm. With Samsung, a lot of you can effectively do just your primaries with CMS, and it will align your secondaries. Like that's okay. that's how they work. That's how they've always worked. And that and I noticed that you were faster finishing this. So yeah. why is the Samsung easier or faster to calibrate? Um, pretty much because one is just HDR. Um, if you fix it in the service menu, then it's going to align pretty much everything from the base. And then you only have to touch a few points. Mm -hmm. And after you touch those few points, then it's just doing right. like your set of primaries okay. and that will align your secondaries and then you're pretty much done and you'll get close to the G you're not going to get, you're not going to get as accurate as say a G3 could be. Um, because again, you do not have a LUT, mm -hmm. but in your case, we're just doing HDR and Dolby Vision, which 
I'm not going to upload a three by three matrix LUT to make it worse than the factory LUT. Right. right? Well, so well, that Samsung does you have Dolby Vision, so yeah. you save time there. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, it's um, it's just a little bit easier to go through the. It's very close. Make a few adjustments in the service menu. After you do that, fix a few things in the user menu, align your color, and then you're done. You can get just as good, if not a better picture than the G3 in a lot of cases. You know, this is a great time for us to kind of go through the settings a little bit so that we can share, because I know obviously the calibration settings is a whole other thing, but maybe just the TV settings, the base settings, because a lot of people are getting the S95 or S90C this year. And so filmmaker mode is still the mode to be in, right? Yeah, that's the mode that I selected. And so we're in filmmaker mode. Brightness, 50, max out. Contrast, 45. You notice you got more detail at 45? Yes. Yeah, so and and that's a, what I noticed yeah, as you well. Get a, you get a little bit less clipping. Yeah. Like I put it back up. To, I tried it at 50. I tried it at around 45. I tried it at 40. I played around with it yeah. just to see like where the separation would occur. The separation occurs um, within your grayscale all at the same spot. If you have it higher, it's just going to occur a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. If you drop it down, this is going to make it so that the separation appears at about 85% stimulus. This is exactly what I found. Like in that pan scene with the sun. Mm -hmm. At 50, the sun is just a blob. 45, 44 is when you see the detail in the sun. And I assume yeah. that's that's where the detail Now, obviously, is. dropping down contrast, you're going to lose just a little bit. Of right. Just brightness. a little bit, right? But yeah, it's not like a crazy thing. And I noticed this. You don't compromise the APL is just maybe a few things, but it's mm -hmm. it's a compromise worth having. Sharpness, it appears to be sharp, okay, out of the box, the default. Yeah, you don't really need to change that. Uh, uh, color is roughly right. So that's another thing. Like okay. With Samsung's, um, generally, you can adjust color globally. So color is a global saturation for okay. everything. So okay. if you find something is heavily oversaturated, you could drop color down to like, depending on what you're doing or what display it is, to say, you know, 20, 25, whatever. And that will get you pretty aligned. And then tint is um, global hue, it's, it rotates the axis. So okay. just by switching it to G1, rotating it towards green, that will make things align as well. So okay. just making those two changes alone will get people pretty close. Okay. I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, there's not really anything yeah. else. I mean, personally, I would leave it on static. Yeah, that uh, same here. Mapping, yeah. I mean, it may be in a bright room when you go active, but yeah. since we're in a dark room, I want to capture and then apples to apples. ST2084 and shadow oh, detail. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So I measured that a few times by changing that to plus one, minus one. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, zero was right. Okay. Um, wow, so out of the box, default's pretty good then. Zero was pretty much right. Okay. And, I'm so, and shadow detail? Shadow you, detail. So if I had to move that, mm -hmm. it would have either crushed more or it would have um, overtracked. Okay, so, so leaving it at zero was... It averages well. Yeah, yeah. it was probably the best option okay. to make. Now, on the color space settings, since you've done a few of these S95Cs, was there any one that was consistent that people can play with if they were to play with anything? Um, so you can use custom, you can use BG2020, mm -hmm. um, and I want to say thanks to Classy because he said that he would send me some of what he was doing uh -huh. as kind of like a starting point. Yeah, all right. Shout out um, to Classy. And so I measured them, and they're not exactly the same, but they are very, very close. Okay. So to the point, yeah. yeah, to the point where if you use someone's settings from online, chances are they would put you in the realm. So there was a few instances where like he might have been at like seventy something, and I had to be at sixty. Mm, and that's really close. We're talking, yeah, yeah it's very, it's pretty close. It's not right. as close as like say, him being at eighty and me being at like seventy-seven, right? But that's because that's a pretty big, not a huge delta, but it's it's big enough, right? Um, but they're pretty close. Like they're pretty linear. Now, where... smart calibration. I don't know if you ever used it. What are your thoughts on that? What is that exactly? No one's ever touched it. <laughs> I, I know the I guess first. You use your cell phone to do it in their app. I think the, I, fir the first iteration, they bricked people's TVs. And so people are so afraid to use it ever since that first firmware. Yeah, I heard something about that. Um, I think you have to use your phone and their, their smart things app. Okay. But I, I have no need to ever try 
try it or test it. Now, <laughs> since we're Samsung, let's jump to the G3. I don't know if the G3, we're not going to, obviously, you did a 3D LUT on that. So there's probably not a lot of, of adjustments on a G3 because out of the box, you said it was pretty good, right? Would yeah, there be anything good. that people would look at to adjust on the G3 generally? Because Honestly, for the G3, the only thing that they would really need to do is make sure that the power saving the energy savings off. Ah, like that's really the main thing that you right. want to do you don't need to do anything with color because the factory okay. uh, 3d LUT is good um turn or for oled care mm -hmm. oled panel turn off all the logo unless you're like right yeah. super you know, we're not crazy yeah unless so, you're like okay, very, very, you know, oh pixel clean about it. how often do you pixel clean because i know you have a few older tvs i just let it do it whenever yeah, because it's on auto anyway, right? Yeah, it's on auto. Okay. So I just, if it tells me it needs to do it, I just let it go. And I, uh, it's usually when I'm turning it off, so I'm not going to be using it anyways. Um, outside of that. Oh, there you go. Energy saving. Yeah, there really isn't yeah, off. anything to do. Oh, make sure that they turn on um, just scan to on instead of auto, because auto doesn't scale correctly. Which one? Uh, so if you go back up to the picture settings. Uh-huh. Uh, aspect ratio. Just scan needs to be on. You can't leave that as auto. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. If you leave it as auto, it won't scale correctly. If you actually like put it on auto right now. Oh, so it's still scaling right. Well, you know, know what? I'm not. I'm not going to risk it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trust the calibrator because yeah. these firmware updates. But so those. okay, a good example is like if I had that pattern on mm -hmm. this right below it. Uh huh. When it was on auto, you're um, cropping some of that image oh, by turning it yeah, on. It actually will that. fit. It'll be one to one pixel mapping. So okay, well, so this is the great thing about the G3 is out of the box is pretty much ready to go. Just honestly, just yeah, it pretty much is. Um, turn off your energy saver. Put just scan on, so it's one to one pixel mapping. Um, you can turn off like the logo luminance dimming, like the screen shift, like you don't really need it. Right. Um, okay. Outside of that you really don't have to do much of anything else well that's that's why lg fans love their g3 or c3 right it's it's plug and play as far as ready if you're not going to calibrate it now on the samsung this is what i've been saying from the beginning also is you want to play with the contrast to recoup some of that gradient detail yes so um, samsung you you pretty much have to adjust contrast you have to adjust color um, and you pretty much need to adjust tint. Like you, yeah. you should adjust tint. You guys, um, you guys caught that? Oh, hey, Brian's here. And Brian, you're free to come on if you're, you got, you got the link. You're free to jump on and say hello, buddy. Yeah. So you, you pretty much have to do that with the Samsung, with the G3 or any LG for that matter. You really don't have to do too much for the most part. Okay. Now, like most of these scenes, white and black, stark. The G3 and the S95C are literally indistinguishable except for now except for yeah. <laughs> so what are you seeing as distinguishable in a scene like that so let me, yeah. let me go back real quick because that's because you know you're seeing it from a critical calibrator's eye yeah and you're seeing things that like i i'm not going to see so okay so what what is it in this scene that you know the g3 needs to work on it's actually just the amount of detail that it's actually able to because um, it's ten thousand nits so it's not tone mapping it all down as well well, right? it, well that's the thing so the amount of detail that it's actually able to resolve from this tone mapping look at all the trees in the background look at all the like specifically look at that tree in the very far right corner right okay. behind that oh horse. yeah yeah like look how much more detail you see now look at the trees that are right to the lower right hand side of that right so like all of that detail you cannot get now you can change the tone map upload so i changed the tone map upload for um the g3 for a thousand nits it's going to hard clip everything right for four thousand it's going to roll off and at ten thousand it's going to for ten thousand it's going to roll off and you can manipulate those but mm. when you manipulate them you're either going to clip it completely or if you're going to try to recover more detail you're going to have an overall lower apl 
Right. And this is why not a lot of people notice this because where's 10,000 net content, right? So I just dropped it down to 1,000 net content. And it should look very similar now. Yeah, now right? they're going to look pretty much the same. So, and this is what I tell you guys is you're paying extra for a better performing TV, regardless of what it is. But if your content doesn't demand it, well, you, you're, never gonna, you're never going to benefit from that. But you have that headroom, right? It's like getting a Ferrari. Just in case you have a street race with someone or a Tesla Plaid and you want to hit zero to 60 under three seconds, well, it's there. But right. in this case, at a thousand in content, which is most streaming content, it's still a thousand nits or less, right? I don't yeah, know if any that's I mean, over a thousand. For the most part. For the most part. Like actual unless it's Bravia movie. Core. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or if it's like an actual movie, like say something like Aquaman or um, what's another one that's like 4,000 nits? Um, Pan. You know, movies like that, the Meg, that are over like 4,000 minutes, but for the most part, yeah, everything yeah. is generally under 1,000 minutes. All right, minutes. let's see. Oh, uh, look who's uh, here. Hey, buddy. Hey, how's it going? Hey. There we go. Hey, does this happen? Not when you do audio only? <laughs> I'm trying to work on some stuff. I can, I can. Let me see. <laughs> How do I, you know, you're so handsome, man. I don't know. Okay, here we go. Let me see. Can you still be heard? Does everyone hear Classy? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. It's still showing me on the camera, but yeah. Oh, not anymore. Wait. Uh, Hello? Yep. Hello? <laughs> like, <laughs> I am just trying to get it, trying to get me in, back in, but hey, does everyone hear Classy? Does everyone hear Hello? Classy? Can you hear me? Yeah. I mean, I've wired. No, we, we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can hear you. Okay, okay one second. Classy, we can hear you. I don't know if the audience can hear you. Can you hear us, Classy? Okay. Yeah, I hear you guys. Okay. All right. So, yeah, All right. I was going to suggest that if you uh, go to the analyzer version of the demo, uh -huh. um, then you'll be able to see throughout the scenes uh, with Sammy there where the BT2020 is um, and where the you know the G3 doesn't have those colors. And then there's, uh, you know, th that demo actually only plays in 1,000 nits, even though it'll, it shows where it goes up to you know, ten thousand, mm. but the actual demo you're seeing is the one thousand. So it doesn't clip, yep. right? Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So that is another thing when measuring both the G3 and the S95C. Depending on how someone's measuring it, one is going to look roughly the same as the other, but that's not. So, like, if you measure, if you do like an HDR analysis, right, on a G3, uh huh. And you're looking at ITP, you're going to have super high errors. Right. And it's not that the S95C doesn't have those errors, but they're just nowhere near as high as the G3. Like if you're measuring these and you're looking at like DE2000, which for the other um, error formula, both of them are, they look great. Like the S95C is like an average of one. Right. And it has some of them, depending on which you're measuring, it's like an average of like 0 0.5, 0 0.7, average of one, a max of three. So, and the G3 is roughly the same, if not a little bit better. It's just that once you start looking at 2020. Hey, pause right there, Puma. ITP. What was that, Classy? There's a pause on that one. Oh. Yeah, once you start looking at ITP in 2020, that's where it's like, yeah, these are nowhere close to one another performance wise this one no the, the you go back go the back. other way this one no i mean go forward and let it play forward you went back too far <laughs> <laughs> all right and it's funny it's like we we've practically memorized these scenes so which scene is it, Classy? Well, what's in the scene? Uh, uh, the dark sky where it's, yeah, that one, that one right there. Okay. Yep. Because yep. that's the one, if you get up close, you'll see, uh, probably not even that close, you'll see the posturization differences. Okay, so yeah, what, you can see it right uh, what, uh, what, uh, what knit? Let me just get it. It doesn't matter. You can see it from it's here. It's the color in the sky. It's right here. Yeah. Okay, let's make it large so everyone sees it. And again, you can't change the knit level on that anyway. But. Okay, wait, let me rewind it real quick. So this is when we talked about posturization on the G3. Yeah. 
you know, where the, the color isn't smoothly yeah. transitioning in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. So let's talk about that, that smooth transitioning. So clearly calibration doesn't help. What is the issue? Is it something that G3 could or LG could address with processing? Or is this a limitation of the WRGB panel? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a limitation of luminance. Luminance? Um, yeah, color luminance mm -hmm. for the most part. Like if they have more color luminance, then they can have So it's taking that step. It's yeah. that jump, right? So mm -hmm. it's almost as if it's losing bits, right? Because we always talk about you know 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit. And ha not having enough bits of information or processing of bits, you get these bandings as well. But to be fair, you can somewhat fix this with processing because Sony does it. Yes. Right. And, and it has the same. Well, so it's we'll see. Panel. Right. Well, I mean, so like if you look at a A90J versus, say, a G2, uh -huh. an A90J, if you use their smooth gradation, it was just more effective. It was more effective. You might have lost some detail, but it was more effective. And more effective to eliminate the this. banding. Yes. So you can fix it to a degree with that. Um, but then you lose some detail. Version. Because you have that compromise, you have to choose. Yeah, and so and this is kind of this is another thing, right? So people are like, not everybody, but say people say you can do a three D LUT on a G like a LG. Like, yeah, you can. I could do a mate. Say this is HDR. Mm -hmm. If I did a matrix LUT, so they have a factory three D lookup table already in there. This is actually really good. What people are saying is that you can, you know, fix it with calibration. And the only way to calibrate it is to technically do a 3D matrix set, which is a three by three. You're measuring three colors, three different times. So you're doing like, it's like nine, right? And you use that to interpolate a bunch of points to replace the factory let that's there. When people do that, generally, you're going to end up with even more banding than this or phosphorization. Mm. So right. that's why it's like we say, just don't do a matrix LUT and just leave the factory LUT by itself. Because and there's actual reasons to cheat. Like so if I okay. did one and uploaded it, that would look way worse than it is now, right now. So this is probably why people are choosing QD OLED is it's to avoid that extra work that you don't have to, do it. That you don't have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. For, so it has for the headroom. A less amount of time, yeah, and it's get better performance. It's like, okay. yeah. Because otherwise, yeah, it's not just the down. bright colors. Um, so if, if you were measuring, say, 10 or 20% stimulus in HDR, uh, doing color saturation sweeps, you'll see that the colors are just all over the place in random spots on the LG. Like, that doesn't even come close to hitting where they should. Uh, whereas on the S95C or the other QD OLEDs, they at least get close. Yeah, so when I was doing... The saturation sweeps are like the color HDR checker. Um, it, the LG was, it was kind of spotty once you started getting towards um, red, at least from what I saw in this one. Um, a lot of the skin tone area was a little iffy. They were within the realm, but they weren't hitting the target. So, yeah, And then also with the any of the WRGBs, you, know, you measure to the left or the right, like third of the screen, then you know it's, it's not even going to be remotely as close to as good as it is in the center. Um, but yeah, if you have the HDR analyzer demo on, like that red cactus was one of the spots where it really has BT2020, like the whole front of it. Oh, yeah, that should be coming up, right? I, I remember. You just passed it. Oh, I just passed it. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Here you go. Happy for this. I mean, don't get me wrong. Anyone that has either of these TVs are doing great. Oh, like, yeah. They're, they're great televisions. Right. It's just that one is better. Like, yeah, so right here, the S95C is the only TV there that has the actual color that that red is supposed to be in the front of that cactus. And the other ones are more orangish. Right. And, and again, guys, don't trust the YouTube compression color changes. But since they're both calibrated, Sammy, as you're eyeballing it, you're seeing more red in the S95C, or yes. right? Mm -hmm. The brightness is the same, except it feels like there's less of that red in the G3. 
the depth. Yeah, because Gamut isn't bright. Like most of the BT twenty twenty throughout this entire demo is actually darker colors. It's mm -hmm. not. It's not that they have to be bright. Like if you look at so if you look at the cactus right uh -huh. the flower, if you look at the, the largest part it. that's kind of like sitting in the middle, like that is is one is much darker, and it just has more detail. Yeah, because it has so because it has so much difference in luminance as well. Like it's it's visible, and you can see it on like the like the histogram, right? Uh -huh. Like that area is just so much more yeah, detail. Yeah, it's on you the bottom part. You don't yeah. get that on the G three. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing is, unless it's side by side, you would know what you're missing. And that's so true. people who are buying the S ninety five because it's so subtle. It's not like one's yellow and one is red, but knowing that you're buying these additional, the additional color depth, there's that peace of mind that you are paying for the latest technology. Yeah. But they're very close. It's just, yeah, it's not, the depth is, is definitely not there. I wonder if you guys can see this on YouTube. Hard to say what YouTube does after this gets out there. So yeah, I'll just leave the analyzer going and there's wherever you see the color is really going outside of P3, pause uh -huh. it and just take a look at what it's doing. Yeah, and that's another thing. So I measured the color volume, and it's even though it does have higher color luminance, they don't act. They never, they didn't gain any actual gamut coverage. Mm -hmm. So like, it's still. I'd have to look at the chart again, but I want to say it was like seventy eight percent, seventy five to seventy eight percent of P three. Or the G three. Yeah. Yeah, it's like seventy six or something usually. Yeah. And like that's. That's pretty much what my yeah. So basically, it's full coverage of P three, and that's it. It doesn't go beyond P three. Yeah. Because if you have full P three, that's around seventy five percent of BT twenty twenty. Wow. Well, I, I think this is what the casual eyeball between the S ninety five and G three observed from the get go. But now that it's yeah, right there. That's. That flower. Yeah. Oh yeah, that flower. Is it, for sure. Let me rewind that. The purple, the depth of the purple. Mm -hmm. See, now that it's calibrated, we could actually say, "Hey, it's not as deep." I mean, I don't know how to describe it, right? But it's that there's more of that purple there. Yeah. And so here's the thing: those of you at home, first of all, what I'm capturing is converted to 709. And then sent to YouTube because I'm not sending you guys the full BT2020 feed. So not a lot of people realize my goal is to capture luminance differences. I'm maxing out the dynamic range to make sure I capture all the dynamic range. So any color differences are differences rendered in Rec 709, which is kind of ironic because we're arguing about BT2020, right? So it's just so you guys know, those of you out there who are, oh, I can see the color difference. Yes, you're seeing it rendered in 709. So whatever my camera is doing and then sending to my, my laptop, which then renders it further and sends it to YouTube. And then who knows what YouTube does. But the brightness differences, I think, are somewhat preserved. So that's why I like to talk about brightnesses and stuff. But we do see that if you look at the image, so many of you don't know how Stacey Spears did this. The squirrel, full color, that's what it is. To the right of that, you have these... Black and white is everything that's within the DCI-P3, and anything that's orange or red is in BT-2020. And the degree that it's in BT-2020, or how much of it, right, the saturation of BT-2020 is how dark that red is. And so the darkest flowers, the center of that violet flower is like hardcore BT-2020, right, deep inside, and there's a lot of it. So, but then you see the difference. You could visualize it here. There but if both TVs are W OLED, they would look identical. You, you could not distinguish it. Oh, all right. Thank you, Sammy, for that. So now we're working on QM8. That's, yeah, the, that is the QM8, right? The one yeah, the bottom, bottom yeah. yes. So we're on the QM8 right now. Let me, and what's the one in the upper right? The, U, the, U, uh, the Q7. Q7, okay. Yeah. Eight, seven, and then that's the last one. Yes. All right. Thank you, Sammy, for the insight. Thank you, Classy. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to head out, but uh, at some All point, right. um, have Sammy go through some of the actual tests on the other disc, and then show some of the like low-range gradients and stuff where uh, some of the TVs are having issues.
Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the low, the low luminance issues. Yeah, the yeah, the, the gradients. You, you stuff. know which yeah. patterns, right? On oh, the gradation for the the, the entire color splash, like the vertical and horizontal. Those. <laughs> Yeah, or the some of the low luminance ones. There's one that's on the um, FOMO knows which one it is. It's like the one pattern that's on that disc with the video demo. It's under like motion or something, but it's actually for low luminance saturation. But then when you change disc, you'll go through and find a bunch of useful stuff for looking at um, gradients and different problem areas. So. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. All right. Okay. Well, once we oh, get oh. all the calibrated, we can check it out. But hey, thanks for dropping by, Classy. Yeah, how are we going? Yep. All right. Bye, buddy. Uh, all right. So oh, let's go through some super chats real quick. Hey, Mark, thanks for that. Best for KTV for bright to very bright rooms, the QM8 or the U8K. Uh, if it's cost no object and you you like that Samsung Tizen, then the Q95C is definitely that. But if you want, the Q95C performance at a lot less than it would be the QM8 and the U8K. I expect to be very similar. So right now, that is the bright room TV for all sizes. The QM8 only comes in a 65, 75, and 85. The U8K comes in 55, 65, 75. And I mean, there's discussion whether or not 85 will be available. But for sure, the UX, Hisense UX, will be a super bright TV at the 85 inch. So that one is around 5,000 MSRP. So probably street pricing closer to four grand is my guess. And the Sony X95L at the 85 inch is another bright room TV. So Mark, let us know what your size is and we'll help you out there. All right, let's catch up. Thank you for everyone coming by and sharing. And Brian came by, I don't know if Brian's still here. Thank you my friend for that super chat. Let's pull that up in a second. And hey, Q made is scheduled to arrive the week of July 3rd. Excellent. That's a great 4th of July weekend to compare for you, Robert. Hopefully you can compare that. Just run down here. My friend, Brian, thank you for that generous super chat. Great job, guys. Hi, Sammy. Here's some cash towards the calibration. Yes. Sammy does not come cheap, but he's good at what he does. So Sammy Prescott, he is the calibrator if you need him. He will let you know what his schedule is, and he'll come right by. So I'm sorry if I'm skipping over your questions. I want to get make sure I catch the super chats first. And then if I didn't get your question, please ask again. Hey, Lisa, this is to thank Brian for his super chat to support the calibration. Thank you, Lisa. I love it. That's what I'm talking about. You guys are such a great community. Thank you. Okay, so if I did not get to your question, go ahead and ask it. Okay, yeah, sure. So while we're waiting for the QM8 to do its magic, Sammy's going to step outside and we're going to run this. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. Robert just let us know that the QM8, I'm hoping the 85 inch size is coming in July. And the QM8 at the 85 inch is definitely a performer matching the Q95C in, I think, dimming zones, right? I'm going to have to look at that again, but for sure the 65 inch does. So, okay. I know you guys are tired of spears and months old, but you know, we're calibrating. So you guys could compare and have any questions, let me know. I wish I could put this on slow-mo for you guys, but I'm on the Revon and the Revon doesn't do slow-mo. Okay, let's see. If you, I'm gonna reset the questions. If I didn't get your question, ask again. Oh, and hey, if you're here and you're enjoying this stream, please click like so other people could come by and ask questions. We're gonna be here for at least another few hours. We're calibrating the QM8 now. The S95C is calibrated, the G3 is calibrated, but as a reminder, even though the G3 is calibrated, its white point will appear to be cool because it is WOLED. And WOLED, that blue hits my camera, my camera just goes crazy and pushes it to make it look cooler than it really is. Um, I mean, it might slightly be slightly cooler, but it's not as drastic as it appears on YouTube or on my camera. So that's a quick FYI for all y'all. Oh, wait, Brian, are you still traveling through Europe, my friend? I hope you're having fun. Okay, so this is a good question. What about the Samsung S95C showing burn-in after two months on our things? So here's the problem, Hitman. This is a discussion that needs to be had. 
do you read the conditions under which they do their durability testing? So you have to remember, it's not necessarily a burn-in testing. It's a durability testing where they run the TVs 24-7 on one piece of content, very specific, because they're looking for burn-in in that content. Unless you are doing that, I don't think you have any concerns because let's take the S95B. People have had the S95B since last year, and the complaints of burn-in, I don't see it. Now, if you abuse the TV, meaning you're leaving it on CNN or ESPN where there's a sports ticker all day long, ooh, I'm gonna have to show you guys this content real quick, then there's a risk. And this is an OLED risk, not just the S95C. It's not just limited to QD OLED. It's the W OLED, the G3 as well. So you guys have to remember, if you're getting an OLED, you are subject to burning risk. And especially if you watch it in vivid mode, right? So keep that in mind. The S95C is showing burn-in after two months. If you are doing exactly what ratings is doing, yeah, you're going to have that risk. Don't get the S95C, but also don't get the G3 or don't get the C3 because you're putting all these older TVs at risk. The G3 may not happen in two months, maybe four months. I mean, the fact that it happens within a year is not good news. And so it is, I don't believe aging is a good way of describing it because aging implies that you're accelerating normal aging. Normal aging means CNN one day, gaming the next, streaming one hour, watching news, sports the next. I mean, you're constantly changing your content. You're turning it on and off all day long, right? You might watch six hours a day, but is it six hours straight? Is it on or off half the time? And then you do that over the course of five years. Do you have burn it? Okay, ratings is not doing that for any of their TVs. What they're doing is they're running it straight. So our power boards, meant designed to do that well if it's a commercial display for the airports yes if it's a consumer tv the answer is no it's not designed for that spec so you're going to see failures across the line not even w oled right you can see failures on lcd tvs because their psu might fail or this might fail or that might fail because it was not designed to run 24 7. and what is the ambient temperature of that room if the ambient temperature of the room they're testing these tvs is 90 degrees so now you're running these TVs in a 90 degree room. So you're really aging it fast, but does it reflect your aging? So on the one hand, now we know the S95C can burn in. The question you have is, will your S95C have burn in or will your G3 have burn in? And that is not answered. So that's something that ratings clearly states, read our, our testing protocol. Unless you reflect this testing protocol on the content and the brightness, I mean, are you watching vivid mode? Everything is turned on. I mean, what, what, is, what are the conditions? It is so hard to extrapolate whether or not it will happen to you. So I, I, I cannot really apply that for any TV because let's say an LCD TV fails first. Does that mean the LCD TVs suck? Well, Maybe because it's not designed to run 24 seven like that. So, you know, it, this is a really good question, uh, Hitman, because it uncovers how do you test burn in by accelerating aging? Can you even do that? And I don't think you can, you cannot accelerate it. You could do it. You could have a TV and have people watching it all day long, different content. And then after three years, you can report back. I think that would work, but then you have to wait three years. But if you accelerate the aging by increasing the temperature in the room, running it 24-7, I don't know how accurate that is. But if you guys disagree, let me know. But I just don't think that's how electronics work. You're turning it off, letting it cool, turning it back on. Now, the off and on will create a different issue because on off, whereas out other parts, I don't know. I don't think it's a fair assessment, though. Okay, Austin. Question for FOMO. Looking at getting the 77-inch S90C, but I have a moderately bright room. I'm worried about the raised blacks. Do you think this will be an issue? No. A super bright room, maybe. Moderately bright. And so what Austin is referring to is that the, the QD OLED, all QD OLEDs, they have a layer that disperses light and that sometimes is raised if you shine the light directly on it. So in a super bright room, that's evident. The question is, how bright is it before it lifts the image or washes it out? 
and well obviously a super bright room oh hey, hey. good magician man how's it going pretty good how are you great we have a guest here you... uh not sure what do you got so sammy sent me these okay these are placards you know you'll see these almost every year do you have something like this for dolby vision or dolby atmos what do you use it for you hang it up on your wall look hang it cool. up on the wall oh, cool i don't have it if, if you're if you're giving it away i'll take it so now that I have the Samsung S95 at home. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Now, do you want to talk about that? You, you want to go on camera and talk about that? We can talk about it. All right. That. All right. So but I got... can no longer have a Dolby Vision placard in my theater, so. So we have Magician. You guys see him often. He is a calibrator. And w without saying, you know, I'll let you give the details. What is it you do? And why do you have, <laughs> why, is your why is your opinion so respected? How about that? Not, because not, I, not my opinion. Come on. Come on. I mean, um, uh, your experience, I think you have more experience than I do because you see so many TVs. But what is it you do? Why do you see so many TVs? So for those of you that don't know, my name's Matt. Um, I work at Avical with Mr. David Abrams. I think everybody knows who Dave Abrams is. Mm -hmm. That's either into high-end home theater. He's actually done some of the previous value electronic shootouts. So when Dwayne had a couple years off, Dave was actually flying out to New York to do all the shootouts. Um, so post pandemic, basically I went into business as a calibrator in San Diego. And I know that's how I met Sammy. Wait, living the dream? Stuff. Yep. Because <laughs> you've always dream. wanted to do that. We talked about like, oh look, I get to do it. I'm yep. in Hollywood. Yep, All yep. right. And uh, oh, wait, you know what? Microphone. Oh, even better. Even better. So what ended up happening is I met Dave through starting to work more and more in LA. Not necessarily Hollywood, but you know, things like this, consumers. Um if you don't know Dave, Dave's been doing this 20 years. So he's worked for Joe Kane way back in the early 2000s. He's basically, any new technology that's come out, he's put hands on it. He's tested it for display manufacturing. We're, we're talking all types of monitors. Reference, the dual, Everything. the OLED monitors yep. that lasted maybe 100 hours before they burned up, exactly. right? So he usually gets to see the new tech for anybody else. I can't talk about what new tech I get to see for anybody else, but I do get to see it, which is cool. That is nice. Um, I'm extremely lucky to work with him. So obviously I had a handle on home theater projectors, LG OLEDs, Sony OLEDs. For the past year, he's been bringing me into the studio environment and mm -hmm. we've been working on reference monitors. So in the studio, this is uh, graders grading for the theater or are they grading for everything. home releases? Okay. Everything. Okay. So you're basically looking at content creation, which starts at a reference monitor, like a Sony reference monitor. You're looking at client monitors that were matching to the reference monitors. Um, and then basically throughout the entire facility, you have edit bays, you have color bays, you have QC bays. Everything needs to match essentially in this workflow. So everything goes back to the master. And Dave's been doing this for years upon years upon years. He's had other employees with him in the past. Um, he needed somebody. So through recommendations, he found me, which was, I didn't even know he was looking. <laughs> when I called him, right. I was calling him just like I would call Sammy or Cecil right. just to talk and chat and do all this stuff. It just so happens it was a job interview. It was <laughs> apparently a job interview that I didn't know I was calling into. See, so, guys, you got to get out there, right? You got to yeah, get out yeah. there. Uh, so I've been in LA for almost a year now, which has been great. Well, finding a place to live in LA was challenging. I bet. It. How, how, how long is your commute? Are you living nearby Echo Park, Silver so Lake? So if you know where Calabasas is, yes, I'm right over there. Well, that's where all the directors live, right? That's, that's, where, that's, 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 where, that's where all the support people yeah, exactly. live, right? The people we have that's to see. The people with all the credits. When the they roll, they all live. In <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, it, it's been fantastic. So having knowledge on color space an LG OLED and knowing what makes a good picture really was completely useless once I got into the broadcast stuff. Um, so it's a completely different environment. Okay. Right? So um, it's just been, it's been amazing, but Dave forgets more than I even know. It's, it's crazy how much he's taught me over the past year. And as of a month ago, he's actually full time working through portrait displays. Yeah. So he's working remote as a product manager. Because they're doing their thing. They're updating right. everything to catch up with what QD OLED is. You're seeing doing. it in the new chips. Yeah. You're seeing all this stuff come yeah, out. Yeah, I noticed that. Suddenly, Calman's on everything. I mean, yeah. wow. Yeah. It, it, I saw Calman sitting on the QM8. 
I mean, really? it says not active yet, but the fact even says Calman in, in right. the advanced display. I mean, you'll it's see it down there. Okay, yeah, I mean, maybe cool. it's, I just updated the phone. Maybe it's working, but yeah, it's not crazy. It says Calman, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, most people here might know me from YouTube. Mm -hmm. I don't have time. <laughs> I know. Yeah. This is a real job. It's a completely different job. Yeah. I was going from four calibrations a week to like three or four a day. It's well, nuts. so... Now, this is something I always want to ask you because sure. you're calibrating for studios. This is the creator that we talked about, the creator's intent. Right. D65, is that still the standard or do studios do their own thing? Because we follow D65 yeah. you know, for whatever reason. But are you seeing different different white points for different content? Or are you doing gaming studios? Like, How are they asking you to calibrate? Is there anything interesting? I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty to be. So the way it works is this. Um, some of the biggest companies, say like your Fox, Disney, mm -hmm. all these, you know, even the smaller color studios, okay, they have to refer back to a reference, yes, which at the shootout would be like the HX310, mm -hmm. right? When these reports are done, so let's say you want to start on a movie project, okay, you tell the big, big studio, hey, we want to work on this project, do some VFX work, something. They want to report on your reference monitor to know that it's completely in spec. Okay. Mm, so that whatever you're giving them will match their spec so that the two scenes can be easily matched. Fully meet their spec from okay. their, like, whether it's DaVinci Resolve or Color Front, mm -hmm. whatever their color software is, they have to know that from top to bottom that it meets spec for their project. Okay. So for a BVM HX310, that's D65. Okay. So 3127, 3290. Can you memorize that the coordinates? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> For a BVM X300, it's Judd. So 30673180. But perceptually, it perceptually, should be the same. Perceptually, they're not perfectly the same. But everything has to go back to that reference point. Right. And in the studio, yeah, we do match monitors to you know one another. But what I've seen is that, I mean, I can go back to the QD OLED. Mm-hmm. Just why we start talking. Yeah, that's, that's. I yeah. bought a QD OLED because I was evaluating. Which it. model now? The, the seventy-seven inch S ninety-five C ninety-five C. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, and you, what were you considering? It was between that and what? I wasn't considering anything. Ah, okay. So. I saw one with a reference display. Mm -hmm. I calibrated it as best as, as I could. To the three ten. To a three hundred. Three hundred. Okay. And I really liked what I saw. Okay. So I can go into detail on differences I saw, but I think once we have this set up... I mean, maybe, they've been seeing the differences, so they, they know. Yeah, and what it really comes down to is perceptually, when you look at an RGB QD OLED, mm -hmm. perceptually the white looks correct. Yeah. So for me, it was having that relaxed look on the white. Everything just looked correct to me. Right. It doesn't need as much adjustment as like the WRGB OLEDs. I mean, it's okay for me, maybe it's a panel lottery, but you cannot unsee the magenta. On the on the on, on the G the G three that'll be OLED and that could be metamorphism yeah which that does happen okay and I do still see a little bit of uniformity issues even the MLAs clean them up so much it's crazy okay I did some for a studio and you can go so off angle it's so neat to be able to like let a colorist know hey you can look at your reference monitor here you can look at the G three up there and the viewing angle isn't going to mess things up it's great but you shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to, yeah, really. Have to. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. So, um, getting back to Dave, getting back to mm -hmm. why I came here. Um, what Avacal does, I think people think that we do mainly just studios. Oh, no. I, actually, I reached out to him to calibrate. The wait was exactly. so long. Eventually, I came on the set. You're like, exactly. oh, wait. Yeah, I spoke to him to come by. He's like, how many TVs do you have? I'm like, I only have two <laughs> right now. So, I was yeah. go Dave, Sammy. Matt, because well, Dave is local, he's local, right? Yeah, and like an and but, but then, but then yeah. it just worked out with Sammy, so now I just do Sammy, but yeah, I mean, so, it's great. We do obviously studio work, and there's so many different monitors and studios. You have your Bolins, your Azos, your Sony BVMs, your Flander mm -hmm. Scientifics, you have everything mm -hmm. projectors. So, when you get to Christie projectors, so there are studios and companies, you know, I won't name some of the companies we work with just for right reasons you, you want to keep your job I want to keep my job so <laughs> your triple laser christie projectors oh, like, your barcos well i mean the thing is so hot if you don't have a special cooling system it burns down the house i mean it's they, like got it. yeah got it. it's like 200 inch 300 you know, inch screen 
working on a projector that has six laser modules that do 10,000 lumens a pop, you can get a pretty big screen. Um, but outside of that, we also do, you know, we do work for high-end AV dealers. So we, you know, any custom install team that does a projector needs someone to come out there and tune the projector to that screen. There's no such thing as a projector that's going to work in a space out of the box. That's right. the thing that needs the absolute most calibration are projectors. And then I do consumers. So this morning I did an 83 inch C2. So how do they find, how do they find you? Cause obviously you're not advertising or anything like that. Is it's it word of mouth? Word of mouth. You, you come on the stream and suddenly you get phone calls. No, I mean, <laughs> last time I did, it was great. Yeah. But um, it's just word of mouth. It's industry contacts. Well, you know, while you're here, well, yeah, sure. if someone wants, you know, they're in Southern California cause oh, I know yeah. Sammy's in Colorado, but yeah. how do they get a hold of you? Uh, so you can go to avocal.com. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And go there and just say, I want that form, which you did. Yeah, the intake form. If you want to get a hold of me direct, it's Matt, M-A-T-T, at avocal.com. That's easy. That's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, we do a flat rate. Yeah. You know, it's basically every picture mode that you need, every game mode that you need. I was going to say game mode because you're a gamer. I do and... Oh, yeah. I, I do all the game uh, stuff. Actually, you know, we have a lot of questions about game mode oh, and yeah, stuff sure. like that. So, Absolutely. Um, G3 game modes, S95C or S90C game mode. Which one is getting you the more accurate HDR or easier to get? Because there's been a lot of debate about which yeah, is the better of, game mode. Tricky, and, right? and honestly, I, I've lost track. I like the SAFIFC because it's plug and play. Yeah. But can the G3 get there if you just play with the right settings? So the reason I went S95C is, you know, obviously I do all this pro work. But at home, I'm a gamer. Like yeah. That's what I like to do to relax when I have time. Mm -hmm. And the S95C, it gets me what I want. So what I want is pure color luminance. Yes. So I want my full red, my full blue, my full green. On the S95C, does yeah. HGIG work for you? Or you does can, it work? So what you need to do, and Classy, I heard him earlier when I was pulling up, he's put out some videos on how to track it. So this will depend on firmware if they change it or fix yeah, it. Mine are all updated, so yeah. I'm on the latest firmware. As of right now, I think negative two on the ST2084 gets you pretty close. In game mode. And you need to be in static. Static. And basic. This will get you HGIG accuracy. So that's, that's, that's the question. That's the question. So that's, that's where it likes the tone map. Mm -hmm. So the S95C, even in game mode, is still doing some tone mapping. Of course. Because its HGIG roll-off point is still 2,000 nits. Okay. So you need to set your console to 2,000 nits, your in-game stuff to 2,000 nits. Um, everything needs to be at 2,000 for it to track the PQ as brightly as it wants to. So this is published nowhere. No. I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like it's other than you in class. It's like, okay, 2,000, yeah. set it. Because people are like, there's no index. There's right. no master TV. This G3 right. is whatever. Yeah. So let's say for the G3, what would they have to set it to? Um, I would still set it to HGIG. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of debate right now on... The fact that the game mode in HDR on the G3 is losing a ton of luminance for whatever reason. Yeah, right. That's one of the reasons I personally didn't buy one is because of the gaming aspect, right? Yeah. For studios, I love it. Sure. For gamers, it's a different story. That's where I'm going to say maybe look at the Samsung because they're the same price. Oh, S90C is cheaper. Even in the S90C. I, I don't know if you've seen, we're not talking 55 or 65, but I have the 77 S9. Well, that's the 77 S90. Oh, gosh, and, and for the life of me, only in dynamic SDR sports did I get maybe an extra couple of nits out of sure. 95, but everything else, sure. identical. So yeah. I'm thinking, wow, why would you consider a C3 when the S90C is the same price? And you're getting 99%, if not more, of the QN of the S95C right. at the 77 inch for you no know, 3500. Yeah. Okay. I was I was watching a presentation from Flanders Scientific from Brom uh -huh. and he was talking about their new I, and I think he did I a saw video that. Yeah, 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 that's uh, yeah. the new their their QD OLED. Correct. And I don't know what the magic sauce they did to it, but it was at $12,000. Fifty-five minutes is twelve thousand. I want to say it's nineteen. Nineteen? Okay, so it's under twenty. It's under twenty. Okay, it's which under is twenty. Still a deal. Oh yes, because they're th over thirty, right? Is over it, thirty well, right now, right? When you think of it this way, the the the, the thought process is this: fifty-five inch QD OLED. Yeah, fifty-five, right? How many? Fifty-five. Fifty-five yeah. inch QD OLED reference monitor, mm -hmm. Flanders Scientific, twenty thousand. Correct. Okay. Now, why? <laughs> yeah, why? When um, you get the S ninety-five C. 
I'm, I'm sure it has waveforms and everything built in, right? It's got, you've got full built-in calibration capabilities for building custom 3D LUTs in both SDR, HDR. Mm -hmm. You have professional grade SDI serial digital INS, 12, 12G, so you can actually get fully uncompressed video to it. You got all these amazing pro features. Now, the reason why client monitors exist is because the reference monitors are small. And if you've seen the HX310 up close, you know that when 28, you stand 32 in, inch, it's like when you stand in front of it, if you move a foot off angle, yeah. you're not seeing it correctly anymore. Right, right. So their idea is that, and I'm sure it's going to start off as a client monitor because people are going to be wary, right? Their idea is if you have a 55 inch, now you can color on it, mm -hmm. and then everyone can gather around and actually look at it and see what you're doing without standing directly in front because there's only room Correct. for one person. <laughs> right, right. right. And after I saw that presentation, you know, I basically said, I want to buy a QD OLED at home for testing because it is the same glass. The core, it's right, still that the panel. panel. And there are tweaks to actually push these panels to that 2000 I, I've seen some gamers do that. They're able to go in the menu and do their thing. Right. I'm not, not going to talk share. about how that's done. Right, we're not going to share with you guys. We don't um, want you to break your TV. Once I go past my return period, I'm probably going to start seeing about tweaking things yeah. just at home, just to experiment. But right. As far as it's been, I've left mine completely as it is. And, and just a reminder for you guys, Tempted, it doesn't have HDCP, right? So you cannot just play a Blu-ray on it. Oh, uh, um, it's it's. If I'm not mistaken, you can't just plug it in. It depends right. on whether or not most of them would have like an HDMI input. Right. And the HDMI inputs can carry. HDCP stuff. Um, I don't know if you've watched Vincent Tio, but he'll generally plug in a PlayStation, mm -hmm. but most likely if that's HDCP or not, you can that's, turn it off. <laughs> that, and, and that's right. the thing is you have to have yeah. a device that allows you to play on, on a TV that won't recognize HDCP. Uh, so yeah. it's not as easy. Because I looked at it and I was like, oh man, I get this and that and oh, right. it's too much work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the, the technology behind it and what's built into it, they're usually overbuilt. Yes. They've built some of their previous... Well, they have, a heat, well, they have a heat sink yeah. and they have a fan for sure, right? So... But I mean, even just hardware pushing and software pushing, like their old XM55Us was the, uh, I think it was like a 2017 or 2018 LG OLED panel. Mm -hmm. Amazing results out of them in HDR because wow. you're no longer tied to the software. You now have your uh, own custom software to build whatever you want. No, speaking of LG... Sure. So you're doing your rounds, Dolby Vision. Yeah. Let's talk about how, what monitors are they using to grade Dolby Vision? And does it matter if it's an LG or not? Because I know on the marketing side, right? But the reality is I'm seeing Dolby Vision, consumer TVs, not sure. the, the LG reference monitors for Dolby Vision. All over the place. It doesn't matter if it's LG or not, right? Sure. I mean, I have a U8H and the, the U7K, and the Dolby Vision looks different on both. Sure. And then the LG class is telling me, oh, well, it's a bit crushed here. You're going to go and calibrate. I'm like, what? Calibrating Dolby Vision? That's like <laughs> an oxymoron. Right. So what are your thoughts on, on Dolby Vision? I mean, what differences do you see? Because you're seeing it at the reference level. Yeah. So there's no such thing as... So Dolby Vision is a delivery system. That's okay. what needs to be understood. The actual okay. grade that's done depends on the monitor it was done on. But it's done in a P3 space okay. with PQ, so as T2084. And then depending on which monitor you're using for the grade, whether it's 4,000 nits, 1,000 nits, 600 nits, even 100 nits. So Stacy will tell you his disc. He did that great video with um, Classy right. talking about the different ways. It's all trimmed from a 10,000 nit Dolby Vision. Master. He has different versions Correct. depending on your TV. Yeah, and depending on whether he can use scopes or waveforms to hit the 10,000 nits and whatever reference monitor that he had. I've worked on some of the Flanders scientific monitors that can do 3,300 nits, but they're not self emissive. So it's still right. kind of a, yeah. But in terms of in, in the studio space, you know, there's not really a Dolby Vision mode that's being done. It's the monitor say it's a thousand nit monitor, it's designed and set up for a thousand nit pass okay. to create that Dolby Vision. And there's a Dolby Vision workflow that colors can use to create this content. Now, when you have your home delivery system, what that's doing is it's looking at the capabilities of the TV and you're going to get that specific pass depending on where your TV ranks. So, so let's say the creator does it 1000 nit. Sure. 
or less, sure. but your TV is capable of, you know, 1500 nits or whatever above that. Sure. Shouldn't all these TVs look alike? They should. Right. And, and, and then you have the HDR10 version, right? So you have the Dolby and then you always have that base HDR10. How much different is the HDR10 going to look if it's capable of a lot more like the S95C? That's what's funny is it's not that much different. Right. And I've tested HDR10 plus HDR10 and Dolby all at home, you know, Apple TV, Panasonic, and your low APL, low knit Mandalorians and your certain yeah. internals. Yeah, Alita. Alita. I love Alita. So they're still going to follow PQ, which means if the grade wasn't done overly bright, it's not going to ever look overly bright. So unless you turn on a tone mapping system like a dynamic tone mapping or an active tone mapper. Which Dolby Vision doesn't allow. Which they don't allow. Um, you're not actually going to brighten up things that weren't supposed to be brighter in the first place. Okay. So when a TV gets a Dolby Vision, then one nice thing is it now knows, okay, where do I need to place the brightness so that you get the most brightness out of the TV. Mm. So the TV will get all these different passes available to it. Correct. And then the process will go, well, I know I can go no higher than 1500 nits. I'll choose a thousand Correct. just below that rather yeah. than the 2000 version, which will clip the highlights. Correct. Or as, as best to my knowledge, but no. that's why I generally have the HDR 600 grade for a lot of these monitors is because if they can get up to that 600 mark, at least you're at that like next step. Right. Yeah. And if a TV, let's say the S95C or the S90C or any of the Neo QLEDs, Neo LED can go way above 1500 nits, mm -hmm. is it important to have Dolby Vision, in your opinion? Because no, this is, this is just more of a discussion. There's no right answer, obviously. I'd love it if they had Dolby Vision. So the nice thing about Dolby Vision, generally in the engine, is for mapping your actual color space. Okay. So you'll see a discussion on P3 versus 2020. Oh, do you use 2020 and calibrate? Do you use P3 and calibrate it? And you said Dolby Vision is P3. So it's P3 primaries, mm -hmm. but it can be delivered inside a different container. There's a lot of different... When you have a Dolby Vision TV, you don't have to worry about it because it's right. already mapped out. It's already mapped out ahead of time. Okay. Yeah. And but then that goes to the TVs. Why do they all look different despite being in Dolby Vision Dark? So you have the Sony, mm -hmm. which in Dolby Vision Dark is nothing like the LG in Dolby Vision Dark. Mm -hmm. And it's not Dolby Vision's fault. So it, how does one get that standard to standardize the TVs? What, what's missing? I mean, wh where is... It's, it's up to the manufacturer. And what you're generally seeing a difference on is how you can tone map. Okay. So what I've noticed, especially on even my Samsung at home, and I haven't figured this out quite yet. If I put in my Spears and Munsell second edition, Mm -hmm. And I choose HDR10 plus 10,000 nit, mm -hmm. right? I have a 2.0 receiver, which technically should not be passing HDR10 plus. I'm not oh. seeing it on the on the info banner, right? Right. I'm still seeing it tone mapped. Right. So I do know that the Samsung is tone mapping so to preserve detail. Right. The Sony's will tone map to preserve detail. Oh, definitely. The LG's will tone map how you want them to. You can set the roll offs. If you turn on dynamic tone mapping, right. it's going to show all detail because it's bringing the picture down, it's bringing the right. picture up, it's changing it all the time. Right. So I think until there's more of a standard for like absolute PQ in Dolby Vision mode on these monitors, the differences you're going to see come down, it comes down to tone mapping. Okay. Because that's going to show brighter highlights, dimmer highlights, more shadow So that's very interesting yeah. because Dolby Vision Dark should be, I mean, we assume it is a tone mapping software in and of itself, right. but the reality is the TV maker adds their own hardware layer tone mapping Correct. to the Sony. Yeah. And if that hardware layer is not standardized, then it doesn't matter if the software is, right? Correct. So. Yeah. And right. if you look at Dolby Vision Bright or Dolby Vision Cinema Home or Dolby Vision Game, mm -hmm. those don't have the proper values set from right. the factory still. I'm surprised they still haven't fixed it. And it makes an over brightened image. And one's like, oh, that's Dolby Vision IQ. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> and then so, that's another thing, yeah. right? Is, it's what is old Dolby Vision IQ? Because now it's supposed to take information from the ambient light sensor. Yes. And then incorporate that into yeah. however, what gamma yeah. changes, EOTF, whatever that is. Yeah. But it, they all do it differently. So even having IQ mm -hmm. plus the sensor, the TVs are doing their own thing. Yeah. And I mean, let's really think about it. An IQ, the sensor, Dolby Vision sensor, when you break it down, if you're in a room and you turn the lamp on in the room, you no, no longer have perfect black. I don't care what you say, you have right. some washout to the screen. 
So Dolby Vision, the IQ setting is designed to slowly raise EOTF just to bring it up a bit yeah. because it knows you're in ambient light and mm -hmm. wants to overcome so you don't lose shadow detail. It's like an auto gamma adjustment, kind of, right? Yeah. I mean, it's adjusting to room brightening because obviously IQ, I always see consistently everything's a little bit brighter yeah. raised, but then in a bright room, you can see the shadow details not crushed. Correct. Which is so the complaint. It needs to be calibrated correctly, which is not that easy a thing to do. You think, oh, I go to that mode, I calibrate it. Well, some of these displays don't even have access to calibrate it via calibration right. software. Yeah. So you have to know how to do it. Uh, it's usually done just through like a simple USB method or things like that. So it's a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. Hope well, that answers that question. No, no. Um, it, it leaves. So basically, the, the answer is it's unanswered. Yes. It's it's <laughs> it's a black box. So those of you who I want Dolby Vision. Sony does not do accurate Dolby Vision until the A95K is my understanding. I heard that one's, yeah, yeah. Cecil C, Classy yeah. has measured, he measured it. it. And it's actually good. I've measured it. And that tracks pretty much all the way up. But the color performance, Quantum Dot OLED, the color performance in Dolby Vision was, like, was almost dead on. It needed very little. Once you got it at the D65 white point you wanted to, it was mm -hmm. very, very good. So I, I like those a lot. And it makes sense why Sony's bought into it, but then why couldn't they do that with the A80K or A90J, right? Because their Dolby Vision was just too know. dark and it's inconsistent. And if, if you talk to Stacy, there's so many different versions of Dolby Vision. Sony in the past was all right. player led, so right. the player had to decide how am I going to tone map this. To and the it was always display? dark. And it was yeah. always too dark, too dim. And well, I, I learned that Stacy was also saying. On disc, it's limited to the earliest Dolby Vision. 4.0 is only available on streaming. Oh, wow. So if you want 4.0, yeah. so the LG is 4.0, but all the players are 2. Point whatever, first generation sure. Dolby Vision. So you couldn't get 4.0 even if you wanted right. to. So you don't even get access to all the trims. You have to go on Disney+, Plus, yeah. but you don't know which version of Dolby Vision they're using. Exactly. They have access to 4.0, yeah. but they can be using 2.1 for all we know, right? For nerds, for right. Straight, straight, straight. And, and so I, I told people, I understand the Dolby Vision brand, right. but you don't know what you're getting. Correct. And, and you're getting a different image, but is it truly and Dolby it's Vision? In, it's interesting now, like I have HDR10. Mm -hmm. Not so much HDR10 Plus, I think it's working. I played with both. I look at my PQ chart. Does it track PQ? Yes. Do my primaries match where I need them to be? Yes. Okay. It's doing its thing. That's where I leave That's it. That's it, yeah. And it's, it's I, I think I told Dave this. I'm like, the reason I bought this unit, I definitely told Sammy this, is I used to spend hours running LUTs and doing 1D LUTs and yeah. HDR matrices and uploads. Now, on the S95C, I've done a two-point adjustment in the service menu. Done. I see. That's what Sam yeah. was saying is the adjustments may be coarse, but, you know, they're close enough. Right, Simon? for my own personal use. Yeah, I mean, this is not you know we're not this is not a reference matter for movies, but for no. us watching streaming, yeah. whatever, and it there's is. still problems with it. Um, in fact, in general, I find, and you might see this, Sammy might see this. You've already done the S95C. Yes. Okay. Did you? Well, it depends on how you did it. Did you get the thing where it tracks all the way up to about a thousand, and then kind of diverges? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Perfect. <laughs> so when that happens. Where it diverges is depending on where you set contrast at. Oh. So, at least from what I noticed. So, you know how you guys were saying that it was 70, 75? That's a percentage on PQ or on the chart. Yeah, on the chart. Mm. Was your contrast at 50? Yes. If you drop it to 45, it diverges at 85%. Oh, interesting. I'll have so, to play with it. But it's harder to fix. That's what I found. Yeah, it's yeah. harder to fix. So, it's like either. You can go off those points that Kasi has for right. adjusting it, and sure. it's like, uh, it's, it's going to take a while because it's going to be difficult, and I think they're going to Actually, the points will have changed, too, because... Um, the, contrast the contrast changes it. I know. Um, I can, I'll talk to you more about the service menu stuff I found. and The secret stuff that will not be said. I did do, like I said, I did do the service menu already, and Good. just by doing that, it puts you like
and let it try it out. Well, aren't those only the ones that supports are only European models right now, right? I don't know. I saw I saw they updated with a list of monitors that ColorSpace supports from TCL, like direct inner. Yeah. Did but you I see a, a TC, uh, Calman feature on the TCL? I saw something that said Calman on its expert mode or whatever, advanced mode. Um, so, anyways, I think I'm gonna hang out with Sammy a little bit. I just want to check. Yeah, 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 there. yeah. Do your um, thing, man. You've got me for as long as you want me. I. I had a client in the afternoon that I had to push. Uh -huh. Not for you, but just because I had to push them. So um, I'm going to hang out for a bit. Yeah. Uh, hey. These uh, are a gift from Sammy. Thank you. He sent these to me, but I'm bringing them back to you. Thank you, Sammy. I will yeah. make good use of them. And grab a chair. You hang yeah. out with Sammy. Oh, Maybe you see how good the Q7 is. I want to um, check it all out. Yeah. If you don't know what TVs we have, obviously the S95 C and G3, the QM8 has over 1,000 dimming zones for 1,200 bucks. That's the one I've he's heard. doing it right now. The U8K also has about a thousand dimming zones, but that one's not coming until next week, so won't be here. The Q um, the Q7 is on top on the right hand corner that has like over three hundred dimming zones, nice. and the U7K also has like three hundred something dimming zones. So what's amazing is how similar they all look in HDR. Well, I'm gonna put in HDR. This is obviously very easy, but yeah. So where can I sit the bo block the TVs the most? To kidding. Grab a seat because the room is so small, <laughs> well, I, right? I, I'll, I'll make sure I get out of the way for you guys. But yeah, thanks yeah. for having me over, and uh, I'll be here if you have any. Questions. Oh yeah, no, don't worry. I'll I'll shove you guys out when it's time to compare afterwards. But if anyone has questions about calibration, whatnot, this is a great time to ask the gentleman here. So let me get to some question, guys, and thank you. It's not all the time that we have all these TVs and we have experts, calibrators, to kind of give us our opinion. Let's get to some super chats. Hey, John, because the G3 gets so hot, when I want to move it, I have to use my wife's oven mitts. Talk about burning. <laughs> I love it. And how often do you move your G3? Now, honestly, I never, my G3 never got so hot, but then I don't want it in vivid mode, right? Hey, thanks, buddy, love for the super chat. Calibration support, shout out to Lisa and Brian. Yes, and shout out to you, buddy. Thank you for the calibration support. And please click like for sure. And yes, Magician did ditch the G3 for the S95C. As we see, it's just, for him, it's a better gaming TV. But use case, you know, you all have your favorites. There is no, let me get back in there, aha. There is no wrong answer. Love the TV you have, and when it's time to upgrade, that's when we'll talk, right? Okay, let's see. And again, if I miss your questions, keep on throwing it out there. I'm sure we'll have it. The LG is showing burn-in at a very significantly slower rate. At 4,500, that makes a difference for me. Hitman at 4,500, I don't think there should be any burden. I think the issue for me is this is an expensive purchase. And at the end of the day, unless you're getting an extended warranty, and I like the G3 because it comes with their five-year panel replacement warranty. But even if it's not a G3, my practice today, the modern TV is to get an extended warranty with it, whether it's from Best Buy or Valley Electronics or the manufacturer, I don't think TVs are gonna last two years. If they do, you're lucky. Things fail, and it's not just burn-in or the panel issues. We're talking so many things in TV can fail. HDMI ports stop connecting. Handshake breaks. Audio breaks. The list goes on and on. And we have power board failures that ratings have noticed, right? And that's all warranty. But you need an extended warranty. Manufacturer only one year. So if you have a credit card that gives you two, three, four years, use that credit card and use that warranty. Uh, coverage for sure because the modern TV today, there's just so many things that break. Hey Matt, the question for you is, is the G3, the S95C closer to the Sony reference monitor? Depends on the reference monitor. So you have two, the 300 and 310? Yeah, so I would say the G3 is probably a better match for the 310. The G3 is a better match for the 310. And the, uh, the QDO is a better match for the X300. And the S95C S95 is a better match for the X300. So there you go. Now you can go shopping.
I can tell you, Crypto Color Lights, Brian is traveling through Europe, backpacking. Well, I don't know if he's backpacking, but he won't be back for a while. So when he does come back, I am sure he will live stream. Actually, we will live stream. We already have an appointment to live stream about what we're going to do at M-Wave, the Midwest AV experience. So, yes, there is going to be our live stream. Of course, he always has his live stream if he's free. He's a busy man. I'm just going through your question, guys. Sorry. Oh, these long live streams. I lose track of my questions. Essentially, the state of Dolby Vision is a hot mess. Yes. In terms of, is it accurate to the creator's intent? Absolutely, but does it look different? It also looks different. The question is whether you like how your TV does Dolby Vision, because it changes from TV to TV. Not, no two TV does Dolby Vision the same, which is so ironic. For example, Lisa says, I watched the Dolby Vision show a few days ago, and the Dolby Vision Dark was brighter than Dolby Vision Bright. Yes. that. You see, you guys see what I'm talking about, right? Um, it depends on the TV because that same show on another TV would show it darker. So it's it's uh, it's I, I don't even know where to start with that. David Abrams says, "Who is this mad guy? He seems to know a lot." Yes, he did. He did sell out to Avical. And Batek says, John, I guess it's okay. It's good that you're getting the 895L because you won't have to worry about burning your hands anymore. Is it because the 895L has that heat sink? Let's hope so. The G3 is supposed to have a heat sink too, right? Or maybe that's why it's working. Having a heat sink releases the heat into the environment, which would be your hands. Yes, the Q7 is bright as well as the U7K. Just a reminder, both the Q7 and the U7K have dynamic tone mapping on because that's the only way the specular highlights will match. But if you notice the say in this scene with alligator, the contrast is is not there because it doesn't have enough dimming zones to give you that that contrast that OLED has. Q8 comes close, but it's just not quite there on the other two. So I'm going to pause right here and I'm going to lower the exposure so you guys can see the contrast differences real quick. So as you can see, the Parrot's beak is a little bit darker. There's more depth there than the Q7 and the U7K. Now, how much of that is because of the dynamic tone mapping? Remember, I had to turn it on, but does turning it on lift the mid-tones a bit? Definitely on the Q7. Uh, and on the U7K, probably a touch. But this is why you pay a little bit extra for the U8K or the QM8. Yeah, here are the feathers on the owl, not as black, where the contrast is just not quite there. But it's good. And let's just pause here so I can demonstrate the blooming control real quick and turn up the exposure so you guys can see how it compares to an OLED. So as you can see, the Q7 and the U7K, TCL and Hisense have come a long way with their middle of the pack TVs, right? The blooming, not obvious, uh, if any. Now I've turned up the exposure, I didn't super turn it up, but I turned it up enough that if there's any blooming that's obvious, it would show up and it's clean. The blacks are nice and uniform, see? This is why I'm so impressed by what TCL and Hisense did this year 
for under nine hundred dollars. Oh, battery just went out. One second. Let me replace my battery and my camera. I am ready. And we're back. Oh, these batteries only go so long. Okay. Yeah, we've come a long way in these budget TVs. I remember back for $800, the TVs were just a blooming mess. <laughs> Blacks were raised. Now, very acceptable, very acceptable. <laughs> that tech, that's funny. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Calibrator is going for the S95C over the G3. Actually, Calibrator is going for the Samsung over the LG. I think that is the headline for sure. The secrets, we can't hear them. Yes, Matt and Samia are passing secrets that not yet ready for public consumption. So I think the so Meow Mix, the U7K is not yet calibrated. So the, you're saying the U7K makes some skin tones green a bit. It does this in the snow scene sometimes. This is why you have to get your white point corrected first. So we'll see at the end, once they're all calibrated, you can compare the Q7 to the U7K to the S95C and the QM8. And you can see how they compare. The G3 will always look slightly cool because of its W OLED panel. But at least the other ones, you can have a pretty accurate assessment of how you expect your TV to look. The secondary mic does not work right now. Are you talking about this one? This, this microphone? Can you hear me? Let me get caught up my, on the comments. This is... This microphone is a secondary mic for them. Do you want do you want them to be mic'd up so you can hear everything they say? Is is that what you want? Do these cheap TVs scale better this year? Yes. Now, has it caught up to the Sony? That's another question. I have to I'll have to test that once the U8K gets here. And we'll test against the G3. I think the G3 upscaling is phenomenal of low bitrate content. So that's one thing the G3 does very well, I believe. So if you so here's another use case. It's more important to you to get good cable reception, right? Your cable connection is so so, your internet connection is so so, then the G3 works a lot better. I mean, who cares about HDR if you can't see the darn thing, right? So if you have issues with over-the-air broadcasts and cable connections, I'd choose the G3 or the Sony or the A95L, the best of both worlds, before I get the Samsung because the Samsung needs really good quality connection, whether it's a disc, whether it's hybrid rate streaming. Um, it's just, it's not i5C simply isn't as good. And the high sense of the TCL, I'll have to compare with the G3 once we get them all calibrated and the U8K comes in. And so we'll do some YouTube testing over the air, maybe a little bit rate, see what happens. Oh, is this secondary off? Something is not working. Let me troubleshoot audio real quick. Hmm. I think everything is on. Well, you can hear me, right? That's the important part. 
<laughs> I don't know. This is it says it's working, and yet you guys are not hearing this mic. Here, let me turn off. Let me mute my mic. So that should be working. One second. Oh, what is happening here? Yeah. Equipment failures. Ah, something is not working. Is it overheating? Is it overheating? It's overheating. This, I, I cannot believe that the camera is overheating. Oh, that's why it's overheating. I have it on ISO. 6400. Okay. Okay, should be okay now. For whatever reason, when the Sony A74, if the ISO is too high, it overheats. So it was in 6400, so I'll just take it back to normal. Should be okay. I didn't realize I left it up so high. Okay. So as you can see, the TCL and the U7K are a bit brighter. <laughs> it's really bright to see. Maybe because I put it on pause and it's now on dimming. There you go. Here, let's, let's, there you go. Okay. All right. Let's get caught up here. Yes, your question broke the stream, Meow Mix. You know what? Who am I to question the power of the butterfly effect, right? Now there's sound. See, I, I don't understand what happened. It, I thought I had sound the whole time, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe I had it myself on mute, maybe not. But thanks for letting me know. I got to check, update all these comments. Yeah, this is a interesting yet crazy question. Is it possible for calibrators to calibrate without using instruments and get better than out-of-the-box accuracy? Would you rather error towards magenta or towards green? <laughs> okay, so before I ask them, here's part of the problem as well. You may not know this, but everyone sees color differently. My bright green, maybe that person's olive. That person's red, maybe another person's dark pink. But with instruments, then you know that this red is this coordinate, and then you look at the TV. So you may not be able to perceptually match as well because your eyes are, everyone's eyes are slightly different. But at least you can match coordinates with the instrument and the TV and 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 what the measurements say. So if you eyeball it, what you're going to get is that calibrator's D65, how they see white, and whether that's accurate or not. It's indeterminate because they might have perfect D65, but then there, something else might be off, right? Maybe their brightness uh, sensitivity is off or whatever. So generally speaking, pure luck if you can get better than out-of-the-box accuracy because you're relying on the calibrator's sensitivity to colors, which, again, everybody sees color differently. Everyone has varying degrees of green sensitivity, red sensitivity, blue sensitivity. So it, it's, it's impossible to say that it's accurate without a measurement tool to confirm that it's accurate. But we'll ask. Hey, quick question for calibrators. They're wondering, if you didn't have measurement tools, could you eyeball a calibration? I mean, better than out of the box. Oh, better than out of the box. Yeah, so to say out of the box, and you think something is maybe wrong or not wrong, but you don't have any calibration tools, so could you eyeball it? If they, if, how do they know it's wrong if they think it's like, uh, that's that's wrong, what, like right. right, maybe it's right. Yeah, what are you basing that off of? So technically, I would say no. Um, <laughs> now, if you know what something's supposed to look like, 
then yes. You can, okay. If you know what it's supposed to look like. Like if, for instance, if Matt were looking at something and he just looked at, looked at it out of the box and was like, that's off, there's too much blue, he can go in and fix it just by using the games. And, and, and you guys know white. So let's say you have, a, at least you have a white pattern. If right. you throw in a white pattern you're so familiar with, would you be able to adjust just by matching? But you have to have some kind of a reference monitor. Or how about just a white sheet? I mean, could you do it with a, a white? What's, what's the color of the light bulb shining? Ah, that's right. Sheet? Tungsten or floor. Oh, there you go. You're right. It's reflected light, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say no. And if you're very familiar with something, you can look at it and say, okay, yeah, there is too much blue in this image. And you can just take out a little bit of blue. You won't really have any idea what it does to the rest of the grayscale mm -hmm. unless you go through different steps. But if you're that familiar with it, then technically yes. But if you are just think you know something is wrong, right? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. So basically, if the lips are green, maybe you can make it red, but that's about it. All right, guys. Good question. And would you guys rather err towards too much magenta or too much green? Magenta. Yeah, magenta. magenta. Yeah, me too. Green just makes everything look sickly, right? Your eyes, your eyes by nature will notice a difference in green more mm -hmm. than most other colors. Yeah, Matt's saying that your eyes will notice a green push more than anything else. I agree, especially skin tones. It just makes everyone look pale and sickly. And maybe that's why you're seeing magenta pushes rather than green, which is not good for sure. And KTM, good comment. Don't know if it's still true that S9 5C low bit rate is not as good as the G3. And that was from old, our ratings review. We're talking about the S95B. I don't have enough low bitrate content to say it definitively. I've seen it in some YouTube video or YouTube TV videos where if you have a background that's very heavily pixelated, macro blocking, I see it more on the S95C than on the G3. On the G3, they smooth it out a little bit better, but then that's in that one scene. I have to pause it. Oh, look, I see that, but as the scene moves through, you don't notice it. So that's the only way you're gonna know, is when you pause it and then you see the macro blocking, right? So normally it's when you have a very uh, uniform gray or uniform blue, but there's a slight change in brightness, very subtle, macro blocking is gonna appear, right? And that's when you see it on the s 5 c a little bit worse than the G3. But, you know, maybe firmware update changes that. So it does affect a lot of people. That's the thing. And you see it in some low bit rate advertising on YouTube TV for sure. Okay, so let's play. Again, so what, 10,000 nit content. We are calibrating the QM8 right now. Two more TVs to go. Two down, pending the QM8, Q7 next, and then the U7K. All right, new guy has a question. Hey, FOMO, you are the goat. Thank you. I have a question. Does the S95C's processor, is it bad? I want either the G3 or S95C. My lobby is moderately bright for satellite box gaming and gaming. Which would you recommend? Hmm. If your satellite box consistently has issues uh, with reception, well, first of all, what is the nature of your content? If your content is 100% from satellite, the G3 is fine, right? Uh, satellite's not gonna give you the highest quality. We're not talking the highest bit rate. It'll give you standard SDR and it'll give you some HDR, but it's not gonna be like reference level HDR. So the G3 at least addresses some of the scaling issues and it has more adjustments for that. But at the end of the day, I prefer the S95C because I just like it a little bit brighter in the colors, but in a, the G3, in the lobby with SDR content, which is most of satellite sometimes, you should be fine with either one. So yeah, get the G3 because five-year panel warranty, right? If you were 
in a more critical viewing environment and watched more high quality sources, then I'd probably go with the S95C. But given its satellite, the G3 should be fine, probably indistinguishable. Yeah, thanks for letting me know, Lisa. Yeah, for some reason, the sound was down. I don't know why. Uh, it could be... Let me see my phone. See, I have two cameras running, and each one's running on a different battery. I have to check my battery status. So let me check. And the microphone's going through this battery. So let's see what we got here. Oh, 56%, so that should be still good. Yeah, I have these massive batteries that I use. And I'll show you guys. These batteries for each camera, so that way it can last hours and hours in theory. And you can only take up to the 150 on the plane. So this is a 144. I have a 200 watt hour battery that I only use here. But when I go traveling on the plane and whatnot, you're limited to 150. So I take these, these are heavy too, but it allows me to shoot all day. All right, Dan, you've only been watching bits and pieces of the stream. Yes, I don't expect you to sit through, let's see, we've been on since 11.30, so it's a little past 2.30, three hours. Those who've stayed around, thank you for being around for three hours. We probably have another hour and a half to two hours to go with two TVs left. Um, would you mind giving my thoughts on the QM8? So the QM8, we are in the process of calibrating it. Once it's done calibrating, Dan, hang around. We're going to ask Sammy. Sammy, how far are you from finishing the QM8? Uh, finished uh, SDR right now. I'm not looking, but we did them really quick. And okay. Okay, so maybe another 20 minutes? Uh, say 45. 45 minutes. So in 45 minutes, Sammy will share his impressions of the QM8 and basically his experience. Uh, last year, the T-Cell 6 Series Roku was just a bear to calibrate, and he swore never to calibrate another Roku TV again. This year, because TCL heard the complaints, moved to Google TV, and so we'll see how well that calibrates, and then we'll share our impressions. But out of the box, the QMate's phenomenal in terms of black levels and blooming control. But now the question is, how close can it get to accurate? Last year's Hisense U8H was very accurate. It actually was more accurate than the QN900C, which I had calibrated at the same time as the QN90. 900C, yes, 900C, U8H, and the A95K. Sammy was here calibrating all of those. And U8H killed the QN900C in terms of accuracy and blooming control and black levels. That's why it was my editor's choice TV last year. This year, let's see what the QMate can do. And then the U8K will come next week and we'll compare that. So Dan, hold on for another 45 minutes and we'll have some answers for you. Oh, Joshua, I didn't know you had an 85 inch. I know you have the QMate, so another satisfied customer. Will you be sharing specific guidance on calibration on this stream? Yes. So as soon as, hang around for another 45 minutes, as soon as Sammy is done, he will share his best in terms of accuracy, right? Obviously, you can always play with different things, but he'll share his observations on which settings he found to be best. And, you know, you can play with it. And we'll see what his calibration settings are as well. As you all know, every TV is different. So technically, you do not want to share our calibrated settings, but we'll share it anyway. So you can see what he played with to get it where it needs to be. But normally, what you would want to probably adjust is contrast, and possibly the, uh, the ST2084 or whatever that TCL will allow us to, to adjust at most, and maybe color, saturation, or hue, or maybe nothing. So we'll see what 
Sammy recommends. 45 minutes. And where can I get calibration advice? Thank you. Well, it's, it's, is there the settings? We can show that, right? And it's, there's not a lot. There, literally, there will be three settings that we'll help you with. But if it needs more help, you can need a calibrator. Or you can do it yourself, right? Get the equipment and so forth. And you can learn how to calibrate with the software. But it's not something that you can receive advice because it's, you just have to get it accurate with a meter. You cannot do it without a meter. Going back to the other question, which is, can you eyeball it? Out of the box, all these TVs are actually pretty good. You're not going to be able to eyeball it better. It's best to get a professional calibrator if it's worth it. Calibration normally costs anywhere from 400 to 600, depending on where you are, and how many people they're calibrating, and if you're getting a good deal, or if they're new, and all that good stuff. But they're going to have all the equipment you need. So if your TV costs 5000 let's say, then it's worth 10% of the price of the TV. If it's $500, then I would not pay for calibration that would cost twice <laughs> that TV, right? Or you can learn to do it yourself and, and get like a $200 meter and, and just learn the basics. So Plasma's comment, when a camera makes QD OLEDs look different than WRGB, is that just an amplification of the actual differences in person or does it just not have anything to do with reality? nothing to do with reality so wrgb it's that white sub pixel the camera for whatever reason the w oled panels from lg the blues are pushed extra hard so whites look cooler w oled always looks cooler on camera than any other display technology so if all my tvs were w oled let's say the a80k and the A80L, and the X90J, and the G3, and the C2, whatever, they're all the same W OLED. Then I could adjust so that it looks the same, and then you wouldn't know what's what, right? They'd all, look, they'd all have the same appearing white point. But because W OLED has a white sub-pixel, all camera sensors latch on to that white sub-pixel, and suddenly the W OLED looks bluer than it should. So in person, it's not as blue. Here, let me play this again, and we'll pause it. Because if I make adjustments to correct for the LG OLED, then everything else will look too warm, right? And so often the solution is, well, why don't you have two cameras, right? One camera set so that it adjusts for the W OLED, and the other camera is not. But then that adds another complication. Just for what I believe is a dying technology, W OLED, it, it is. It's still a TV, but as far as progress is concerned, it's stagnant right now. There's only so much they can do with W OLED. So as you can see here, the G3 is slightly cooler, right? Now, am I, as I'm looking, they're very, very similar, but on the camera, it looks cooler. So uh, that's why when we compare W OLED, we don't talk about color as much as contrast, which doesn't change. The camera can capture contrast fairly well. And brightness, dynamic range. So we talk about luminance, we talk about blooming, we talk about peak specular highlights and gradient detail, all that we can talk about. But it's, it's not, it's, it's too difficult to talk about color differences, but because they're all getting calibrated, the differences are no longer important. So as long as Sammy says, oh, they're all within 1% of accurate, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference. So trust us when we say they're pretty color accurate with the exception that the QD OLED will bring you more BT2020 colors, so there'll be more depth and more richness, which will be impossible to capture on my camera and sent to YouTube. And, and that would be the only difference in terms of color. Good question. Van Gool, I wanted a review on the Q7. You'll get it. The Q7 is here. We just have to wait for it to be calibrated, and you will get that review. We will compare the Q7 to the U7K. You saw my U7K review. I really liked it. The Q7 is going to be calibrated, and then we're going to compare it against the U7K. And how much are you losing compared to the QM8? Because the QM8 costs about $400 more. What are you getting for the extra $400? Is it worth it? And most importantly, Van Gool, what is your use case? If you're just watching sports, I'll tell you right now, don't get the QM8, the Q7, or the U7K. 
bright enough for sports. There's enough contrast for sports. SDR is fine. But if you're talking high quality HDR content in a slightly darker room, or you're watching bright HDR off of a great source like a disc, then the QMA may make a difference. So what is the source? What's your use case? Are you gaming? That may be another difference. Let us know. Good question, Meow Mix. I noticed that the Hisense, we're talking about the new Hisense U7K, UAK, uses the MediaTek MT9618. Is that a much better chip than last year? Yes. So I spoke to Hisense at CES and complained to them that, hey, you know, last year's TVs, the U8H, U7H, your gaming processing wasn't so good. It looked like you got half resolution 4K 120. And their response was, yes, our processor did not have the bandwidth. It simply could not process quick enough for 4K 120. So you had to give up something. We gave up on resolution. If I gave you resolution, then I would give up on image quality. So ultimately, the processor was not good enough for gaming at full 4K 120 and preserving image quality and everything that comes with it. So this year, he said that they addressed that. They've updated the chip. They've added more processing bandwidth. However that is, it's not just the MT9618, but they optimized their software as well. So, and I noticed it's a better image processor. If you saw my review that I put up yesterday of the U7K, there's less banding than the U8H for sure. And I was like, wow, right there, looks clean. So already without having to game, I see the benefits of the new processor or the new image processor. So definitely the U7K processing is improved, no doubt. It looks like the Q7 needs better blacks. Yeah, it's so right next to the OLED. Now you can get that black with the C1, C2, even the A2, right? So the Q7 is not going to even match uh, A2, right? So the A2 might be, let's say 65 inch A2 is like 999 uh, on sale. So you can get an A2 for 999, but the HDR impact of the A2 will not match the Q7. So in a slightly brighter room, the Q7 will give you that HDR impact. But the A2, the LG A2 OLED, will give you that infinite contrast in a dark room. You'll have the perfect blacks. SDR will look phenomenal. So you just have to choose what is important to you. If HDR is important to you, I get a larger Q7. Enjoy the immersion and the HDR pop. But then the black bars bother me. So I cannot get the Q7 for myself. But if I watch full screen content like TVs and whatever, uh, TV shows, broadcast, where black bars is not an issue, the Q7 actually would be good enough. And hello, SD. What's up, buddy? Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you, thank you for coming by. Say hello, and don't forget to click like. Those of you that just joined, I'm here to answer your questions. 2023 TVs or beyond or before, ask anything and I'll let you know what I know. So today, for those who just joined us, we are calibrating the S95C, the G3, the Q7, the U7K, and the TCL QM8. S95C and the G3 has been calibrated. We are calibrating the QM8 right now and then the Q7 and then the U7K. And then after that, we're going to compare them just to see after calibration, how much different are they compared to out of the box? I'll tell you right now, it looks so similar to out of the box, very subtle differences. So you guys would be very happy if you don't hire a calibrator for any of these TVs, very good. Good question, GR Price. Let me take a sip before I answer that. GR Price asks, is the only difference between the S90C and the S95C, the one connect box? It's more than that, but it depends on what size. So at the 77 inch size, you are correct. At the 77 inch size, the one connect box is what separates them because both 77 inch panels, did I just overheat again? Both 77 inch panels use the second generation QD OLED from Samsung Display. I'll just let it rest for a few minutes before I turn it back on. Both use the second gen panel from LG Display, or Samsung Display, whereas on the 55 and 65 inch, 
only the S95C is guaranteed to have the Generation 2 QD OLED panels, whereas on the S90C, 55 and 65 inch, there's a mix of Gen 1, last year's S95B panel, and this year's. Now, the differences are very subtle, though. I mean, probably slightly brighter. Definitely a more durable blue, is what I've been told, or more durable OLED chemistry. But on the 77 inch, which is what I have, I have the 77 inch S95C, and I had the 77 inch S90C, which is now packed up, ready to go back to Samsung. I've been spending the last three weeks comparing it. And I have to tell you, on the 77 inch size, the only difference is the One Connect box. The any image quality differences are so subtle. And we're talking in bright sports content in dynamic mode. The QN, the S95C is slightly brighter. And I'm talking slightly because I have it side by side. But in movie content, HDR movies, disc, Kaleidoscape, it doesn't matter. Netflix, exactly the same. Image processing is the same. Peak specular highlights look the same. APL, everything looks, <clears throat> excuse me, the same on the 77 inch when watching HDR content. So if you need that extra bit of nits for sports content, then the S95C gets you there. But you really, you're paying the premium in the 77 inches for the One Connect box. That's what I believe. Now, the audio isn't better though, by the way. The audio on the Q95, on the S95C is, is a little soft. I'm not impressed. You would need to get a sound bar, even, if, even though it's a 77 inch, it doesn't matter. So if you're in the 77 inch size, get the S90C, you'll be thrilled. Now, people are afraid, oh, you know, it's so similar. Are they gonna nerf it? That I don't know. If you get the S95C, at least you're assured that it is unlikely to be nerfed. If you get the S90C and word gets out that it's so similar and they're losing sales of the S95 to the S90, they might nerf it, they might not, no guarantees, but you're saving $1,000 at the 77 inch size. So let me turn it back on again. See, camera should be cool by now. Oh, yeah. Let's say you put in 2000. Just turning up the fans. Hopefully it doesn't get too loud. Gotta get the fans blowing in here. No, five TVs are a lot of TVs. So maybe get some cool air blowing through the room. Make sure the camera doesn't overheat. I think that's what it did. Okay, let's get caught up. And if I missed your questions, please ask. Ask away. Ask again. And yes, when I lose video, let me know sometimes. I'm so busy talking that I, wait, did my camera overheat and turn off? Unfortunately, this is not the FX30. The FX30 is on me. I'm using the higher quality lens that's on my Sony a7 IV. It's outputting 4K30 out of the HDMI port, but it's not designed for long-term streaming apparently, and it's overheating. So, you know, I have to let it cool every now and then. Next time I'm gonna have to swap and use the FX30, which has an internal fan. So yeah, I apologize for that. Three hours. Some of these cameras are just not meant to be durable. Hey EP, FOMO, will you be reviewing the Hisense UX? I will be, but not in my studio. Uh, we'll be judging it at the shootout. So at the Value Electronics shootout, we're gonna have an 85 inch shootout between the U. X, U10, the Hisense U10, the QM8, and the Sony X95L, and possibly even the Samsung Q95C. These are the four best 85-inch mini LED TVs money can buy this year, and we'll see how well the Hisense does, and they'll all be calibrated. So it'll be apples to apples in terms of technology, mini LED, and but the LCD technology actually is slightly different. So the U10 is ADS Pro, the Sony is a VA panel, I believe, the QM8 is also VA, and the Samsung may even 
is also VA. So the question is whether the U10 with an ADS Pro panel, but with 5,000 dimming zones, is it the better TV? So that's the question we'll, we'll find out. I'm excited to find out. And, it's, and the shootout will be in early October. So tune in and I will be hosting the shootout. So Valley Electronics, New York City, and Brian and I will be hosting. We're going to have a lot of friends. So we'll make sure there's going to be no dead air as we talk you through the TV shootout. It is the last weekend of September coming up. Hey, Complex Simplement 14. FOMO, been watching you for years. Love your analysis and content. Why, thank you. I'm really looking at the Q7 or QM8. As far as dimming zones, would the QM8 better the con for contrast, 85 inch size? Correct. The QM8 has the most dimming zones at the 85 inch short of the Hisense UX, but that TV is $4,000 or more. The QM8 at $2,300, you're getting more dimming zones per dollar at the 85 inch than any other TV. How's that? So yeah, I had a couple of people here have the 85 inch Qmate and they love it. I have the 65 inch, and it just looks so good. I'm very happy with the 65 inch and it appears that it's a VA panel at the 85 inch size, so you should be okay. As far as consistency of our reviews, right? All right, we got a question from Austin. You've been here since the beginning too, buddy. Thank you for hanging around. Question for FOMO or the Magician. Is there a noticeable difference in the S90C Gen 2 panel versus Gen 1? I don't have the Gen 1 to compare, so all I can tell you is based on what others have said, but I know for sure what Samsung Display has told me. The difference is in durability. Slight brightness in the chemistry, but the reality is the durability. They're telling me it's two times more durable, so that's important. So as far as brightness though, it is not significantly brighter. Tech with KG compared his S95B to the Q to the S95C. You know, it's subtle. Uh, it could be a processor upgrade as well. But the S90C is also similarly better than the S95B. Hard to say. It's so. It's kind of like going from a LG C1, C2, the whole Evo panel, EX panel. It's too subtle. It's not. It is better to go to the 77-inch S90C is my opinion, because that you know is a Gen 2 panel. There's no discussion, there is no confusion. 77 inch S90C Gen 2 panel, be done with it. While you're in the 55 and 65 inch S90C, you're like, do I have a Gen 1? Do I have a Gen 2? I mean, why put up with that, right? And then of course the service menu. <laughs> I would not touch the service menu to match the S90C brightness to the S95C in the 55 or the 65 inch. You just don't know what you're doing. I mean, why, why mess it up? The 77 inch, because they are so similar, you don't have to go to the service menu. They're, they're literally nearly identical. The smaller sizes, is it worth the extra 50 minutes? I mean, you could see it on a measuring tool, but perceptually, unless they're side by side, like KG and Classy had to show you, I, I don't think you're gonna notice it. I think it is better just to get the 77 inch if that's within your budget and be done with it. LG did the same thing with the whole Evo EX panel. It's, it's, why do they do this to consumers is what I say. Good question. What about the raised blacks in Dolby Vision after the update in the G3? Mine is showing it, not calibrated. So, you see the issue is calibrating it will fix things but then the firmware update may change things and so at the end of the day you got to live with it <laughs> i mean short of going in there and playing with the contrast just enjoy hdr10 because it's not just an lg thing right sony may screw this up high sense tcl it's all over the place i'm sorry daniel I don't have a good answer for you because the last thing I want to do is give you a setting for the LG Dolby Vision only to have it change again. And so, but it's subtle. Get it, put it on Dolby Vision Dark, and if it's slightly lifted, go to HDR10. It should be better. That's that's always my answer. Is yeah, just use HDR10.
is upscaling better on the QM8 over the QM90B? I don't know. I really don't know. Really hard to say because I, don't, I no longer have the Q90B, but I didn't have any issues with upscaling on the Q90B, and the Q90B actually has very good upscaling. Oops, you know what? It was my computer this whole time. I thought it was my phone. Hey, you want sandwiches? Or are you gonna hold off for dinner? Uh, yeah, sandwiches would be good. Okay, Matt, you want sandwiches? Sure. All right. Two. So these are Vietnamese saltado sandwiches. They're. Um, you had me at Vietnamese. What was that? You had me at Vietnamese. Oh, <laughs> yeah. These are kind of like they're Vietnamese sandwiches, but they use. Ah, you'll enjoy it. Because because when you say Vietnamese sandwiches, it's like saying tacos. There's so many types, right? Oh. As long as you guys aren't allergic to, to stir fried beef, this is what you guys are getting. Oh, you guys do a saltado, right? So it's a saltado sandwich, Vietnamese style. Excellent. Are the TVs dimming? Oh, yes, because I have it on pause. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, Cyril, yeah. Sometimes I put it on pause and I forget, and it's like dimming. So let's, let's change that real quick. There we go. No longer dimming. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're talking about white points. That's why I had to pause. I just never got it off of it. So back to the question. Is upscaling better on the QM8 over the Q90B? So here's the problem with Samsung TVs. The S95B, although is a good TV, for some reason, the QM90B had better processing. The issues that we saw with the S95B and upscaling low bit rate content was not present on the Q90B or the Q85B. So it was unique to the way they did it on the S95B. So the Q90B I found was excellent. I've, I've never had issue with Samsung scaling, processing in general until the S95B last year. So now the QM8 on the other hand, TCL has been at best average, but now they're playing with the big boys. People are actually choosing the QM8 over an equivalent Samsung QN90C or 95C, can it do the job? So we're gonna compare the QM8 to the G3 and the S95C. Not today, unfortunately. I have to get my splitter set up so that we can run YouTube TV content. And sometimes when I do it randomly, I get unlucky and it's like the NBA and suddenly the whole thing shuts down. So I will curate the content to see with lower bitrate content, how are things affected, right? So we'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that once I have the U8K as well. We'll be doing QM8, U8K, Q7, U7K, right? We're going to compare their processing and see how they do uh, next to or compared to the S95C. We'll see. Good times, guys. Good times. Get an ice pack for your overheating equipment. You know what? Even though you're just kidding, you understand that I've actually had to put my camera, my A, this is when I first started YouTube. I was so mad that the A6400 Sony kept on overheating. I actually put it in the freezer. And then I find out, don't do that. Condensation will destroy everything. Ah! So I stopped doing that. But I've always had these overheating issues with Sony cameras because their alpha series are photo first, video second. Their FX series are video first, photo, whatever. And so that's why I have the FX30, but I do love the image quality and the dynamic range and the lenses on the full frame. I had the Alpha 1 and that overheated like crazy no matter what I did. So I have the A7 IV. I'm going to wait until the next whatever. Oh, maybe the next Sony FX6 that comes out at the end of the year, hopefully, Mark III, whatever. But until then, I'm going to have to find a way to deal with this or I'll swap out the FX30 and put it there. And hopefully the image quality doesn't drop too much. The FX30, the resolution isn't as good. So that's a 6K down sample to 4K. The FX30 is just 4K straight up. And the lens on the camera over there is a higher quality lens, right? It's, it's a 
G Master lens, and this is just a regular G lens. So I'm trying to give you guys the highest quality 4K streaming possible, and Sony's just not cooperating. But it wasn't designed for three-hour live streams. It was going so well the first hour, right? Which TV doesn't crush black between the S95C and the G3? The S95C. The G3, depending on the scene, but I have been dealing with crushed blacks on the G3 out of the box. Calibration addresses it, though. So if, you're, if you don't plan to calibrate, then you have to go into the G3. You have to kind of play with the shadow details. But out of the box, the G3 crushes it just a little. It's very subtle. You see it in Dune, right? So watching Dune, those dark scenes at night during the assassinations or whatever, it's, you could see the crushing. And Dolby Vision, slightly crushed as well. The S95C doesn't have that issue in those same scenes. So, but you could adjust it. You go in the G3 and you could lift it a bit. But ultimately, though, it's not a big deal unless you watch that content. But yeah, that's one of the complaints I had about it out of the box. But now that it's <laughs> calibrated, we'll see if the question is still there. It should be fixed for the most part. The TV dimming is annoying. Welcome to the world of OLED. Any way to turn it off for in-home use? So it's content dependent and on the LGs, you can go into the service menu and make it less aggressive. Depends on the TV. Some TVs you can, some TVs you can't. On the LGs, you can, and that's one reason why people get the LG. And I highly recommend the G3 for watching hockey, where dimming happens the most often, right? SDR, bright, you're in vivid mode. Hockey, white, super hot, right? <laughs> the panel is super hot. And this is where the dimming happens. It's protecting itself from overheating, but the G3, you can go into the service menu and kind of alleviate that, alleviate that a little bit. But the G3 is for people who really need that bright, bright scene. It dims the least. So, yeah. So, use case. In that case, G3 is a great TV. Uh, S95C, I don't like fiddling with the service menu. But even if you turn everything off, they will dim if you hold it static. Now, this is not static, right? The content is changing. It's not going to dim. But... If you're watching a hockey game where it's the same bright white, it will dim. Or it may start off dim because the TV cannot handle all that brightness. So yeah, a good argument for the G3. Hey, welcome, Big John B. Don't forget to click like. Those of you who just joined us, click like. We're going to go for another two hours at least because we have to still calibrate the Q7 and the U7K. Q8 is on the last few minutes of calibration. We'll see where that goes. Okay, Big John, just getting in live chat. Welcome. But have you heard or seen anything about the S95C overheating? I have the 77-inch S95C. Haven't had it overheat. I've had it run for 100 hours straight, right? I have a Cladescape break-in uh, content where it runs HDR movies. I have it running on vivid mode or dynamic mode in this case, and there was no issues. I felt the back of the TV at the end. It was warm, typically warm like a TV is, but it's not hot. So I don't know what use case you've heard the overheating, but in regular use, just HDR content, it wasn't overheating for me. And if I've heard it also drops brightness when this happens, does it overheat in regular daily use? So let's see, someone had it in a super hot room. Is it ratings or I don't want to misspeak, but if you have this in a room that's 90 degrees, you're going to have issues. My room is normally 75 at any given time, so it's not an issue for me. If you're in a hot room, Big John, hot meaning over 85 degrees, it could be an issue. It really could be. Uh, I don't know that question, the answer to that question. But yes, it's a possibility that it will dim if your room is hot. Not so much that the TV is running hot, but the room is hot and the TV cannot cool itself down, right, regardless. And this may affect any TV, frankly. Uh, TVs are designed to do certain things to protect itself, and if the ambient room temperature is high, the TVs are going to have to lower the brightness to avoid overheating. Uh, but what is the ambient temperature of your room? If it's less than 80 degrees, let's say 75, like most normal rooms, you should be okay. In the summer, maybe not. All right, let's try 1,000-nit content. Now, 1,000-nit content is 
99% of all HDR content you're going to get streaming. Maybe 99.9%, right? Streaming content does not go brighter than 1,000 nits. Uh, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. So with peak specular highlights around 1,000, if that's your use case, Netflix, Netflix HDR or Netflix Dolby Vision or Prime Video, Disney Plus, whatever, this will show you what the TVs look like with that kind of content. Now, I put 10,000 in content because you guys want to see what a reference TV looks like. If you give it the best quality HDR, 10,000 in just one day, if you have a 10,000 in movie, how does it look? But 99% of the time, it'll be this. And so the question is, how do these TVs compare with 1,000 in content? So you'll be surprised at how similar they all look. <laughs> <laughs> which is great for TCL and HiSys, not so good for the G2 or the S95C, right? Uh, what about the smart calibration app? Is it close to a real thing? No, it cannot be. It is impossible. Play with it. If it looks better, you win. If it looks unnatural, reverse it. That's all I can tell you. It, there's no way it, it can be. Out of the box, it's already so good. I cannot imagine the smart calibration app doing what Sammy is doing, which is he's got his meters. He's got every minute detail taken care of. And the smart calibration app, at best, is adjusting for obvious flaws in your white point. That's it. It cannot, it's not adjusting yeah. color. It's most of these smart calibration apps are just moving the white point, making sure it's close to D65. So, I mean, try it. Hey, as long as you can reverse it, reset it to factory, worst case scenario, right? Okay. Plasma, interesting question. Can you ask the calibrators, what's the warmest white point that can look the best to our eyes? I'm thinking about the ultimate gentle to our eyes picture quality. So you have two things. D65 is a reference white point that people agreed on to be used. It's not necessarily warm or cool. We just have to agree on the white point reference that all TVs and monitors can rely on, right? And then... Eye health is another matter. Because if it's set to D65, but there is a scene that has a lot of blue, it's still accurate, but there's too much blue. And your eyes, well, it's not good for your eyes, right? Especially at night, you don't want any blue light uh, after sunset, so you can fall asleep easily. You, you're gonna have to suck out some of that blue. It's, so it's no longer even a white point issue. The setting, all modern TVs, I'd say as of, let's say 2020, right? Or even 2021, has a low blue setting where you, you know, nighttime setting, eye health setting, Samsung has this, where it sucks out the blue for evening watching so you can fall asleep afterwards for eye health. That's unrelated to image quality in D65. So it is not a white point thing. It is a, I need to suck out as much blue as I can with, and the TV has that setting, just click on it. Rather than you choosing a white point, because that, that just, that's even worse, right? It's, now the image will really look unnatural. Just hit blue light setting or nighttime setting or whatever your TV may have and let the TV do its thing. I do it for all my monitors. Like after a certain time, oh, everything looks warm. Oh, time to go home. So hopefully that answers your question. Good question, Van Gogh. Did you use him last year to calibrate the TCL 6 series? <laughs> yes, that's what I was talking about. So Sammy, has been. this is Sammy's third year calibrating my TVs. And yes, he was here last year and the Roku was a nightmare. Roku OS was a nightmare. So I'm sure TCL heard it. And so now we're back to Google TV this year. And it appears that it's working better. I, I hear no yelling and screaming. You know, Sammy's not throwing things at the TV like, like he wanted to last year. So yes. Hey, Sammy, is the Google TV an improvement over Roku for calibrators? Uh, yeah, if it worked. Um, so, so Sammy was saying, yeah, if it worked. So when you're done, well, <laughs> maybe not, right? So we'll, we'll see what happens. This is better, but 
how much better is the question? So Sam will let you know. He's almost done. He's cleaning it up now. Calibrated my Q900B 8K with SmartThings app, it default to filmmaker mode. Why? Uh, probably because that is the most accurate white point. So filmmaker mode does two things. One I really like, one I do not like. But what I really like is it tries to get you to what it thinks is D65. And that's all it does, right? Get you to the TV's D65 mode. What I don't like is it sucks out all motion processing, which is not good. Now you have stutter. You need to have some processing. Otherwise, the stutter is just unbearable for me. Some people like it. Uh, they prefer that to soap opera. I prefer the Samsung at a 3 or a 2 or a 4. It just depends on the TV model year. But somewhere between a 2 and a 4, the Samsung eliminates the stutter, and there's not noticeable soap to my eyes. Now, others are really sensitive to soap opera, and they cannot go above a 1, right? They just put a Samsung on an anti-judder of a 1. So this, if the SmartThings app is moving into filmmaker mode, it's probably, <laughs> it's like, hey, this is good, D65. And then all you have to fix is motion settings, right? Just go to motion and make sure it's not on zero. Then you're going to see some stutter. But if you're okay with stutter, then that's, that's fine. But that's probably why. Maybe that's, all the cal maybe that's all the app does. Calibration app, how bogus. AKA filmmaker mode. That was easy, right? You have a calibration app, all it does is automatically switch it to filmmaker. Elisa, excellent questions. Aren't these TVs different price brackets? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, we have three price brackets. We have the G3 and the S95C flagship price brackets at the 65-inch size. They're over $3,000, the best money you can buy. Then you have the QM8 at $1,200 right now which is, I'd say, a step down, right? You, you could argue that the QM8 is very similar to the Samsung Q90C, Q95C, Sony X95L or X93L. They don't have a 65-inch X95L this year, but it's designed to compete with those TVs. And then you have one below, the third tier. The, I don't want to say bottom tier. This is the tier below the mid-tier, which would be the U7K and the Q7. So why do I have them all here? You don't know how good that Q7 is unless I compare it to the G3. What if it looks exactly the same? How would you know? And this is why we do this, right? Part of the stop the foam is, oh, you know, I can only afford a Q7. What am I missing? Well, now you know, and you may not be missing anything. This is why we do what we do is for you to see, well, what exactly is the difference? Because, and I say this all the time, if all you do is watch sports on cable, you really have no reason to pay any more than a U7K or a Q7 because it will look nearly indistinguishable from the other TVs, no matter what the price bracket is. We're at a point where for $800 or $900, right, the Q7 and the U7K are around $850. For that amount of money, if all you do is watch sports and broadcast news, looks just as good as the S95C. I mean, it's minor differences, but it's not worth $2,000. It really isn't. But if you're watching disc content, high quality HDR, and you have these dark scenes, you have these bright scenes, you have these you know, Mad Max. Okay, now the S95C is gonna leave the other TVs behind. And it goes to what is your use case? The reason I have them lined up is, once you tell me your use case, I could say, save your money. Get a large 85 inch U7K. For the price of a 55 inch G3, get an 85 inch U7K. The immersion is even more important then the image quality of a 55 inch from eight feet away, right? So if you're sitting eight feet away, get a 75 inch or 85 inch U7K, you'll be even happier. But you won't know that unless we do things like this. So it's too easy to compare $3,500 TVs because then, oh, wow, they'll look the same. Like other than a few minor points, it's when you pull in the U7K, then you go, oh, I see the black bars in the U7K is slightly lifted. but. I don't watch movies with black bars. So what does it matter? Well, if you don't watch movies with black bars, you get a U7K, right? So this is why we do it. Good question. You know, I, 
I, you know what I realized, Matt? My camera started overheating when you arrived. You literally added to the ambient temperature of the room. <laughs> it just said, wait a minute. See, all it takes is an extra human body to raise the ambient temperature to get my, my Sony out of spec. Sorry. Normally I get Sony in spec. And you know, next time I'll just have to swap the cameras. That's all. Now I know. You don't know what you don't know until it happens, right? And, and Classy says, I want to switch back to the Panasonic S5 II. Yeah, I don't hear any complaints about the Panasonic overheating. So I'm waiting for the Panasonic SH2. That's one I'm also waiting for. Hopefully, comes out this year. Hey, Jesse, is it too loud? There is a ceiling fan. Well, it's not a ceiling fan. It's actually a backdoor fan trying to get the air through. If it's too loud, let me turn it down one notch. You guys have such good hearing. My goodness. It must be my high quality microphone. I have a Sennheiser lav mic. I have a Sennheiser lav mic I'm on. And I have a Sennheiser MK something or other microphone right here. And these are really hypersensitive. This one's used in a lot of TV shows. Very good for dialogue. And this is obviously great for dialogue. Apologize if there's. <laughs> what is this? Who's the bald headed guy blocking my view? It's the calibrator. I need him there. Okay, crypto. What TVs do I own right now? So, the 77 inch S95C is mine. This will be my reference TV for the next year. The U7K, I will be sending to M Wave in Kansas City as a giveaway, uh, courtesy of Hisense. Thank you, Hisense. The U8K that's coming, I'll review it, and then I will also have that sent to Kansas City as a giveaway. Thank you again, Hisense. The QM8 and the Q7 I own, and they're being calibrated. I don't know whether to keep it for myself or you know, sell it, raffle it, whatever, until the U8K arrives. Now, the U8K is coming on Monday or Tuesday, so we'll see. Uh, for me, the determination is processing, dimming zone control. I mean, we have some scenes where I know TVs have difficulty processing it with banding and stuff. Let me see how the UAK does. And the G3 right there. So the G3, unfortunately, I'm going to have to move somewhere. <laughs> Probably give it to one of my aunts or uncles. At home, I still have the Q90R. I like the TV a lot. I have the... A95K, of course. The Sony A95K is in my bedroom now. It is my SDR nighttime TV. Excellent TV. I love that TV. So, and, and then my parents are watching my 65-inch Q900B, which to me was very disappointing, but my parents loved it. They're, the three biggest complaint, why is eco mode off? So my mom turned on eco mode, yelling at me for wasting her electricity. And then she goes, and why is the volume so low? So the volume is on like 99 and then they said to me, did you get us the cheapest TV you could find? Because the volume sucks and the eco mode, it's still too bright. Couldn't you get us a better TV? I didn't know what to say, right? Because if I told her, well, I got you the best Samsung when you can buy it, then she'd call me an idiot for getting ripped off. So I said, I'm sorry, mom. What do I know? He goes, I thought you were a TV reviewer. See, use case. Should have gotten the Q80C or 80B and it would have been happy, but no. Got them 900B 8K. She's like, well, what's this 8K business? It's too bright. Put on eco mode. So be, beware. Sometimes when you buy a TV, I think they would have been happy with a TCL, honestly. But the TVs I own are constantly in flux. It just depends, right? But definitely the 77-inch S95C is a keeper for a while until QD OLED raises the bar whether it's peak brightness or something else but right now like i had the a9g as my reference tv for almost two years before i got the a90j you know and this one's probably gonna be here for a while it's a it's, it's a phenomenal tv i really love it oh and at home half the time i watch my ultra short throw my ultra short throw on the wall 120 inches because the family says it's 120 inches it looks great turn off the lights SDR, we don't care. We don't know what HDR is. But Netflix on 120-inch against a white wall, and they were happy. And so the, T the 
Q90R is no longer being watched. They just rather see this 120 inch from like eight, nine feet away. So yeah, you know, we're enthusiasts. We look at pixels, the quality of each pixel, and yet most people just want a bigger TV. Something's to be said about large TVs. I think Brian's got it right. Hey, Matt, yes, sir. can you turn off the ASVL stuff, the dimming on the G3? Or someone's saying it's, it's locking, the G3 locks you out from doing that. Is that the case? Um, so we can do it. There's a... Oh, wait, come over here. Let me, give you, let, me give, let me give you the microphone. So, oh, sure. so G3 or C3, we're talking about disabling this dimming. And let's just talk about the older TVs in general. Sure. So, so S95C, can you do it? S95C, you can do it uh, via service menu. Okay. And is it something that they could go online and look up and do it? And yeah, then... they could search for it. Yeah. Okay. Probably look at the so S95C, you could yeah. do it easily, relatively yeah. speaking, with a special Samsung remote that acts as uh, the yeah, service menu. Yeah, like your typical generic remote, yeah. G3 or C3? G3, it's kind of key locked. It's not something... Um. I mean, there's... there's there's other methods that are more convoluted to do it. But they would find that online. Some random Reddit They'd probably thread. find it online. Okay. So the method we do is, I would say, the more proper method. It's been provided to Abacal by LG. Because it's professional reserved. client monitors right. and so, so forth. So the thing is, if your content is in motion, the, the biggest thing that was an issue was the TPC, the, the, the temporal peak control. Mm-hmm. They've mitigated that almost entirely with the 2023, so you generally don't need to go in there as a consumer at all. Mm. It's only if you have a static image static. on the screen, like you saw right. earlier, where yeah. it really dims down. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see that dimming like in a dark scene over time as long as there's motion. As long as there's, yeah, not like last year they had that yeah. with the C2 G2. So it's different in Hollywood where if you're looking at a shot... And you're and, staring at it and, and talking about it and having coffee. And literally... If you, have to, if you haven't seen a colorist work, you're making these tiny incremental changes to all the different aspects of the image in real time. And if it dims down, they're going right. to correct for it. So right. uh, it's not really necessary as a consumer. But that's what the reference monitors do. They, they don't have that safety mechanism. Correct, yeah. Uh, okay, all right. that helps. That does help. Now people can go and explore Reddit and ruin their warranty. <laughs> oh, are you done with the QM8? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's talk... QM8. Check audio. Okay, you guys can hear me. What we're going to talk about now, I'll just push play real quick, is the QM8. So, just to recap, last year we did a 6 series Roku TV, nightmare to calibrate. You swore off never to calibrate another Roku TV again. Yeah. And TCL listened and made it Google TV this year for their flagship QM8. What are your thoughts, improvements, better, worse? It's, it's definitely better. Um, it's still not great. So the issue when it was Roku is that one, you, it required the use of the app. Yes, and that then, was horrible. Yeah, and then using the app, if it connected, it's like, okay, that was one battle. Once it got connected, if it stayed connected, that was another. And then next was that if you say made a change at say 85% stimulus mm -hmm. and then you took a sweep, a completely unrelated point, nowhere near what you just adjusted could potentially see a fairly significant change. So I could take a, make a change at 85%, do a sweep and all of a sudden 40% is shot and you can't really do anything to fix it. You're, I was able to maybe at most adjust four points total before it would just kind of start to, you know, get away to the point where I couldn't really make any more adjustments. Right. Um, so it wasn't great by any means. For this year's model, using Google, um, the two point definitely works better. The uh, 20 point doesn't really work outside of 100% stimulus. Um, I was actually showing Matt, <laughs> for instance, I could max out green because green is super easy for us to see so just maxing out green on one of the points um you should be able to see it you don't see it at all and then after i max it out i could then take a sweep and the grayscale will not have changed at all hmm. the only one that would make a difference is the two point and a hundred percent stimulus 
so that means 80%, 75, 70, 60, any of those, they don't actually work. So they don't do anything. Um, next is the CMS. You don't have a full CMS. You have CMS for just saturation only, and that's it. You can only adjust saturation. You cannot adjust uh, tint or hue per color channel. Luckily though, just by simply adjusting um, color globally and tint globally, you can get it pretty close to being on target to where it needs to be. And, and that's, I guess at the end of the day, that would be the question is, with all these obstacles, mm -hmm. but once you were done, is it within the accuracy that oh, like you feel accuracy tolerance for like what? Oh, better than last year. Let's start with that. Yes. Because last year I saw it was very much over. You couldn't fix the red. It was just oversaturated. Yeah, it's, it's definitely better than last year. Okay. 100%. Okay. Um, 100% better than last year. In terms of where it lands in, in regards to accuracy, you're looking at it, your grayscale average of 0.6. That's pretty good. max of like one. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really good. And then color, um, you're actually looking at roughly the same. Um, that's just if you're looking at the gamut and measuring off of like fifty percent. Right. Not if you're doing like a full on, uh, super detailed color checker. It's right. not going to fare that well. But in terms of, but you're watching content, just yeah, anything, in, right? In terms it, it'll of stuff look good. like this, yeah, you're you're fine. Okay. So like someone could get one of these um, if they're using warm. Honestly, all they would need to do is take away some red for the two-point gain, um, just for within the game section. Oh, you know what? Yeah, let's let's go over those settings. Thank you for the reminder, and then we can see your best settings out of the box uh, for the TCL. So here we have. All right, so picture mode, movie. Yeah, no, sorry, uh, brightness 100 for HDR. Saturation, I noticed you have at 49. Yeah, that's one of the things that I need to do to fix it. And we've got advanced settings, brightness settings. So brightness is 100, contrast 100. So no adjustments to contrast. Yep, no adjustments. Black level 50, that's default, right? Mm -hmm. And all the other stuff is off. Local contrast on high, that's their local dimming. So we go high. Gamma is at 2.2. Yeah, because it's HDR. Mm hmm. And color adjustments, color saturation, you have at 49. Yep. Tint at 51. 51. That's something that needed to be done to uh, rotate the axis to move your... Primarily, it was to move red, yellow, and um, cyan into target. Okay. And color temperature, max, warm, minus 5. And that gets you to closest to D65 before you have to make any adjustments. Yeah. And was there anything else you found that you had to jump in and really change? Like, what out of the box did you see any one color that was either over or undersaturated? It's pushing a little, it's a little too warm, so you could probably instead of going warm five, mm -hmm. um, you can maybe drop that down to like warm four or whatever, so like right below it. Okay, but because if they, you know, obviously they're not going to have this calibrated, so yeah. if they were playing with it, it'd be yeah, because I noticed five was a bit warm. So with those settings and warm four, it should be closer, right? Yeah, it should, it should be closer. And you could just say with warm five and then just going into um, gain and dropping red is going to naturally boost green, which is going to naturally give you oh, more luminance. You know what? Can you move the laptop a little bit yeah. over? So that way, let me show them the settings again. Because you got a lot of QM8 fans that wanted to see the settings, the laptop was in the way. I get remote, and here we go. All right, guys, with the setting one more time. All right, picture mode, movie, brightness 100, color saturation 49, advanced settings, brightness 100, contrast 100, black level 50. Then I'm two mapping off, local contrast on high, micro contrast off, gamma 2.2, color, saturation 49, tint 51, and color temperature. And this is where they can play with either minus five or minus four, right? right. Oh yeah, you see that so jump. It's, yeah, so it's a lot more blue. So right. by putting it at warm uh, at minus five and then dropping the gain down by, it's gonna, I can't say they're all gonna be the same, but let's just say, drop it down to like negative 13, 
by right. doing that, it's automatically going to increase green and blue, mm -hmm. which is going to give you more luminance. So in your case, it went from being like 720 something nits to like 760 because it pumped more green into the image. And at the end, you watch your magic. It looks great. What is there a color or is there a setting that you wanted more precision to do something, but you couldn't? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> between the QM, so between the QM8 and the Samsung, which had more fine-tuning settings that I used to use? controls? The yeah. Samsung. Samsung. Yeah, by far. Yeah. Okay. This doesn't have, like, so one, you have 20-point grayscale, but only one of those 20 points work. So, so it's really one point. Yeah, so it's like <laughs> I can do my two point or I can do 100% stimulus. I mean, some of the other points might work, but after going through about five of them and seeing that they did nothing, uh -huh. I was pretty confident with cutting my losses and saying I'm just going to move forward. Okay. Um, and then for the fact that I don't have full CMS for like uh, gain and hue for each color channel, that's kind of... So th this is interesting. Is so Google Google gives you these controls, but it's up to the TV makers to actually connect the control to the TV. So it's like connecting it to nothing. Well, that, <laughs> not, not all versions. So there's a lot of different versions of this, like the Google TV. Yes, um, definitely. So like for instance, I've come across some where you have full CMS controls. Where I've seen it where you have saturation, and instead of it being like. Here's red, here's red saturation, red hue, red brightness. It's like, here's saturation, here it is for red, green, blue, yellow, magenta, cyan, right. for everything. And then I've seen it where you have 10 point controls, but those 10 point controls are global and they apply to absolutely everything. So there's a lot of different iterations of. So you're going to have three different iterations of Google. You have the QM that you just did, we have the High Sense, which is also Google on top. Well, on the bottom, so you're doing the high sense Q7K right now. Yeah. And then we have another TCL, the Q7. So let's see if the Q7 gives you more controls or not. We might be pleasantly surprised. Well, I'm expecting it to be roughly the same. That's why I'm doing the high sense next. Okay. Because if this is exactly pretty much the same, then this points that I, or the values that I put in might work or put me at least in a general vicinity for that one. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't put me in a general vicinity, at least I already know what to expect that X doesn't work. Yeah, that'd be great if it does work. Then we could share these settings for people getting the TCL, because especially the Q7 is so affordable, yeah. uh, as well as Q7K. So that's why I want to do the high sense and X, okay. get that out the way, and then I'm just going to literally just plug in the settings for here on the um, other TCL, measure yeah. it, see where it comes out of two, and go from there. Well, it explains why you were so quick doing the Q8. Yeah, nothing works. <laughs> <laughs> it's like fake, works. fake settings. Yeah. I love it. I wonder if it's like <sighs> Okay, guys. Any questions about the QM8 calibration? So it's not as frustrating as Roku, because unlike Roku, where things worked but didn't work right, on this one, it didn't work at all. So I'll let TCL know. Oh. <sighs> And so, Fade to Black has a good comment. No 20 point scale, really only one point. This is why calibrators, or P if you want to get your TVs calibrated, absolutely, right? Most people just put it on like Samsung owners. Warm one, warm two, good to go. So, but we don't know until we actually do it. This is why I get the TVs calibrated is, how much effort do they put into their TVs? I expect this of a four series, or three series, and even a Q7, right? Uh, but the QM8, it, it's in that territory of premium TV. Now, the 85 inch is like over $2,000. But the question again is, well, first, the fine tuning ability of these TVs for calibrators. But then at the end of the day, does it get close enough? If one point gets it close enough, well, I guess it saves time for the calibrator, right? You just don't get that nth degree like with the LG. So we'll see. At the end, we'll compare the different images, skin tones, of course. And you guys told me, good enough? Oh, how off was it out of the box, Sammy? So, you know, was it good compared to what it was out of the box? What, what are your thoughts? 
now that you're done with the coloration, was it bad out of the box? Yeah, it was. Yeah, but I mean, color was actually pretty good. Okay. Um, it's the grayscale that was really off for the most part. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I can. So was it uh, crushing blacks or was it contrast? I mean, it doesn't really track EOTF ah, properly. It was too bright? Uh, yeah, it was too bright uh, for sure. And then it clipped early. Um, so mm. it kind of tracked once you got towards, I think it was on 60% stimulus. Um, it starts to under track. Okay. But is... were you able to address in calibration? So this is what it looks like out of the box, right? So you had an uh, average DE of 5.6 with mm -hmm. a max of 9. Color was 2.7 with a max of 9. Um, as you can see, it just kind of too bright right here in the midtones and then under track right when it got towards around 65, 70% stimulus. Mm -hmm. And you can see this is what it was. This is what it is now. So mm. you have still under over track. Um, so it will always yeah, be slightly brighter. It will be slightly brighter just than, than, than the, the source. Right. And then uh, it will slightly under track once you get to, again, 65%. So this is like an old Samsung TV. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which what it was like before. Um, but our errors went down from, again, average was 5.6 to a max of 9. It went down to 1.6 to a max of 4.7. Okay. And your color went from 2.7 uh, with a max of nine to point six with a max of one. Oh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, point six. Yeah, that's good. So you can good. see that it was like overly warm. Mm -hmm. So now it's pretty pretty well aligned. Um, it could obviously be better if you have more controls. Like if they, if those controls worked, um, you, you can. Like, you could have EOT, the corrected the EOTF curve. Yeah. yeah. And well, so this goes to show this is where the money is, right, guys? is when you have an engineering team with the resources or whatever, and they have to spend money on something for a budget TV, more dimming zones or more calibration control, which would you rather have? And I think the QMate did the more dimming zones maybe is the right decision because now they're able to have perfect lumen control, right? Although the calibrators aren't happy because it's, it's rough, the settings are rough, but they got it closer, but they have more dimming zones. On the other hand, maybe with the Sony, similar price, maybe actually more expensive, with only 80 dimming zones, but more calibration settings to get it to that nth degree of accuracy, which would you rather have? And, and I think that's something that at least consumers have choices, right? Because no TV is perfect for everyone. You have to decide on the budget. What are you cutting out? And yes, Classy, can you play the three feature 600 nit demo? The QM8, yeah, I'll put on 600 nit demo right now. This, the QM8 is over brightening everything, Classy. That's so, yes, so even after calibration, oh goodness, that is, that, that's a good demonstration of over brightening a 600 nit content. Now, most people won't complain, but it's not accurate. So let me turn that down so you guys can see. All right, let's try that again. So this is 600 nit content. Uh, so yes, at 600 nits, it, it is a definitely over tracking. There is no doubt about it. Most people complain if a TV is too dim. Does anyone complain if it's too bright? I know we do because it's not accurate, but this is how Samsung won the TV awards, right? I say won because they sell more TVs than anyone else because they, in the past, not recent history, but in the past, the days of the Q90R and before, they definitely overtracked it just like this. And people loved it. So, you know, maybe this is the new Samsung. If you, enjoy, if you miss the days of dynamic Samsung, the QM8 is going to give you that extra brightness, right? Okay. Yes, the UAK is 8 bit FRC my understanding. Uh, 
the QM8, whether that's a 10, you know. So unless the manufacturer shares that with you directly, I just assume everything is 8-bit FRC. I just, because it's how you save money. Because even if you look at displayspecifications.com, they sometimes post whether it's 8-bit FRC or 10-bit, but sometimes they get it wrong because if the manufacturers don't give them the information, then they just put 10-bit. But what does that even mean, right? So you don't know if it's native 10-bit or 8-bit FRC equivalent. Oh, okay, here's a good question. So FOMO ask Sammy if the S95C and HDR is what you should be using as your reference to say if another display is on average doing something wrong. So Sammy, what are your thoughts on that? If, if reviewers like myself use the S95C and Matt chime in, if the reviewers like, like us use the S95C that's calibrated, can we say more often than not other TVs compared to it, that can be used as determining whether the other TV is doing something wrong? I mean, is, is it reference level enough? What I would do is I would calibrate the Samsung, the D65, mm -hmm. S95C, then calibrate the G3 using as much calibration tools as you can, and then perceptually match it, and then use the G3 as your reference. For color or HDR brightness? HDR brightness. Okay. Yeah, because generally you can get those to track, like, at a point two delta two thousand okay. grayscale, they track very very tight. Okay. Yep. And what about color luminance? Because there's always that debate: is it oversaturated or is it diluted? If you're the... if you're within P three, you're good. If you're beyond P three, the Samsung will show it. So okay. I'm sure but, you're gonna say that. So so Sammy, so <laughs> what, what, what do you think? It it depends. Like if you if you if you're capable and I'm not telling people to go run out and buy something crazy but if you can <laughs> if you can <laughs> if you have an external let box uh -huh. I would use the Samsung all day okay it but that is the with the caveat wait we did do, external do, let box do you have an external let box yes oh see that's that's why I'm using the s 95 thank you Sammy yeah. okay so it, but if you don't what he said is 100 percent spot on because you can get the G3s or any LG for that matter yeah. to like reference reference level accuracy, but um, that's due to the LUT, which is what that's missing. So if you put that on there, but that's why you have the LUT box. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And uh, so this tells you guys when you're debating between the G3 and the S95C, if you get it calibrated, really there is no wrong answer, right? Yeah. Good question, Classy. Of course. Okay, so who's out there going out there getting a LUT box? I know Classy, do you already have a LUT box? So now, so the S95C moving forward. Now I have both the G3 and S95C, but I have the S95C on the wall, mounted on the wall, as you see there, whereas the, whereas the G3 is on the mobile stand. So it's easier for me to move the G3 out and leave the S95C there. And it's a little bit larger, so I can see the detail. So I'll be using the S95C. Hey, guys. Sandwiches. Oh, wow. Coffee oh. drinks. Oh, beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, so they're, they're both the same. So just choose one and share. I, I want to make sure my calibrators don't, like, fall over. OK. Oh, we're going to get hot coffee? <laughs> hot coffee is what you wanted on a hot day, hot coffee. Speaking like a true coffee drinker. What does EOTF stand for? Hey, Sammy, what does EOTF stand for? Anyone off the top of their head? Electrical optical transfer function. Electrical optical transfer function. That's replaced the, what, the gamma? What? So it's unique to HDR, right? It's tracking the brightness. It's a curve that you guys, that people track. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's like a linear, it's not really linear. It's effectively gamma. It's gamma for HDR. Yes, yeah. it's gamma for HDR. So Lisa, what EOTF, so you know what it stands for? What is it? What do you use it for? So basically, it's to see if your TV has the brightness of the source, or is it brighter than the source, or is it not bright enough? So if you find your TV is brighter than the source, you calibrate it to try to bring it down. So in some scenes, you're like, wait, why is my TV, if you have a reference monitor, wait, 
The reference monitor is not as bright. What's the TV so bright? That means it's not following the EOTF curve, right? So you want it to be exact to what the source is and calibrating to the EOTF curve, which is like a line, may, makes ensures that your TV tracks it accurately, meaning bright scenes look, oh wow, this frog is really bright. So this is a, <laughs> Kim made it, loves the green frog. I gotta read. This is 600 nit content where the green frog looks phenomenal. Okay, so there we go. This is an example of the QM8 not following EOTF proof. So we're at 600 nits and let's see if I can adjust this. Oops. There we go. Let me turn my exposure down a little bit more. You guys can see. Okay, so the QM8, uh, as you can see, even though it's calibrated, this is what Sam was saying, where the EOTF, EOTF curve tells you have brightness at a certain level. The Samsung, the G3, and the Q7, even though it's not calibrated right, it appears to be tracking OTF, but the QM8 wants it a little bit brighter. Now, this is not accurate, but as a TV owner, hey, it's up to you because Samsung owners have been enjoying EOTF, exaggerated EOTF curves for years, and they became disappointed when Samsung actually followed the curve to become accurate. So definitely it's preference, but just so you guys know, uh, the QM8 does not track EOTF as well even after calibration. And it's something they could fix. I don't know if they could fix it in the firmware, but I think Samsung may have done so with the S95B to a certain degree. So yeah, if they wanted to, they could. And this is 600 nit content, so all the TVs can handle this. All right, let me get caught up in some questions here, guys. All right, here we go. Kinotro Trades, thank you for the question. Would you recommend a U7K over a QM8 or a Q7? And Best Buy has a QM8 for $16.99. So the Q, what are, you, what are you using it for? For sports, there's no, basically black bars on the U7K, you can see it, right? You see the lifted blacks and the black bars. If you're watching broadcast sports where there are no black bars, it's full screen and you know it's nice bright punchy u7k is fine if you want more subtleties deeper black bars then let's wait for the u8k to arrive let's see if that follows the otf curve a bit better than the qm8 the q7 we are calibrating right now and then you'll see but so far it looks like the q7 and the u7k are very similar so but at the end we'll be able to compare those two but what's your use case kinotro if your use case is sports news old TV shows, U7K is fine. Don't pay for anything more. But if you're watching HDR content where you have this dynamic range and you want that ultimate contrast, then I'd say either the QM8 or the U8K, but QM8 is gonna be a little bit brighter. And if you like it bright, then you got your man. So let's, let's, let's make it super bright when you do 10,000 nit content and see what the QM8 does. There's a, explode with brightness. Okay, Austin, good question. FOMO, when will Samsung watch the kill shot and do an MLA QD OLED TV? Half joking, what's the state of micro LED tech? So yeah, we all know, uh, Samsung has already stated on the record that MLA doesn't make sense for QD OLED because MLA is supposed to be fixing something that is not need to be fixed on QD OLED, on the LGW OLED. There are polarizers and color filters and all these things. And the MLA brings back that brightness that's lost with all those layers. Whereas in QD OLED, it doesn't have those layers. So adding MLA is like adding corrective lenses, but you have 20-20 vision, like me, right? That's, you know, right? No, no lens. So, uh, but that's their position now. Maybe they'll find a way to use MLA to make it brighter, 
without having to correct for anything. So I still am convinced that MLA could help, but their official position is that MLA does not help. So we'll see. And here we are at 10,000 minute content and the QMA definitely looks very bright. Maybe it goes above 10,000 minutes if that's possible. But it's those scenes like that where you're impressed by the QMA. Next question is, let's see. Oh, micro LED tech, yeah. So what about micro LED tech? It's too expensive right now. The best micro LED tech is going to be on VR, AR glasses. Hello, Vision Pro. I know that's not micro LED, it's micro OLED, but that's where it's going. All the good stuff is it's more affordable to put the best micro LED tech into AR, VR glasses. To have it on a TV, it's just not possible right now. Not in scale, not in volume. It just does not work well because it's too expensive to get all those micro LEDs pixels placed properly. So they still need to master manufacturing and they haven't. So for it to sell under $10,000 for a 65 inch, it's gonna take another seven years is the estimate. But right now, our best technology will be QD OLED or QD something, right? A QD layer with either micro LED blue or a OLED blue, but it will be a QD layer with some emissive blue and that's the way we're going for at least the next four or five years it's it's that good okay uh, i just have to put this up because i wanted to hear your comments i heard that uak would still be using 8-bit frc sadly wondered whether qmate went that route or 10-bit so this debate my personal opinion is it doesn't matter. And that's because I'm going by ratings, their comparisons. They could not see a visible difference. So my question for you, Rachel, is why do you want 10-bit native? Other than it's more expensive to do it, and, but ne not necessarily better per se. What, is, what are you seeing in 10-bit native panels that you will not see in 8-bit FRC? That, that is really the question. Now, ratings concluded that there is no visible difference, so they stopped adding that to their review, meaning, oh, this is a 10-bit native and this is an 8-bit FRC. They're like, what's the point? Because it doesn't add to the review. It doesn't help the consumer choose the better TV. So let us know the logic, Rachel, behind why you want 10-bit native if 8-bit FRC is indistinguishable. Now, it could be something like, oh, 10-bit panels last longer. I don't know. But yeah, it could be quality of life. But educate me why you want 10-bit native over 8-bit FRC. Because as far as image quality, I thought they were indistinguishable. Good question, Scott. What is the difference between the Samsung S94B and the Samsung S95C? I don't know. I haven't seen, oh wait, is the S94? Oh, the. S94B and S95C. The difference is the S95C uses the newer panel. I don't know. Um, I thought you said S94C. Okay, S94B is last year's TV. It's a 2022 model. It is the first year that Samsung introduced QD OLED. The S95C is the updated version using second generation QD OLED panel. It has the more slightly brighter blue, but more importantly, durability is two times better. We don't know what that really means, but Samsung Display is on the work as saying that the second generation QD OLED that's on the S95C is twice the durability and the blues are slightly brighter, more saturated. And the S94B also has the older processor as well. So even the S90C, which uses the same first gen panel as the S94B, in the 55 and 65 inch size, the S90C also slightly looks a little bit better. But the S95C, all the sizes use the Gen 2 panel, 55, 65, 77 inch. The S90C, only the 77 inch is guaranteed to have the Gen 2 panel, whereas the 55 and 65 inch, some people are seeing the Gen 1 panel on that TV. So the biggest difference would be that Gen 2 panel on the S95C. And the second difference is, and this may be even more important to you, One Connect box. On the S95C, the One Connect box, that's a thing, right? It's 
all your input output is on a separate box and then you have this one connection that connects to the panel and the TV is a bit fancier it's got the silver bezel it's lighter uh, Q symphony is supposed to be better but ultimately I think the premium you're paying for is the one connect box because the S90C essentially looks the same without the one connect box at the 77 inch so hopefully that helps you make your decision Scott Good question, Plasma TV. Is it possible for a TV with a lower color gamut to look more saturated? Yes, <laughs> it's possible. Uh, a color gamut just means that there are certain colors it can show. Let's say they both share the same color space, Rec 709. But one TV might look washed out with that same color, right? So you can be more saturated in the same color space. Color saturation and color gamut are two different things. So the answer is yes. And your Pioneer Kiro, Kiro seems to have more saturated greens than my C1. Assuming you have them both calibrated, it has to be apples to apples. If it's not calibrated, then maybe it's oversaturated, right? Is it accurate? So once you calibrate it to accurate, then is it still oversaturated? And that's why I have these TVs calibrated. So when I compare color and luminance, I get a sense that, oh, looks great, doesn't look great, whatnot. But I need a reference TV that I can say, oh, okay, they look alike. So this TV out of the box looks very similar to my reference TV. So you need to have a reference TV, a reference monitor for you to truly say if it's oversaturated or undersaturated. Good question. And hey, Joshua, you're welcome. Thank you so much for covering the QMate. Great job. FOMO and Sammy, the 85 inches, 2200 right now. Great deal. <laughs> yes, that is a good deal. Still a great TV. Most people will see it and they will not go to another TV. So someone wanted to know, Sammy, that if you adjusted the gamma setting, would it change the EOTF on the QM8? Yeah, but it really shouldn't change it. It's just going to make it, it's going to make it overcast or undercast. The problem is, is it's almost like... Oh, wait, wait, here, let me get you the microphone. Yeah, but you really shouldn't change it. And plus the problem is more that it's more, it's almost like an S-curve, right? It's mm -hmm. starting to overtrack and then it kind of dips down and then it undertracks. Mm -hmm. So if you change the gamma, then you're undertracking it even more where it you're undertracks. Change it, you're going to change where that occurs. Where that happens, yeah. And how much it occurs. So it's like taking it and saying, okay, yeah. it goes like this, move it here, and then move it here. I want it flat. Like I don't yeah. want to move where it occurs. I want, don't want it to occur. And changing the gamma wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't change it. It wouldn't address the issue. No. So the answer is no. Good try. Okay, sports, gaming. Ah, sports for sure, the U7K is fine. Um, gaming, that needs a more thorough discussion because it, it just depends on what you're gaming, what console, HDR, SDR. Are you doing Xbox Series X, Dolby Vision Gaming, right? There's, if you're a casual gamer, then the U7K is supposed to be better, but we need to do actual gaming comparisons at that point, which we're not doing today. Sports, for sure, the U7K is fine. I think you're wondering, right, which one's better for... Uh, let's see. Here we go. Yeah, so for sports, U7K is fine. Gaming, does the QM8 bring anything more to the table? Is its HDR better? Here's the problem with gaming, is if you're HDR gaming, LCD TVs turn off their local dimming, to a certain degree. So it's going to be, the image quality will drop. This is why people game on an older TV, whether it's a C3, G3, S90C, S95C. If you are seriously gaming in HDR, you gotta look at the S90C or the S95B, if that's still available. But if you're gaming SDR, then it may not make a difference <laughs> at all. So yeah, what kind of gaming are you doing? This is where people get into hot debates. And if I don't get your question, ask again. I'm sure I missed it.
doesn't Samsung use TCL panels for QLED and LG panels for OLED now? So Samsung uses a lot of people. They use TCL, BOE, AUO. They used to use themselves. So depending on what model, what size, Samsung will source their LCD panels and their backlight and LEDs from different sources. It changes year to year. Now, yes, Samsung is using LG OLED only for their 77-inch, 83-inch, separate and apart from the QD OLED. They are not mixed. I hope they're not mixing and matching the two technologies because QD OLED is definitely two things. It's more expensive and it's better. So they are sourcing LG OLED panels for less expensive 77 inch. So they are buying 77 inch and 83 inch from LG. And these TVs, well, first of all, they don't have an 83 inch QD OLED. So they're gonna offer an LG 83 inch QD OLED first. And then among the 77 inch OLEDs, you will know which one's QD OLED and which one is W OLED. If they mix it in the same model lineup, there's going to be bloody hell. <laughs> there's going to be riots in the street. People will not be happy. And I'm going to have to assume Samsung will not do that. And that's just crazy to mix a mix. It's like mixing VA panels and IPS panels, right? They're so obviously different. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, I don't think they will, but you never know. Never say never. Has the G3 fixed their game optimizer? I don't know what was wrong with it. Oh yeah, some of the settings weren't on. I don't think so. I think I think Classy has been on top of that. Oh, are you trying to call in? Uh, try it again, Classy. I don't see anything ringing, so as soon as you call in, I'll pick up. Because normally it rings, so just keep on trying. <laughs> I think Brian had this problem before too, because uh, it's, it's, yeah, just keep on trying. As soon as I see you, I'll throw you in there. Hey, Noel, have you done a comparison between S95C HDR10 versus LG G3 Dolby Vision? So I've done every combination of this, Noel. I've done, not on this stream, because it's too much work to do on one stream, because it's, very time consuming. I've done G3 Dolby Vision versus G3 HDR10, same content. G3 Dolby Vision versus S95C HDR10, and then G3 HDR10 versus S95C HDR10. Uh, the conclusion is whether it's movie content or Spears and Munsell content. Oh, hey, Classy's here. Hey, all right. Let's see. Let's add him in. And let me see if I can add you. All right. Let's take you out. Hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Classy? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. Cool. Yo, yo, yo. Can you hear me? Classy, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Am I on mute? Can you hear I me? see you, but I cannot hear you. No. Nope. I am. Um, All right. Okay. Does everyone hear Classy? Checking, checking. I uh, hear you. All right. Hello? Hello, I can hear you. Just checking. Does everyone else hear Classy? Okay. Okay, so we have a question for you. I think you can answer this very well, uh, which is, let's see. What are your thoughts on G3 Dolby Vision versus S95C HDR10? Does it make a difference for you? Same content. Uh. No, because the difference or advantage that you gain from Dolby Vision does not outweigh the differences in uniformity, um, gradient handling, uh, dark saturated colors, uh, all the other advantage. And what are the gains from Dolby Vision? Because people heard the gains are not worth it, but they want to know, okay, what exactly are those gains? In some content, uh, you can rest assured that the detail that you see in the highlights is how it should be, um, or at least more so. Oh, you can uh, be brighter, or you pull up. it down to be darker. 
You're breaking up, class. No nope. You're breaking up, my friend. Bluetooth, okay. hang on. All right. As soon as you tell me that the firmware is fine, because you know how crazy it is that I'll update my OC for the jet work, but like, I want to update my master. Okay, so once Classy gets back, he might. I think it's Bluetooth that's troubling him. This is what we pretty much agree on as reviewers. Dolby Vision gives you some more gradient detail, very minor, but you're losing a few things that the G3 cannot do well. They don't do well with color banding. They don't Hello? do well. Oh, I hear you. Hey, okay, so you were saying, uh, what are the benefits? We know what the yeah. disadvantages of the G3 are, but what about the benefits of Dolby Vision that they would be giving up? So you get slightly more highlight detail depending on the scene and how it's graded. And it also, so with HDR10, you know, you basically choose or the TV company chooses how the tone mapping is done. Uh, so whether it makes it brighter and then it clips it or it makes it darker to show more detail. Um, whereas with Dolby Vision, it makes all those decisions on the fly. Uh, but it usually leans towards being more conservative and making it darker to show more detail. Okay. And for you, it's not worth uh, it. No, I think the S95C is already bright enough for 99% of scenes and content. And then it has good enough tone mapping that you would hardly ever have a scene where it makes much of a difference. And the same can be said for HDR10 on the G3, depending on how you set the tone mapping. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I noticed. And for me, just watching streaming and everything like that, at best, they look nearly identical. And at worst, Dolby Vision is sometimes dimmer. So on average, once when Dolby Vision is at its best, it, to me, it barely looks different than HDR10. And at its worst, it's definitely dimmer. And so on average, yeah. I don't find Dolby Vision to be compelling. Yeah, so if I have an A95K or a G3 that's calibrated uh, with a Dolby Vision config file upload, um, I'm going to use Dolby Vision because it's there, and I know those TVs can do it well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, again, like I said, what you gain from it doesn't outweigh the advantage of just QD OLED versus WRGB OLED. So yeah. um, I'm actually going to be, my 77S95C is going to be... Um, taken back for a 65 and I'll put the 65 in my new studio mm -hmm. and then I'm going to get the 77 A95L for the living room. Ah, you're going double QD OLED. What, what is the significant yeah. other state of that? Oh my God, you're doubling down, my friend. Yeah. Well, she, she loved the A95K when we had it. It was sad when it left, so hopefully she'll be happy with the A95L. <laughs> oh, she better be. <laughs> 77 yeah. inches of love. I love it. The, uh, the, the thing too is like, we all really like the S95C a lot, but mm -hmm. she, I don't have time for games anymore. She does. So when she's playing games, there's one major issue, not really major, but the one thing that needs to be fixed with the S95C is when it's in game mode, most people are experiencing where the screen will just go black for two to three seconds completely randomly. Um, doesn't matter if it's a Xbox, a PlayStation, a Switch, a PC, or whatever. Uh, the video just drops for two to three seconds. It could happen twice in an hour. It could not happen all day. It could happen seven times in an hour. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Right. And that's so, on the S5C? Yeah, and it's very widespread. Huh. So just while you're playing the middle of the game, it blacks out and it pops back in again? Yeah, like the audio going through my receiver, you know, the game's still on. It's still going. It doesn't drop the signal entirely where it has to re-handshake. It's just the video signal just goes pure black for about two seconds, and then it comes back on. Now, speaking of game mode, so apparently there's a issue with the game optimizer. Michael wants to know, has LG fixed the G3 game optimizer issue? No, and there's nothing to really fix. It's in, as they intend it. It's how it was previously on past models. The difference is with the MLA, the difference is now much larger than it was before. So like if you measure a G2, uh, or C2, or any other LG before, game mode always had a reduction in performance. Um, it's nothing new. It's just now everything by MLA is amplified by around 40%. So mm -hmm. that difference is also amplified by around 40%.
And, and for those that don't know, what is that difference? What is the, the ongoing issue with the G2 or G3 now? As you get to outer edge of HDR color gamut or higher stimulus levels of color mm -hmm. in HDR, the color brightness just cannot keep up with the outside of game mode. So like it's basically a half to a third of the color brightness in some of the measurements I've done. Okay. Do you think this is something they could fix in a firmware or is it a limitation of the panel? I think it's, uh, there's an ongoing theory that it has to do with input lag. Um, I don't think it's that. I think it's because in a game, even if you're not technically sitting still, you're in a very similar area for a much longer period of time than you are when watching a movie with the scenes constantly changing. Um, so I think it's there to prevent burning and last longer. Okay. That makes sense too, because you know, every year, burning is a concern, and the TV makers know with warranty claims what causes burning, and they'll make the necessary adjustments for your TVs to last. But it may not be to the gamer's advantage, but it is what it is, right? You know, I don't know. Like, think of somebody playing Madden for six hours a day or whatever. Like, that's just green on the screen through most of the screen for that long. Like, it's they just have they have to keep that in mind. And quick question from Vishnu. Hey, in your QM8 reaction review live video, when you disabled dynamic tone mapping, the QM8 brightness matched the G3 in the horse scene. But is QM8 now looking brighter than other TVs here after calibration? So Vishnu, it actually was brighter before and after. After we fixed it a little bit, but it still doesn't track EOTF. It is actually boosting the EOTF in certain luminous levels. And so... In many scenes, you will see the QM8 a little bit brighter, like the frog scene we saw, or maybe the clouds. There's a highlight that will be a little bit brighter than it should be. It's subtle. It's not terrible, but it's there. So, yeah. Uh, and that's what happens when you don't track EOTF. So after calibration, it's actually a little bit better. But And also, these TVs now have like um, many hours on them. But we'll play with all the settings shortly. Once we have... All the calibrations done. We'll go through it again. QM8, Q7, and the U7K. We'll play with dynamic tone mapping on and off, and you'll see what differences it make. But for sure, dynamic tone mapping makes certain mid tones brighter on the QM8. So I definitely have that off. And I had a recent firmware update on the QM8. So who knows what that does, right? There's this, we never know what it does as well. But fortunately, we had the firmware update before the calibration, so should be good for now. All right. So, what are you? What's happening over there, Classy? Uh, in terms of what are you reviewing next? Uh, let me get back in the car in a second, and then I'll answer. Oh, yeah. No worries. Call me. So you don't you're... hear the traffic. All right. All right. You're gonna put yourself on mute. I'll just be muted. Okay. No problem. All right. Let's get you some of your. Crazy questions, people. And again, if I missed your question, just ask, please. And don't forget to click like if you haven't already. We are on hour five, right? We've been on since 11.30 Pacific time. We're at 4.30 now. And we're on our second to last TV. This is the Hisense U7K. So as soon as that is done, we'll welcome Sammy back and have some comments. Let's see if the U7K gives you better settings for calibrators. All right, so um, I am in the middle of working on the studio still. It's painted, um, still a lot of stuff I have to move and set up. And I have tours every weekend and I'm gonna be gone the week of the fourth. So it'll be mid-July before I can finish the room and get back to anything. Mm -hmm. um, oh. But I'm gonna be picking up a S90C and C3 um, to add in to my reviews and everything over the next couple months. Excellent. Okay. That's exciting, man. And, and you have a lot of trips lined up to travel the country for some calibration? Yeah. Uh, I posted earlier, I'm going to be in Virginia this Friday, um, and then New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, that area, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and then the following week, um, I'll be in Florida, so anywhere on the way down or up, um, if anyone is looking for calibration soon, uh, just send me an email. 
You're living the dream, my friend. Vishnu has a great comment. I wish the TCL QM8 focused less on the extra brightness and focus on preserving the detail and color luminance. So Vishnu, I think there are two things that TCL can still do. One, they can have it track EOTF more accurately. And if not, at least give us enough settings so we can calibrate it to track EOTF better. Um, but then given that budget, what it did was maxed out on the dimming zones, but with no money left, there was nothing in the budget to focus on the software and the fine tuning of the TV to get it to where it could be. And maybe if it did, it would cost 1500 right? So this is always the issue is the TV has everything it needs to be to really look good, but it's lacking that last step. But that last step may cost a few hundred dollars. So we can't have everything, right? Image quality, cost, brightness, color accuracy. That's why the best Sony TV is an 85-inch, $5,000 X95L. And people are complaining, the Sony tax. Well, that Sony tax is all the things you said, Vishnu, where they work on everything, but they have no money left for a dimming zone. So you have the X90L with 80 dimming zones, right? So yeah, I mean, if we, if we had an unlimited budget for a TV, it, it'd be like the S95C or the A95L, $5,500 for a 77-inch. Well, that's a good comment because yeah. to clarify what I uh, asked earlier, had you ask uh, earlier, uh, I was specifying because you only do your reviews in HDR pretty much, like you don't do SDR anymore. And I don't even think they're calibrating for SDR. Right. So right. for the people that are watching now in future streams, you know, if you're going to use a TV as your reference, um, I said to ask uh, basically. Ask Sammy if it, he feels that it's close enough that because you don't have a reference monitor, that if you see something between the S95C and something else, that the something else is more likely to be wrong if, if the S95C is that close enough. Only about in yeah. HDR because you don't have a 3D light in the G3. Right. Only HDR. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so same question, Sammy. But if it was only HDR comparisons, is the S95C good enough? I'm sorry, wait, what? So we're talking whether once calibrated, huh? HDR comparisons with other TVs, if it differs from the S95C, is it enough that the S95C is accurate enough to be a reference to say that that TV is off for HDR content? Um, I would say, I would say yes for... That's, hard, I don't know, that's kind of hard to say because if it were anything outside of P3, then I would say 100% yes. Okay. Or anything where you're looking for specifically color luminance, then 100% yes. If you're looking for something like just straight up color accuracy and it is P3 inside of 2020, a G3 is better. It's, it's, I mean, it's technically, it's capable of being right. better. So, Assuming they're both calibrated. Right. All things being equal, um, that having a LUT for at least for like the 1D portion, don't do a matrix for the 3D. Um, I would say I would give the edge to an LG still. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to if this is all you have and you don't have an LG, then yeah, it's close enough. Because the, the errors that you get with this are still so significantly low that it's not going to like make or break. Right. If you're talking about between these two, technically this is capable of being more accurate, but that doesn't mean that this is bad because this is still super accurate. Right. And the way I do reviews personally is I'm very focused on luminous, color luminous and HDR, the brightness, rather than because you can't catch it on YouTube. Oh, this red is correct, right? So for me, it's kind of like, okay, this HDR, you know, 4,000 at content, whatever, I see that the S95C has more yellow. It wouldn't be that the S95C is oversaturated. It would be that the other TV is undersaturated at that luminance, right? That's how I would use the S95C as a reference. Would that be um, better? Yeah, I would say that would probably be better. Like if you're using it to, to determine what something is incapable of doing, mm -hmm. then yeah. Okay. Because in generally, again, all things being equal, they're gonna look the same and they should yeah. look the same. Especially in P3, 
once you go to the higher well, 2000 nit content. And well, there's only 20, I mean, there's only 2020 and you have things that are going to be mastered like within P3, mm -hmm. right? But um, are this going to be displayed within like a P3 car space? If you, those two should look the same. Right. Unless there's something that this cannot do luminance wise, all things being equal, these will look the same. Because th this brings, the compares will always have, let's say Mad Max, right? This is, there's a scene, it's super bright on the S95C. Oh, I see yellow, but on the G3, both calibrated, it's mostly white. And then can we say, oh, in this case, at this bright scene, it appears that the G3 doesn't have that yellow or orange. No, because okay. you don't know what it was supposed to look like versus the master. Because we don't have the reference monitor. No. Like, so you, you have like a different that, problem. That's the, yeah, that's the thing. Like, you can say because you're seeing something more now, mm -hmm. that's right, but that's not true because chances are on the mastering monitor that could have been clipped out. Mm. So I would say... Not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. Just because you see more doesn't mean it's correct. Right. Uh, and, or just because you see less doesn't mean it's incorrect either. Correct. Right. And so there you have it. We're still back to square one. Ah, oh, don't you love TV reviews? Yeah. Um, well, for the final part that you just were talking about, um, that's where Dolby Vision comes in, or HDR Time Plus. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when they do their grade in HDR and then they uh, make a Dolby Vision version, you know, they're pulling that down. They're going to be able to see that how they want to see it. So that's where they said, you know, when Dolby Vision is the creator's intent, how it's displayed on those highlights, that's how it should look in HDR 10. So, like, if you were going to look at the flames or whatever that's turning white on the LG and HDR 10, if you flip it over to Dolby Vision and they're still white, then it's right. But if it's there's more color, then it's being pulled down to show more detail. Right. I, I think, well, and so what if you have a Sony TV that has Dolby Vision? So it goes to the other problem. The TV, you have to know it does Dolby Vision right. Like the A95K, we're solid there. It does... The S9 does the A95L. Does it preserve that Dolby Vision accuracy, or is it more like the A80J, which did not? Right. So you almost have to choose a Dolby Vision specific TV, like uh, the A95K. That's the only one <laughs> I know that has good Dolby Vision accuracy out of the box. But like the Hisense U8H and the U7K, completely different looking Dolby Vision. Well, not completely, slightly different, right? It's different enough where I'm like, huh. So that goes to, yeah. you also have to choose the right TV. So what TV do you recommend for Dolby Vision? Other than the A95K. We know that one's solid for Dolby Vision. Is there any other TV? Yeah, the, the A95L should be the same as well. Um, and then, you know, the any of the LGs with a calibration, but that's the key part there. <laughs> uh, right. So that's why I was specifically talking about you um, and people watching your streams, your videos, and whatnot, you know, can they expect that the way you do your reviews, because you want to use the S95C as your reference, um, so I was just trying to get a feel for what Sammy thought as to how close yeah. he thought that that would be as on an average, Now, obviously it's not going to be perfect or ideal, but on average, if the S95C is, you know, showing whatever um, brightness and whatever color that you're showing in your reviews, and say you're reviewing, say you get a new Vizio to review, <laughs> right? You know, then you could assume that the Vizio is wrong if it's not doing what the S95C is doing. And that's another thing is once it's calibrated, if it tracks the OTF to the 99th percentile, that pretty much should be a guarantee that at any luminous level, it should be correct, right? I mean, the only short way you, of any oh. processing interference right. other than tone mapping where you know dynamic tone mapping on it does its own thing but yeah on the s95c in static or the lg g3 in cinema plus no tone mapping then they should track it but then the g3 has mla let's say the c3 does it we know there is no way the c3 could do it right but then the question is this is the first year of the mla can it do it accurately in its first year relatively speaking, right? And because I remember last year, the Sony A95K, great. And then SDR, low red saturation, suddenly it's all black. Like, wait, what happened, right? So mm -hmm. there's always going to be an edge case where the TV is like, oh, wow. 
you know, ton yeah. of, ton and then, of like, even when it me. comes to, even when it comes to the color, like with the G3 again, you know, that's being based off of the center of the screen. So like, if you're looking at an object that's not in the center, mm-hmm. you don't know how far off it's going to be. Um, and then depending on the scene you're looking at, if you're looking at some very dark colors, um, those are going to be worse than the S95C. And if you look at very bright colors, then they're not going to be, you know, they're going to be diluted from the white pixel. So, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Joseph, good question. Which TV makes the biggest jump in performance after calibration? We'll find out. Well, we'll ask Sammy uh, before and after which one benefited the most. And hopefully it's not something like the one that was the furthest away. So probably the TCL. Well, I'm saying from Sammy's point of view, like, before and after calibration, which one benefited most from Sammy's magic touch? All right. And let's get some questions in here. Um, and did they, uh, or did he perceptually match the anything to the S95C yet, or is that when he's done? done? Uh, I don't know. Hey, uh, Sammy, did you perceptually match the S95C yet, or are you planning to do that? He'll finish calibrating everything and then he'll go back. Okay, Adam okay, Power. That's what I figured. Yeah. Adam Power, great question. Should calibrators do something different now with QD OLEDs? Yes, they have new meters, <laughs> more expensive meters. Classy. Right? Yeah, it's like $8,000 minimum for the meter. Yes. So, class is to buy a new meter to properly measure QD OLED uh, because I'm getting the SN85C from a retailer here in Norway that also offer common calibration. Will that be sufficient? What are your thoughts? What does the calibrator need to have in addition to Calman to accurately do QD OLED? They need a spectro that's at least five nanometers or better. There you go. Just ask them, Adam, do you have a spectro that's at least five nanometer or better? If the answer is no, move on. Okay. Hey, Badzilla, good question. How goes the calibrations? Excellent. So we're done with the S95C. We are done with the G3. We are done with the QM8. We're working on the Hisense U7K right now. And the Q7 is the last one. So you know, we should be done maybe another hour or two. And then we'll wrap it up, do some quick comparisons, and have some final thoughts about what we see. And ultimately, again, these are such divergent prices but the goal is first, if you calibrated a cheaper TV, like the U7K, the Q7, no one will, will do that, but I did. How much better does it get? How much better than out of the box was it? Did it improve at all? Should you do it, right? And then even after calibration, how far is it from a reference TV? It's like a G3 or the S95C. So these are things worth asking because your money is a lot of money. $850 for the U7K or... 3500 for the G3 65 inch, right? Especially when we watch sports and SDR streaming, may not even be a big deal. U7H or U7K? Definitely the U7K. Uh, many reasons more dimming zones, better processor, and mini LED makes it brighter using less energy. It's just a next generation level. The U7K jump from the U7H is huge. And you're not, well, the processing, I think, is significant. You're not going to get the half resolution that you got before. But we'll see once gaming hits. Here we go. Hey, Don, thank you for the question. What TV do you recommend for sports? If price is no object, if you're in a bright room, then you want something bright like the U8H or the QM8 or the U8K. But, Q, but the U7K gets bright enough. So the thing is, how much is it you want to spend? The G3 can get very bright, but do you need it even brighter than the G3? Because in a bright room, the G3's MLA, some people complain that, oh, you know, maybe it lifts this or that. Whereas a Neo QLED, like the Q95C in dynamic mode, will get a little bit brighter. And, and they both have a considerable amount of motion blur. So for sports, you have to play with the motion settings, right? If they don't allow you to play with it, you won't know what the best setting is. So all the TVs depends on what your motion setting is for sports. Let's say you know, faster than sports, hockey, 
you want to see the ball move in a fast pitch or whatever. So the G3 has excellent motion settings, but you have to have it in the right setting. So it looks like your question is asking the best TV for sports where motion is concerned. And I'm fine with the G3. I'm actually fine with the Samsung S95C as well. The question is, though, if it's motion, you've got to have the right settings. And you have to play with that because your preference is different from mine and different from classy. Like for sports, I love soap opera. I want it clear. I want to see everything. I want to see the score. I want to see the movements, right? Because it's okay if it looks hyper-realistic because it's sports, right? I want to see the motion resolution. So then you would max out the judder and then you wouldn't have any stutter. But does is that what you want to see on the G3? And if it is, you got to make sure you have that setting changed. So Don, were you able to play with the settings? If not, that's probably why. You, you don't want to watch sports in filmmaker mode. Yeah, so I, I don't watch sports, but I'm pretty sure, I know most people do worry a lot about how clean the screen is, DSC, banding, mm -hmm. tinting, all kinds of stuff like that. So, you know, for sports, I would say, you know, QD OLED is going to be the cleanest panel. Um, but for LCDs, I think uh, BOE, you know, who makes the ADS panels, those, as far as I've seen so far, are consistently less DSC and cleaner than uh, especially the CSO TVA panels. Agreed. So the QN90C has a BOE ADS panel, and then the Hisense, I think, in 75 inches uh, and larger is using ADS, right? So that should be BOE. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want an LCD and you're not, you don't have to worry about you know static images and burn in whatever long term and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would be looking at an ADS panel. A lot of options, guys. A lot of price points, too. I just love the options we have today, for sure. And someone wants to know, is the classy European calibration tour coming? Yeah, I'm thinking most sports, the... What was that? Uh, no plans for that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> no plans for a European tour? All right. Um. But yeah, I was going to say for sports, I don't think, you know, local dimming performance and there's yeah. going to be too many, you know, right. black areas to be worried about. So, you know, just, right. I would say go for an ADS panel for most people just to be safe. But unless they want OLED, then go for a QD OLED for the cleanly nose. Yep. Or 85 inch for the size, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of great, bright, large yeah, but, TVs. Yep. The... QN90C is still ADS at 85 inches. Um, for a moment there, I was actually considering that for the living room. And Plasma has a question. If all panels are different and it's useless to copy calibration settings, how can Alienware and Asus improve HDR accuracy with a general firmware update in their monitors? So if they know their monitors or TVs, TVs get it as well, if they know their EOTF curve is off, and Samsung did this with the S95B, right? They, they were able to set a firmware that made it more closer, closer to D65 because they know exactly what they did to have it brighter, right? Or they've pumped up the EOTF curve so it doesn't it overtracks it. They can lower that in a firmware update. So if Alienware and Asus know exactly what they did wrong, then they can make that correction in a firmware update. Now, it won't correct for color accuracy and stuff, but at least it can correct for certain things. What are your thoughts on firmware updates that correct for accuracy, Classy? Well, I don't think any TV or monitor or whatever should have an update that affects visual performance after maybe the first firmware update at worst, mm -hmm. um, because for people who do get calibration, it screws them over. Yes, uh, But as far as every model can have traits, that are consistent from panel to panel, but that there are also other, you know, like advanced settings, you know, grayscale 20 point or 22 point uh, CMS, stuff like that, that most likely will not carry over from one panel to another. Um, even white point is slightly different from panel to panel. Um, but, you know, if there's a clipping point, so like on the Samsungs and SDR, you set your contrast to 38 on the S95C, and that's been consistent on every one of them. Yeah, definitely a personality trait year to year, right? Yeah, it's like the G3. You know, it's not just the G3, but even the G2 and older LGs. 
they have that drop of blue in the grayscale between like 20 and 35 IRE. It's on all of them. Um, the G3, it was just more noticeable, but it's a trait. And so, you know, that's something that can be calibrated out. And if LG really wanted, they could, pro re you know, fix that um, in an update. Um, actually kind of surprised they haven't because mm -hmm. it is very consistent on them. Um, you know, this year with the G3 and the service menu, the lower end point, so they call it the cuts, um, they've actually messed with them where they're not, because normally they're always 64, 64, 64 for red, green, and blue. Oh. Um, and this year they're not. Are you done? So they're messing with those for some reason. Oh, wait, wait um, a second. What you got, Sammy? Yeah. So we're, look we're like looking at this just because we're having some like strangeness. So we're looking at the Hisense the U7K. Yeah, okay. But what we're noticing is like panel uniformity. Do you see that in the lower right corner where it's kind of just white? Uh huh. Do you, like, like a yellow banding? Yeah. It's Horizontal like, yellowness? Right, right, right. right. Like I see that. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. And then you have like a lot of, um, like in the lower right hand corner. Mm -hmm. Like, see this? Yes. It almost looks like a. Dirty. It doesn't even look dirty. It almost looks like it's a burn. Like, yellow. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got vignetting in the corners. Yes. Green. So, discoloration, but it's like a, a very even discoloration of uh, layering right because it goes across the screen yeah it goes in cr across the entire screen all the way up yeah let me see if i so can it looks like it's the backlight yeah yeah that looks like it should probably get swapped out from high sense especially if they're going to give it away yeah that's pretty significant Uh, I can see that through the camera as well. And this goes to the question. Mm -hmm. When you're seeing content, you're not going to notice this. I, but in white, hockey, what hockey, you're doing right now. Hockey would definitely see it. Uh -huh. um, I wouldn't say you wouldn't necessarily see it in content. Because anything, think of um, Inception. Right, mm -hmm. when they go into the dream and are in the snow. Right. The snow. So, yeah, there's a good chance you're going to see it. Oh, but then yeah. you could say, did he pee in the snow? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the sky. Yeah. And the sky. <laughs> and the watering hole. And the, and the, and the white horse. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's going to just very heavy, you know, very dependent on what you're watching. But you will see this in content. Like, okay. That's something that's, that's no So. All right. And, and. Once we get to the Q7, let's mm -hmm. see how its uniformity is. But as we go lower down the price, the panel lottery is more of a thing. So how much is this one? Eight fifty. Oh, really? Street. It'll be street eight fifty. I mean, right now it's like a thousand or something. But right. that's MSRP. We expect it to be around eight fifty. Okay. And the QM8. Did you see any uniformity issues? Uh, that one was pretty clean. Pretty good. In that, comparison, yeah, it was right. pretty clean. Because this was like a little over twelve hundred, so we're talking a four hundred dollar difference. Where I can see. For that much more, they're spending a bit more to make sure you have a clean panel. Yeah, uniformity-wise, like that's that's pretty significant. Oh, camera loss. Camera loss. I, I oh, slow up. Yes, thank you. Got to turn it off. Yeah, thank you. Hey guys, so gonna put my camera on cool down. Letting it cool, so as you can see. We are discovering issues with the U7K. Yeah, that might be something you might want to ask Hisense if they want to swap it out before they give it away. Nah, they might just want to give it away for that reason. We just have to have a caveat. You guys want it? Great garage TV with yellow banding that's been calibrated. Oh, and so Sam, you cannot calibrate out the yellow banding, right? No, you cannot. <laughs> I got to check. You never know. You guys are you guys are the magic man. And yes, Jesse, the camera overheated again. This is not a good look for Sony. Maybe Sony needs to send me an, another FX camera because the A7 IV is just not doing it for me. But of course, it's not designed for live streaming. And I'm using HDMI live streaming. I'm not using the USB-C, which overheats even faster, right? So yeah, if this happened to me when I was uh, on site trying to record to a monitor and that was also an issue because hdmi out and it's not do you have that... it in 4k was that do you have the camera set to 4k to 4 4k yep 
4K3. Yeah, probably try dropping it to 1080 because the stream's only 1080 anyway. No, the stream is 4K. YouTube doesn't do 4K streaming. What? Lies. It might be 1440, um, but yeah, they don't I... have 4K streaming. Yeah. It might go to 4K oh, afterwards 14, after it processes 14, for a while. It's 1440. See, I, I need to preserve every pixel I can. Yeah, it's it's currently in 1440. Yeah, StreamYard, even though it's 1080p, I think it's fake 1080p because it does it does not look good going through the StreamYard server. But going direct to YouTube off of Ecamm, it's much cleaner. I'm looking, when I get the video back from YouTube, it looks much better. Okay, so let me see if I can turn it back on again. Maybe the DSE caused the camera to shut down. And we're back up. Okay. I gotta go for a bit. I might be able to come back. Yeah, yeah. Have fun. Do your thing, man. It's getting late over there. We are now, let's see, five hours and 20 minutes in. Thank you, those of you who've been around since the beginning, 1130. We are almost done. Ah, Lisa, you were here since the beginning. Thank you for hanging out. And a shout out to those who just joined us. We are going to have fun uh, comparing these. And we'll see what is the big difference between an $850 TV, the Q7, the U7K, versus step up, Q8, versus a couple steps up, the G3 and the S95C. Okay. Yes, that's right. I'm sitting on 4K, and they're going to over oversample it so it looks better. Yeah, I think the 1080p I sent out on StreamYard just doesn't look good. Even though it's 1080p, it should look better, but it doesn't. Okay. Furniture guy. My 77-inch S95C arrives Saturday with the Q990C soundbar. Oh, you're going to love the soundbar. Appreciate all your videos, which helped me make the decision for such a big decision. This is a big purchase, and you are going to love it. <laughs> Just, you won't be able to stop watching it. It's phenomenal. It looks so good out of the box, so that's a great thing. It's not one of those things, oh, it looks great, if only it was calibrated. It looks great, period. And the sound is even better. The Q990C is very similar to last year's Q990B soundbar. My soundbar of choice, especially for the price, but it's just... That's the subwoofer, the surround speakers, everything. It works so well. Are you on the band? Oh, hey. Oh, shit. Sammy, off the top of your head, do you remember what the minimum and maximum after calibration the S95C was? Um, in ITP, it was pretty high. I can't remember offhand. Um, within... DE2000, I want to say it was an uh, average of 0.6 with a max of 1.1. Oh, that's great. Um, and I want to say that was mainly for color. Mm -hmm. And for uh, grayscale, I want to say it was like a max of like 0.9, I think. Wow. And uh, an average of around, I think also 0.5-ish. But that was in DE2000. If you look at ITP, uh, then it was much higher. Okay. And this is consistent with what you've seen so far from the other TVs you've calibrated? Yeah. And that's actually pretty consistent with how the S95B was as well. Okay. Yeah. So it's a QD OLED thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hopefully that answers your question, new guy. So now the question becomes, what's correct? And... Hello, Michael Simmons. Thank you for joining us. Ah, the Nakamichi Dragon Soundbar. It's a $3,500 beast. Two subwoofers. I don't know if you can add more to it, but I'm impressed. It comes with two subwoofers and a whole bunch of surround. But at $3,500, the question then is, the Nakamichi Soundbar or the Apple Vision Pro? See, suddenly you have context, right? But the Nakamichi soundbar should be a beast for 3500 But many will argue they could do better with separates. Just go to Costco, and for $3,500, is not there a separates package that you could put together 
with AVR, subwoofer, you know, clips, whatever. And so, you know, let me know. Would you guys rather go separate, a lot of elbow grease, set it up, or Nakamichi Soundbar for 3500 the Dragon, and you just plug and play? There's something to be said about simplicity. I, I am attracted by the flagship approach of Nakamichi, but $3,500 is a lot of money. Does U7K support quick media switching like some of the newer TVs from LG? No, it does not. I think you have to be on the new MediaTek, but I don't believe it does. Actually, you know what? Let me check. I don't think it does, though. Let me check my spec sheet real quick here. Yeah, I, I want to say no, so let's just tentatively say no, it doesn't for now, and I will, because few TVs support it, except for the ones that announced it, so they didn't announce it, they don't support it. Okay, let's see what we got here. Adam Power, good question. I've seen a lot of talk about a break-in period over 100 hours and before calibration. Is that really a thing? Yes, it is. And how necessary is it? Sammy, how necessary is a break-in period for a TV? So we will ask Sammy real quick here. How necessary or how important is a break-in period? Some people say 100 hours, 200 hours. What are your thoughts on a break-in period before calibration? pretty important, not necessarily for uh, LCD panels. I would say for QD OLED, over 200 hours. Okay. Um, WRGB OLED, probably around 100, 120. Okay. Um, I would say like LCDs, use it long enough to make sure it's not a lemon. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> All right. Um, projectors, uh, if it's a bulb based projector, then you want to go for about the bare minimum is what seventy five hours, I would think, fifty. Yeah, yeah, they'll change. Yeah, yeah. they're they're, they're going to change over time, but you could say maybe a hundred hours uh, on that. But I I generally would do seventy five on a bulb. Okay. On a laser, technically you could do it out the box. Yeah. So the ultra short throws, pseudo laser. Yeah. I think we'd agree, like a hundred hours in HDR. So mm -hmm. if you had an Apple yes. TV and just set it always be in Dolby Vision, and just yeah. use it for a hundred hours, you probably you know. Pretty good to go for calibration. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, so it's necessary for a QD OLED. I haven't even. Well, actually, you know, let me let me rephrase that. Do you think you need more for? Because when I had my S ninety five B, I found that I needed roughly around two hundred hours before it to stabilize. With WRGB OLED, I found that I needed roughly around one hundred, one hundred twenty hours. Do you think now with QD OLED, WRGB and WRGB with MLA? Do you still feel that that should be 100 hours? That's hard to say. So generally what happens over time is you also get a lot of pixel refreshes, like the automatic ones that kind of stabilize voltage. Mm -hmm. The gamma shifts slightly just due to the brand new panel kind of settling in. Mm -hmm. I haven't measured that on QD OLED yet. I know Classy has. And I'll, I'll measure just to check, but I think he even said like 300 hours he saw a change. So it, it it just depends. Yeah, makes sense. So. Yeah, well, that's thus it takes a few days before you can actually view, or a few weeks you gotta run it right. hour after hour after hour. And this applies to older TVs, guys. Uh, all right, I'll be right back. Entertain yourselves. Entertain yourselves. I'll be right back.
And we are back. Okay. Let's see what questions you got you guys have here. I just read that the UAK has a web browser. Surely U7K yeah, has one as well. <laughs> I don't know, but we will see. This is an excellent price. Uh, the special on Amazon for the Samsung Q990C, that is their flagship soundbar, $1,050. Guys, that's a great price. I rarely see it for under 1200 So if you're looking for a flagship soundbar, this one is highly recommended. And most likely the reason they're able to sell for that low maybe is it's very similar to the Q990B. So maybe there's not that many changes, but definitely highly recommended, especially at that price. All right, Mozart's Ghost, this is your question. FOMO, you've seen a lot of TVs. What would you say is the most impressive LCD you've seen so far. Can you ask Sammy too? Okay. For me, the most impressive, it depends on the year because every year it gets better and better. Q90R at its time was very impressive. Then it was the Q90A and the U8H last year impressed me greatly. And right now, without the U8K, the QM8 impressed me greatly with its black levels blooming control now obviously it's light tracking otf is not impressive but the number of dimming zones is what impressed me greatly samsung consistently though does excellent with lcd tvs because they just throw dimming zones at it right every year except the q90t which i don't know what happened there but every year they have the most dimming zones ever the q90t had like 100 they were experimenting with low dimming zones. They were pulling a Sony on us. But then they recovered with the Q98, which had a lot of dimming zones, right? So 700 dimming zones, 600 like that for the Q98 and 90B. So that really helped it a lot. And then this year with Q95C. So currently, 95C would probably arguably, arguably be the best because it likely tracks EOTF better than the QM8. But then for the money, the QM8 right now is the best at the 65-inch size. At the 85-inch size, we have two TB models not available in any other size, which is the Hisense UX with over 5,000 dimming zones and the Sony X95L, which is their flagship that only comes in 85-inch. Those two will be vying for best LCD TV. So now, hey, hey Sammy, what is the best LCD TV you've ever seen? Z9D. The which one? Z9D. Z9D? I don't know. Right? That was way back when? Like Backlight cool. Master Drive? Yeah. I would say that's probably... <laughs> that's the, that's the, the most popular answer, yeah. So the Z9D was the last time Sony had its own technology. Though I will admit, I did really like the um, AX800 and 900U. So the Z9D, what else did you say you really liked? The AX800 and 900U, and which was... What, were, what brand were they? That was from Panasonic. They were, um, they had like display port and everything on it. They were really good. They were 4K, kind of like that faux HDR, but... Um, this is right before HDR came out, or right when right it came when out. It, yeah, right okay. when it came out. But the thing is, is that I was, I'm always been a, uh, an emissive display guy. So I've always had like plasmas mm -hmm. and then one from plasmas natural progression was OLED. They were LCDs that actually looked like plasma in almost every regard from just the picture oh, itself really? to the motion. Oh, it's too bad Panasonic left. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. So, Mozart, those are your answers for most impressive LCD TVs in the last several years.
So, Lisa, a good question. A95 k great out of the box. How much more would it benefit from being calibrated? I don't know if you'd notice. That's the thing. Oftentimes, for me, the calibration I do is because I review TV, so I need one really good, well-calibrated TV, or apples to apples when they're both calibrated. What, a, what do they look like now, right? But I have found the A95 k I had that. It wasn't calibrated. It looked awesome. It was calibrated. It still looked awesome. You don't really notice the improvements. The improvements you really notice are on TVs like Vizio, right? Just completely off. So unless you think it needs calibration, I don't know if you really need it. Yes, I still have the Q90R too. Great TV. I mean, we've come so far. The TV still looks good. You obviously see weaknesses, but I, it's still a TV worth keeping. I like it a lot. And it's, I believe, the first 4K 120 capable TV. So gamers loved it for that reason. With the old HDMI port, it maxed out 18 gigabits per second. So Kinocho has some perspective. For the price you can get a Kiyomate, you can buy an entire home theater surround sound setup versus buying the X95C. Something to consider. See, it's all about value, right? Uh, some people, they don't care about audio. They just want to see it, and they're OK with the TV audio. But yeah, definitely. The more you get into the home theater and TV and audio space, the more you realize, wait, Ah, if only I had unlimited money, but given a budget, where do I prioritize, right? <laughs> so this is what I'm wondering too, Brandon. I'm wondering if the UAK will perform as well as the QM8 but track EOTF better. I'm wondering the same. So we're going to use the U7K to see you know, as a proxy, will the U7K track EOTF better? And if it does, maybe the U8K will do it. And how about the Q7? Will the Q7 track EOTF better than the QM8? We'll just have to see. We will find out by the end. Hey, hi, Dev. Is Sammy calibrating SDR2 or just HDR? I only review and watch stuff in HDR, so I'm having him do all HDR with the exception of the U7K because we're going to have that as a giveaway at M-Wave. But yeah, I, I never, rarely look at SDR beyond sports, which it doesn't matter at that point. So yes, and Dolby Vision on the LG. Okay, new guy, which got better sound quality, Q Symphony or LG Sound Sync? I like Q Symphony not because of the Q Symphony technology, but their subwoofer and their surround, it's everything is just, it's there. It's, I had the A7000 with the SW5 and the full surround on the A7000. It cost about $1,000 more for the entire package as the QN990B but it didn't sound better. The Q990B had tighter bass, it went lower, and the surround effects was just as good. The Sony had larger surrounds, but even pushing it up, it, it, the clarity wasn't there. I wasn't as impressed by the spatial audio and the A7000 as I was with the Q990B. The LG I've never tested, but people who compared the two, they are not impressed by the LG. Uh, systems. So I really think it's down to Sony or Nakamichi <laughs> at this point. But now if you have an LG TV and you, know, you just want full compatibility, no handshake issues, then get the LG soundbar to make sure it matches your TV. But if you have Sony I mean, or a Samsung, sorry, then get a Samsung soundbar, you know it'll work. My Samsung TVs had dropouts with my Sony soundbar. So that was an issue that I have sometimes mixing and matching different brand TVs and soundbars. 
So it depends on the TV you're getting. I normally match the brand of sample with the TV just to avoid handshake issues. It's just not worth that extra little bit of sound quality to have sound drop off. And it's always in the same spot too. So these dropouts, there's something in the format because when I was watching The Witcher, exactly that same spot, boom, volume disappears and it comes back again. But it doesn't happen on the other TVs with that same sound bar. Hey, Carlos, what are we saying? Which is the best overall? S95C for HDR watching, of course. Use case, Carlos. Tell us what is your use case and I'll tell you what is the best overall. Obviously, the Q7, the U7K may be the best overall for 800 bucks, but you're gonna have issues. As we saw, the U7K had some uniformity issues, right? There were little yellowish stains around the edges, uh, little lines are slightly yellow. We'll see if the TCL Q7 has that issue. The Q8 doesn't track EOTF well. It has overtrack. It's a little bit brighter than it should be. s 5 c and G3 are solid overall, but no TV is perfect. In G3, you'll have scenes where there's banding, color banding. And on the s 5 c well, it's QDOLA. It should be the best, right? But it's not going to be perfect either. Uh, complaints, not on this stream, because we're not going to check a little bit rate upscaling, but some have complained that S95C and S95B, low bit rate processing is similarly subpar. So, but just image quality, S95C is, is the call right now. Kinotro, is the U7K still looking yellow? Yeah, nothing's changed. <laughs> It's, it's a DSC thing. It's a panel lottery. I think if you put any, any TV on white and there are these burn stains or just DSC, you'll see it in the white. So you have to have the right pattern, you'll see it. Or you have to have a certain color and you will see it. Yes, I am a fan of the Vizio Elevate as well. It's a great soundbar for the money for like 500 bucks the m i think the m series series visio soundbars are a great deal it's less than 500 you get surround you get a subwoofer i believe that if you can get a sub and a surround and a soundbar for under 500 dollars, go for it that's way better than any audio coming out of your tv hey christian good to see you dropping by which would you choose between the Q80C, that's the Samsung, that's their best QLED before you enter Mini LED, the X90L or the QM898 inch? All right, so 98 inch, I'm actually considering this. So the Q80C is $8,000, the X90L is 10,000, and the QM898 inch is also 10,000. So the ADC, we already know, is going to look washed out. It doesn't have enough dimensions, but it's big. And it will have the gaming features, right? It's Samsung. So it's four ports, HDMI 2.1. They've already said 4K 120, VRR, Free Supreme and Pro. We know that works. But you're not going to have great contrast. And the specular highlights, the HDR won't be there. But it'll be bright enough. Great for sports. But if you're watching in a slightly dark room and you want that HDR pop, that separation, dynamic range, it starts with, I would have to say, the QM 898 inch. The Sony X90L, I don't know if it has enough dimming zones. It has more than the Q80C, but I get the X90L if you watch a lot of SDR and you want color accuracy. Sony does a great job processing cable and processing satellite feeds, right? So SDR, sports, low quality feed, you want that upscaling processing power, then the X90L is great, but you have high quality source HDR, even with slightly elevated EOTF curve, the QM8 gives me that impact. The elevated EOTF out of the box does not take away from the impact. It's just a little bit brighter than it should be. Whereas the X90L, the dynam dynamic range simply isn't there to give you the impact. And the blooming will be annoying as heck if you watch anything with black bars. So 98 inch on the QM8 with a large number of dimming zones, less significant blooming for sure and you watch a lot of black bar stuff, it'll be better. But if you watch a lot of low bitrate content, that kind of sucks, then you have to choose between better processing on the X90L 
or better HD on the QM8. So, and of course, gaming. You want all the gaming to work, then maybe the Q80C, maybe the one. But they're all between eight and $10,000. But I would choose the QM8 98 inch. Add the 98 inch QM and 90A in there too. So I've seen that one. I was in Brandon's video, right? He installed the 98 inch at a nearby house and it was good. It looked really good. I was actually very impressed. The Q90A, I would choose that over the Q80C for sure because content watching is king and it has gaming features as well. And I choose that over the X90L as well. So the Q90A, QM8 first, QM90A second. And if only the QM100B was not $30,000, it'd be in the running. 5,000 nits, come on. All right, Rudy, you have a question. What's the big difference between S95C and S90C being the 90 doesn't have the neural quantum processor? That's not the big difference. The, the two biggest differences, one connect box on the S95C, that's what is making it cost more. And then the 55 and 65 inch are the generation two QD OLED panels. Whereas in the S90C, it may be generation two a little bit later in the year, but right now it's still generation one. On the 77 inch, it's even closer. Both S95C and S90C share generation two panels. What you're paying for is the One Connect box. The neural processor stuff, I, I think it's just marketing mumbo jumbo. You are not gonna notice differences in real content. I mean, maybe it is doing something, but the reality is that the S95C at the 77 inch, you're paying more for the One Connect box, but image quality, I've been comparing the two, 77 inch S90C and Q95C or S95C for the last two weeks, two and a half weeks. It's so hard to find any differences at all. I mean, I'm pixel peeping. And the biggest difference is SDR, bright sports watching in dynamic mode. The S95C is slightly brighter. That's about it. Even specular highlights on the S95C and the S90C are so similar. I mean, it's not night or day. It's not like the G3 versus the G2 or the C2. So, but if you're in the 55 and 65 inch, know that on the S90C, you're getting the older generation one panel, which is last year. And on the 77 inch S90C, you're getting the latest generation two panel, which is slightly brighter, but more importantly, two times the durability. So it's a slightly different chemistry. Hey, Ruiz, which TV has the specular highlight crown so far? I have to say the S95C. Uh, G3 as well. If it's a colored specular highlight, the S95C preserves that color. But if it's just pure brightness, the G3 hits those brightness very well. So it's just a matter of, do you want to include the colors? If there is color in it, then the S95C would do it better. Ooh, let's actually let's do this. Let's put it at 10,000 content. So you can see the spectral highlights. Yes. So OLED, G3 or S95C will hit the specular highlights very bright, brighter than any of these TVs. The smaller the specular highlights, the, like, the more likely that only an OLED can do it. This is a great point. Don't forget the $4,000 98-inch TV that's available outside the USA. Yes, I've heard it's very good. Unfortunately, we don't get that here. But if we can get a $4,000 98-inch TV here, that'd be phenomenal. I mean, is that the TCL? It's down to $4,000 now? Remember, it's sold at $8,000. That's insane. At $4,000, it's a little bit more palatable. I think they should be selling at $3,500 personally. But yeah, now 98 inches is just 98 inches. You, it's just very immersive. I'm a big fan of inexpensive, large TVs. Something's going to be said about that immersiveness from the size. Hey, Spillage Village, welcome aboard. Thank you for the super chat. Super late? No, you're not. We still have a few hours to go. But shout out to FOMO, Sammy, and Matt. How would you compare this upgrade cycle to previous cycles? Good question. A great cycle for mid-tier TVs. We're talking S90C. Wow. For the price of a C3, 77 inch, and to a certain degree, 55 and 65 inch, but for the price of a C3, 
you're getting nearly the performance of a G3 or an S95C. That is a huge step up for mid-tier OLED TVs. We never saw that before. So very happy for people who are in that price range of the C3, S90C. That S90C is going to just kill it in that price range. If you're in the market for OLEDs, in that price range. So that is great. And in the mid-tier, entry level below $900, I was very impressed by the U7K's processor. It beat the U8H. It's got the specular highlights down. Its specular highlights were better than the U8H. Of course, it's a budget TV. So DSE, being what it is, you will need to check your panel. But just overall image quality, the little things that you cannot get unless you pay a lot more is now available at under $900. And we expect the same from the Q7, so we'll see that. I think that is awesome. And then you have 98-inch availability of, wow, we never had this many $10,000 TVs in the 98-inch before. So you have the Q Q80C, that's 8,000, and you have the QM8, that's 10,000, and then Sony fans, X90L, also 10,000. So that's great if you're ready to get bigger than the 77. And 85 is too close. Well, you can go 98 now. Let's see. So you're tempted to upgrade from an 85-inch Q90A. Not much to go, my friend. You will get better specular highlights. Oh, yes, the Hisense UX. We're going to have a shootout at Value Electronics, end of September, 85-inch flagship. The Hisense UX, around five grand. Probably street pricing closer to four, but let's say $5,000 MSRP for the Hisense UX 85-inch. Similar in pricing to the Sony X95L 85-inch. Those are two that I really want to see duke it out. And the QM8 also 85-inch, which is only $2,300. Like, how much more are you getting by doubling that price to over $4,000? So you will get this. Specular highlights, we know. Q98. Excellent black levels. Nailed the black bars. But in order to get there, what do they do? They kind of dim a bit, right? Crush that specular highlight. So it's in the QM8, it's a little bit brighter. Is it even brighter on the X95L? Is it even brighter on the Hisense U10? And if you watch HDR content where specular highlights, you notice that? Then it may be worth upgrading if it bothers you knowing that you've lost some of that sparkle. So I don't know if you would upgrade, though, uh, because it's quite a bundle to upgrade because it's so similar to the Q90A. I'd wait maybe another year before I'd upgrade or go larger, right? Wait for the 110-inch Hisense UX to come to the USA. Then you get size and specular highlights in a few years or next year. So I wouldn't upgrade to another 85-inch. I'd have to go to 98-inch, and it would have to be the QM8. Then you have a bit of something-something. So can you go 98 inch spillage village? Let us know. Hmm. Hey, here's a good point. The QM8 doesn't support ATSC3. That may be a deal breaker for people that like their local OTA channels. FCC reported today that they will start to sunset ATSC 1.0. So so many things about this. So ATSC 3.0 is technically available, but then the content they put out is old school, low resolution content. So to the degree you're getting higher quality signals, I don't know. It definitely is region specific, like here in Southern California, it's nothing. <laughs> More channels, but you're not getting better quality content. But hopefully where you're at and it's available, you're enjoying 4K or HDR, but I'm not getting it here locally so yeah, but for future proofing yeah maybe in the future two or three years or you can always get a tuner maybe a hundred dollar tuner or something in a few years or fifty dollar tuner and monkey asks for getting your tv calibrated by a professional does the price range go high or low depending on the panels for example if the panel is an oled it'll cost more so no it's going to be a flat rate regardless of the panel. It's more of, is it a projector? But, hey, Sammy, all TV calibration costs are about the same, right? It doesn't depend on the panel, right? Uh, no, that's not true. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it depends. So, it depends on what you're doing, um, what you want to have done. You can, it depends on who you have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, for instance, if you 
reach out to Avocal, they have like a set rate. I'm not sure if it's going to be dependent on what you want done, but they have a set rate. And if, the more you do, the lower the cost will ideally be. For myself, since I'm independent, um, I do have a general rate, but that rate slightly changes when I travel mm. because I have to right. account for you know travel costs. So, so you have like 20 people in the same city. It'll be a lot it would be better. ideally, yeah, it would ideally be cheaper. It's still not going to be as cheap as if I were doing it local, sure. but it would be cheaper. Um, and then the more that they do, say, for instance, like in your case, if you have a bunch of TVs, mm-hmm. then obviously I'll try to get the price down as low as possible. Um, but it just really depends. So like for me to do a projector locally in Colorado, it's nowhere near as much as if someone wants me to go do a one-off and a single state sure which i have done but, but travel lodging i mean the entire yeah it has to be worth it time yeah. wise yeah so it really just depends if you're looking for someone to do a calibration one if they're local um seeing how much it is that they cost or they you know whatnot and if they're traveling expect to pay a, a bit fair amount more yeah yeah so like if you wanted i don't know let's say Dwayne, or you wanted Chris Deering, or you wanted like myself to come to a different state, mm-hmm. it will probably cost you a d- decent amount of money. And oftentimes you have your schedule, like state schedule or something, where they say, "Oh, wait, I'm in Virginia, and you're coming to Virginia. Can you throw me on your schedule?" They right. catch you early enough, right? Yeah. So, like the last trip that I just had, I was in Oklahoma, and I had just got another lead for someone else to meet at something in Oklahoma, but that trip was already set. So I wasn't able to get him in, but now it looks like I'm going to be going back. And when I go back, I'll likely be going to Texas as well. So at that point, it's like, all right, this is the amount of time I'll be here. I already have two people pretty much locked in for that. Then I have to figure out. Can you fit? Like, Is there enough time? Right. So like, for instance, right now, when I arrived here the other day, I was in San Diego. And then after I finished one in San Diego, I came up here, taking care of this today. Then I'm going to be going towards Riverside area to do some projection stuff. And then the next day, I'll be going south to do um, some Sony stuff. So, and then after that, I'm leaving. Wow, you're a busy man. So, so it doesn't always cost the same. It, 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 so it's not necessarily the TV technology that makes the difference. It's the logistics and everything else. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go, monkey. Now you know. Make sure you don't live in Alaska. Okay. And hey, thank you for that super chat. Joshua, you've been here most of the day too. Man, you guys, thank you for keeping me company. I hope I'm keeping you company. Super chat from Joshua. Thank you, Sammy, for the QM8 settings. I will give them a try on my set. That's right. You have the 85-inch QM8. Brilliant TV. Super bright. And it appears that the DSC is clean on mine, which is great. I think DSC is more of a distraction (laughs) than anything. And you're welcome, monkey. Hey, Christian, maybe it's just paranoia. I wish Best Buy displayed TCL and Hisense TVs. It's a matter of Hisense and TCL not paying Best Buy to do so. Because if they did, their TV prices would go up. Best Buy charges for floor space, right? Because it's all marketing, marketing expense. And so Samsung obviously pays the most. They have the largest floor space with the most kiosks and everything. And if Hisense and TCL want to do that, they can. They would have to pay a lot of money. We're talking millions. And if they do that, how much more would your TV cost? So it's always this, right? If you get the word out, you've got to raise the price of your TV. So at Best Buy, who pays the most? Samsung, and then Sony and LG have similar size displays. And then Vizio is like a tiny kiosk. And then maybe an end cap display for a high sense. So it's like we want the TVs to be affordable. We also don't want them to pay marketing. But then we want them to be at the store. And then it goes up. So, yeah. It's, it's, there's a lot of business model subtleties. How do you drive sales without raising prices but getting the word out? It's hard. 
influencers. But if your TVs aren't so great, your influencers won't be so influential, right? All right, here's a good one. Should I get an NVIDIA Shield, Apple TV, or a Zidu for a better looking on OLED? So the NVIDIA Shield does great upscaling. So you have that benefit if you get the NVIDIA Shield. But Apple TV is an ecosystem. So you have so many different reasons. The NVIDIA Shield is for those who like to tweak their devices, dive into the settings, you know, play with this and that. Apple TV is the best plug and play. The ecosystem is great. It's got all these different things that's available on the Apple TV that's not available anywhere else. I am an Apple TV fan myself, but I also use Chromecast and uh, Roku stick easily. They all work for me. The Zidu, I don't know. Can I help you with the Zidu? But I say know what your use case is. The NVIDIA has a lot of settings. If you're not gonna use those settings, Apple TV, if you're in the Apple ecosystem, if you're not, you know, I try the uh, Roku. It's very simple to use. It's for me. It's more ease of use as far as quality on an OLED. As long as it has HDR, it's going to look fine. And if you have an LG and you want to take advantage of Dolby Vision, and then make sure your streamer has the Dolby Vision option, which they all do. I don't know about Zidu, so this is something to think about. And if you have any questions, anything, just ask away. I'll be here until the calibration is done, which is the U7K is now done. We've moved on to the Q7, the last step, the last TV. Oh, hopefully we'll be done in an hour or so, and then I can go and grab a bite. Okay, so let's see here. Yeah, ask me questions. We have calibrators here to answer your questions as well. And they've done a bunch of these TVs too. Here we go. This is the kind of question I like, Carlos. Best TV for 35 to 4500, seven inch or larger. I'd go with the S95C all day long. The G3 is right there, so it depends on your use case. If it's mostly for sports in a bright room, G3, because it does have the brightest sports. They both have amazing contrast because it's infinite contrast. It'll look great in a bright or dark room. Personally, for what I watch, I would choose the S95C. It gets bright enough for me, but I'm in a light controlled room. If you're in a brighter room and you watch a lot of sports, then the G3 I would recommend because it's almost designed for sports. It's a little bit brighter than the S95C, dynamic mode versus vivid. The vivid on the G3 is a touch brighter. It's whites get a bit brighter. But other than that, they are both very similar. Now the S95C is one connect box. If that's a convenience you love, there you go. If you hate Tizen, then you have the G3. I have found them both to be fine. So it really is a personal preference, quality of life. But what is your use case, right? How much sports, how much news, how much upscaling do you need? If you plug it directly to your cable box and the cable box has sketchy reception or sketchy, you need good upscaling, I go with the G3 because I like its processor a lot. So yeah, what is your use case, Carlos? And Classy wants to remind Sammy, who just ran off, don't forget to perceptual match. Yes, uh, he's still on the Q7, so I'll remind him. Michael Adams asks, do you think the QMate has less banding than the Sony X95K? I didn't find banding to be an issue, so I don't know. Is there a specific content you're finding banding on the X95K? When I had it last year, processing was not an issue with the Sony, but then maybe there was a specific content that I missed. Uh, the QM8 and the U7K, it addressed banding that the UH could not address, so I saw that. But let me know what content you catch the banding on, Michael, and then uh, we'll, we'll test it at some point. Maybe not today, but... We shall. And Determined Minds ask, will we get the settings? Yes, after each calibration, but we'll go through it one more time. I'll flash through 
settings for all five TVs before we start the comparisons. It should be fast. There's not a lot. I think the biggest subtle changes were on the S95C that you could do at home. And then the TCL had a few very minor ones. So yeah, we'll see. We'll go through it. And the G3 had almost none. There's not much to be done to G3. It looked really good out of the box as well. I mean, the calibration there was something done, but there's not many non-calibration settings that you would do on the G3. And I need SDR settings for the S95C shadow detail. Still seems lifted. You might want to ask if Classy is here. Classy, help determine mines. Is there an SDR shadow detail setting? It still seems lifted. Just know SDR should be lifted, by the way. <laughs> You're not supposed to get perfect blacks in SDR. Otherwise, people complain, it's crushed. So, I mean, S95C, you want it to be blacker. First of all, is it creator's intent? And then second, you might just go to black levels and lower it by two notches, right? Go minus two on black level and the S95C and the SDR and see what happens. All right. Hey, Classy is reminding not you but me to remind you to perceptual match at the end. <laughs> because we're almost done. It's like, oh, it's so happy to mail. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. It's probably going to take a little bit longer, Kalasi. Maybe in another 90 minutes, maybe, hopefully. Not too long. Okay, so Carlos, mostly sports and movies. Movies, HDR movies, we're talking high quality content. So you have a great internet connection. You're watching, I'm assuming, Netflix, HDR, Netflix, Dolby Vision, or you're watching Prime Video, HDR, and or Disney Plus. So high quality bit rate and sports okay either one but if you're watching like high quality source where hdr movies you really want that hdr luminance which i have to go with the s95c i mean slightly less bright in sports i'm okay with that i just need to know that i'm getting the full luminance for my tv so my personality brings me to the S95C. But if it's mostly sports and movies, and you, the movies, hey, you know what? It looks good enough for me. I think the G3 would be great for you. Just, for, just know that the 77 inch doesn't come with a stand. So if you are not planning to wall mount it, definitely you know, gotta get a stand. And the S95C has a one connect box. So if that is a convenience for you or not, that may or may not make a difference. So yeah, but soccer let's say sports where you're in a bright room g3 but if you're in a darker room i'm just an h charm even i'd go with the s95c personally well tvs are great by the way they look phenomenal and hey welcome travis Sylvania. wow i went so long you're able to make it sorry i'm joining late what's your take on the samsung q80c 98 inch qm8 versus the Q80C 98 inch versus QM8 98 inch. Okay, so first the Q, uh, Q80C is not gonna have enough dimming zones. It, it's not a mini LED TV. It, it is basically a very large Q80C. And whatever reviews of the Q80C is, just make it larger. Without enough dimming zones, it, it will just not have the HDR impact. It'll be bright, but like, SDR type brightness, you're not going to get the perfect blacks with the dynamic range and the specular highlights at all on the QDC, but it has gaming features. So, hey, great for gaming Wii or, or on Nintendo Switch, but if you want HDR specular highlights, you're going to have to start with the QM8. It has more dimming zones. It'll have deeper blacks, especially if you watch black bar content. You will be annoyed by the QADC's lifted blacks. It just doesn't have enough dimming zones to make HDR impactful. But if it's full screen sports watching, QADC ADC is fine. But HDR content, you're going to have to start at the QM8. Will there be a 98 inch high sense this year? No. I know there is one in China, but not here. So hopefully the 85 inch UX sells very well that they will bring their 98 inch or 110 inch UX over to the US next year. So we'll see. And, and you're welcome, Travis, for dropping by. And we are now hour six. If you're still here, don't forget to click like if you haven't already. 
ask away questions about 2023 TVs, you can't decide between what TVs, I am here at least for the next 90 minutes to two hours. We're on the last TV now. We're calibrating the TCL Q7. John went to sleep. 2.40. I'm still on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Austria he is. Okay. Try not to look directly into 2,000 nits. But, but the sun is like 100,000 nits, right? All right. Let's do this. Let's make it 10,000 nit content. Let's see what happens. All right, Peter. You have a question. There's so many variables with streaming sources. Can you recommend Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV for 4K? So first of all, depending on your reception, the quality will be changing. Like Netflix has so many trims, so many variations. It's, to me, it's less about the platform and more about your connection. If you have a high quality connection, they should all look very similar. I like Google TV because it's easy for me to make my settings because I'm very familiar with it. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily a higher quality TV. It's just I like the way they set up the menu system, but I also have the Roku. I don't use Fire Stick that often, but according to Classy, Fire Stick may give you a higher quality feed for Prime Video. So if you are a Prime Video fan, get the Fire Stick. Otherwise, they're all fine. My recommendation is get the one where you have an easy time going through all the menus because time wasted hunting your settings is just time wasted. Choose one what you're comfortable with. As far as I'm concerned, the image quality is more dependent on your internet connection. But yeah, but definitely avoid the internal apps. That's the one thing I try not to use. Now, I should do what I say and not what I tell. <laughs> Do what I say and not what I do, because at home, I'm actually still using the Q90R native just because like I, I just the family likes Samsung TV plus and I'm like, oh, I'll just use the Netflix. Right. So at home, I really like using Tizen to navigate the apps and the Roku. I have a Roku TV, so you know, use that, too. But on the ultra short through projector, I have Roku TV connected to it because it's very fast. I count the number of clicks it takes for me to get from start to content. And Roku, I can do it the fastest because I, just, I don't like just wandering around. So I like Roku as, as a streaming. But some people hate Roku, so you know, it's very subjective. But picture quality, I think they all look so similar. It's not, a, not an issue. Hey, thank you. FOMO, you deserve an award for answering this many questions for six hours. <laughs> I know, right? I should make a job out of this. And Dan is back. I'm back. I'm getting caught up, but curious. Your take on the G3 versus the QM8. Well, the G3 is definitely the better TV. There's just no doubt about it. It is OLED. It's self-emissive. The QM8 looks like here. It looks very similar, but there will be scenes where the it doesn't compare. The G3 just beats it. And that's normally specular highlights or anything with like deep blacks and a specular highlight right next to it. Self-emissive is just a superior technology overall. So now you haven't entered cost, but if you can afford a G3, get the G3. The question is, if you can afford a G3, why aren't you considering the S95C, right? The QM8 is fine, but it's not as accurate, right? So we calibrated it, but the QM8 doesn't track UOTF as well. It's a little bit too bright, but for many people, they like that. But that's an FYI. And see, so you're a movie buff, but a TV noob. Bright room, looking at a 65 inch. Is it worth the price difference to get the G3? No. I don't think so. In a bright room, what do you care if the EOTF is a little bit brighter? If anything, you're like, yeah, thank God it's brighter, right? You're a, but the thing is, if you're a movie buff, you have to watch in a dark room. You see the problem? So a movie buff has a light-controlled room, right? So if you're a movie buff, but you don't have control over your lighting, then you're not going to be able to enjoy the subtleties of OLED's infinite contrast. Uh, might as well get the QM8 or the U8K. Let's wait for the U8K and see how it tracks EOTF. But the QM8 is an excellent TV for bright room watching. It's just get that out of the way. However, the G3 is also excellent. When you set it in Cinema Home, dynamic tone mapping, it looks very good. It's, for me, it would be bright enough. I don't know how bright your bright room is, though. So, but the QM8 is not that much brighter. So, um, yeah, 
I mean, I between the two, I'd still get the G3 because I do. You can't go back after you have OLED. So yeah, is it worth the price difference though? The QMate is very good. Like right here, the spectral highlights look very similar, and you couldn't tell that the QMate is not an OLED in that scene just now. So I'd say go larger. So here's the thing: with the money you save, if you can get an 85-inch QMA for $2,300, that's still less expensive than a 65-inch G3, right? So I go with an 85-inch QM8 or a 75-inch than a 65. But if you're stuck with a 65-inch, personally for me, I'd go with the G3 because I know what I'm. I see the issues with a non-OLED TV. If you've never had an OLED TV before, then save money and get the QM8. If you're going from an OLED TV, you have to stick with OLED. So that's kind of like my chicken way out. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, I see. So you don't like Tizen, got it. You don't have to say it twice, it's okay. Okay, let's see what we got here. So Dave wants to add that for external streamers, Roku and Fire Stick are the only ones that support AV1. And only Roku supports AC for right now what's up there you go and maybe a firmware update could change that right i i have the roku stick 4k stick and i have the roku the larger one slightly more expensive version for me it's all about usability uh i don't know if image quality is better with the av1 maybe it saves on bandwidth so yeah and classy says most the issue with most tv apps is it's 60 hertz so motion can be a problem, right? If you're getting off the app. SD has a complicated question. Any downside of the Fire Cube compared to NVIDIA Shield other than the AI sharpening and Plex server? You are in the woods, my friend. I cannot answer this question. Just basic image quality? It all looks the same to me. What about upscaling, right? Isn't, doesn't the NVIDIA Shield have a better upscaling? SD, you know more than we do. Maybe you should help us with this decision. Okay, now here's a question I can answer. Super Mario Free. I'm torn between the QM8 and the Sony X95K. X95K is Sony's TV last year, but what size? The 85-inch is the only good Sony X95K, in my opinion. The 85-inch is so good, so good, but the 75 and 65-inch, not so good. I reviewed the 65 inch, not impressed at all. So the QM8 definitely better than the X95K in terms of blooming control, black levels, specular highlights, all the stuff that's important to me with HDR impact. But the X95K will probably be more luminous accurate. It follows the EOTF curve, right? So which is more distracting to you? The blooming, the lifted blacks and HDR content, or knowing that it might be a little bit brighter than it should be. Those are the issues. Or you could wait for the U8K and see if it addresses that better than the TCL. It should be between the, U, the QM8, the U8K, or the X95K. I mostly game on my PC and PS5 and watch UHD movies and shows. But who should I go with? So if you're gaming on your PC, hmm, I, I don't know if any of these TVs are appropriate for gaming on the PC. You could try it and you'll notice the HDR is not as good as it should be. Wait for the U8K because the U8K was designed this year with gaming in mind. They have a better game bar than the Sony X95K, which does not have a game bar. And with the Sony X95K, you have to manually go in there and shift between 4K 120, Dolby Vision. I mean, everything is manual, right? It, it doesn't have game mode that's automatic in the way that you expect it to be with an LG or a Samsung. With the U8K, it has a dedicated game page, game bar. Now, how well it works is another matter, but they spent a lot of time designing that in the off-season. So it, wait for the 8K, actually. The X95K is not a great gaming TV because of those issues. It's very much quality of life for gamers on the X95K. And... Oh, thank you for that super sticker. Character holding. <laughs> You're my number one. Thank you, my friend. I love that. And let's see. It's 
Let's go through your questions here. Thank you, Dan, for dropping by. Yeah, thank you for the questions. It keeps things running. Hey, Michael, this is a great question. Why, curious, why compare mini LEDs to OLED versus comparing them to other LEDs like the Q95C and so forth? Okay, so, excuse me. If you've been following chan this channel and the reviews uh, this year, in 2023, so we initially compared the QM8. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, we've initially compared the QM8 with the Q95C and the the U8H. In that three-way, it was clear that the QM8 matched up with the Q95C. So basically. Why buy the Q95C when the QM8 is right there? Spectral highlights were there, black levels were there. And then the U8H was last year's best mini LED LCD TV. It beat out the Q90B in terms of black levels and in terms of specular highlights. Well, the QM8 now matches the U8H or actually beats it, beats the U8H in spectral highlights with even better blooming control because it has twice as many dimming zones. Right? It has over a thousand uh, dimming zones. So. The, Q, the U8H is now out. Now, the question is, well, what about the Q95C? And so here's the thing. I already know that the QM8 specular highlights, for me, when you're watching HDR, it's all about deep blacks without crushing the specular highlights, which Samsung has been unable to do. And the Q95C finally did it, better than the 90A or and better than the 90B. But... The problem with the Q95C is it costs the same as the S95C, and it costs more than the S90C. And so I'm having a hard time justifying. The, I would get the G3 and the S95C before I got the Q95C. And so it doesn't have a place, right? The pricing doesn't make sense. The S90C is a better TV than the Q95C. Why would anyone get the Q95C other than you're afraid of burning? Like, oh, can't, I'm afraid of burning, right? I gotta get the Q95C because it will not burn in. But then you're paying more than twice as much than the QM8. It is not three times better than QM8, right? That, that $3,000, whatever ridiculous price the Q95C is. So that's why, as much as I like the Q95C, knowing that the G3 and the S90C and C3 it costs same or less, it, it, it doesn't have a place. If it was cheaper, if it was, let's say, 2000 maybe under 2000 and then the U8K also is $1,200, and I know that's going to perform very similarly as well, also a 1,000 dimming zone. So that's why I left out the Q95C. Now, why are they compared to OLED? Because you guys need a benchmark for black levels, right? Because when I say, oh, look at the amazing black levels, and you'd be like, well, how amazing is it? And I can say, look, the OLED black levels is the same. Or, aha, the OLED black levels is actually even blacker in that black bar, right? Without a benchmark for black levels, you don't know. And the G3 and the S95C, obviously, self-emissive, perfect black levels, perfect black bars. But unless it's next to it, the QM8, we have no relative sense of that performance. And same with peak specular highlights. I could say the QM8 has amazing peak specular highlights. And then you see the G3 and go, wait, G3 specular highlights is better. Or the S95C is even brighter still. So now you know how much the QM8 has to go to match the strength of OLED. So the two strengths of OLED right now are at the extremes. Small, tiny specular highlights, like we're talking tiny, that you could see, right, in a Black space, perfect blacks, bright specular highlights. OLED nails it. Can the QM8 do that? And how far does it have to go? And without a benchmark, you won't know. And then the other way, right? Black levels, black bars, then you have that bright light against the black bar. You know, does it bloom, halo, whatever? And so that's why. Uh, OLED gives you a benchmark for that. And between the two OLEDs, you have their, its own benchmark, right? You have the inability of the G3 to handle some color banding issues that the S95C can handle, and maybe vice versa. We're always discovering a weakness in one TV that the other TV doesn't have. Both are expensive, but both have different strengths. And so 
having them there. Oh, another one is, well, everyone says mini LED is bright and a QM8 is a very bright TV. But is it really? In sports content, how much brighter is it compared to the G3 at Vivid Max? So if I put the G3 in Max Vivid, right? Everything maxed out. Enhanced contrast, dynamic tone mappings, max it out in SDR, whatever available. And same with the dynamic mode on the S95C and then sports mode on the QM8. Is it really that much brighter? And if you go, oh, oh my goodness, it's not brighter at all. Well, there goes that theory. I mean, you get the G3 in a bright room and you're happy, right? And so they all serve a benchmark for a use case that my job is to kind of explain you, walk you through it. And that's why I always ask, what do you, do you use a TV for? And you'll be surprised, the U7K hits that brightness. So you have the QM8 that costs a little bit more, but if you're watching the sports and the U7K in sports mode or vivid mode matches the QM8 and all you watch is sports, why are you paying more for the QM8? So that's why. Hopefully that answers your question, Michael. And that's how I do it, that's for sure. So about right here. And update, Determined Mind says, the last update on the s 5 c fixed the Atmos dropouts. Hallelujah. And I did just update my TV this morning. So fortunately, I haven't had issues because I haven't been using a sound bar, but good to know. And hey, thanks for the super chat, Christian. Will we see MLA in the larger 83-inch and 97-inch next year? No, not next year. Maybe the year after. Now, I could be wrong. Obviously, they could change their mind at the last minute. From what I've heard, LG Display doesn't, I mean, they're, they're short on cash, right? They, they had to borrow more money from parent company, brother, sister company, LG Electronics, to invest in expanding production because they were not selling enough. It's so bad, they actually had to sell 77-inch and 83-inch OLED to Samsung at a cut rate price because they need to keep their factories productive. That being the case, the financial situation does not justify investing in all new tooling to add MLA to sizes that simply do not sell enough at the flagship level. We're talking MLA on an 83-inch. That's super expensive. It's not going to offset the cost of investing in MLA to get there. So it makes sense why they're not doing it now. If they do it, hey, there you know. How much do I know, right? But from what I've heard, asking them directly, but obviously can never believe marketing team because things changed at the last minute, like MLA. I thought it was going to be limited to 8K. Lo and behold, G3 has it. So, but it makes sense financially not to add MLA on the 83 inch. There's simply not enough volume to justify the cost of doing all of that so ah and larger qd oleds different issue they are having problems creating volume for 55 and 65 and they still have to add you know, real 48 inch size and smaller so they're probably able to sell more tvs at the smaller sizes then that means their next level of tooling and investment would be for the popular sizes expanding production of 55 and 65 and adding more production or new production of the smaller sizes i think 83 inch eventually will get there but it's not going to get there tomorrow just look at how long it took lg to add 83 inch right 55 65 then 77 and it was holding for a few years and then finally 83 we're going to see the same drawn out period for qd oled that saturate the market with 55 and 65 77 all right now let's add 83 unless suddenly everyone's buying 85 inch or 83 83 or 98 inch w oled then maybe samsung will see a market so it really depends on you guys if you start buying 83 inch tvs they'll probably move but the volume isn't there right now so not next year but maybe two three years depends on how many rich people are shelling out five grand for a tv right Okay. Hey, Danny, uh, we changed a few things. We will show you, but oh, I didn't memorize it, but we're going to go through all the settings one more time before we start the comparison. So we'll rush through S95C, G3, not much change in the G3. S95C, there was some changes in color, maybe tint, but I'll show you guys. Contrast, for sure. The biggest change for me when I did mine was Sammy has my contrast at 45 that brings back a lot of that gradient detail so you'll see in some scenes specifically pan where that 
ship is going with the sun, right? The sunset, when the ship is <laughs> going, you're not going to see the details of the sunset if you have contrast at 50. If you take contrast to 45, 44, then you'll see all of that. But you don't lose as much brightness, right? If you go too far down contrast, you're going to lose a bit of brightness noticeably. But take it to 45, brings back some of the gradient details. So that's probably the biggest and most obvious change you all can do with the S95C and the S90C. I have the S90C, same thing. It needs You need to take contrast down a little bit. So that's something that I think you guys can do and notice that difference. The other ones are more subtle, so you may not even notice that change. But definitely contrast to 45 will give you that gradient back. Hmm. You're welcome. I enjoyed giving the detailed response. Okay. Is it true that LG G3 brightness booster does not work in game mode versus the other modes? I believe that's correct, right, Classy? I think you guys have been testing this. Like, this is the number one question. Yeah. I, I think game could be brighter, but who knows? Maybe with the firmware update, things will change. All right. Thank you for the question, Praful Kumar Sony. Are U7K, U8K using the same chip as U8? the UH series? Definitely not, thank heavens. It is an improvement. Two ways, better processing, more processing cycles. So the software is better. A lot less banding than the U8H on the U7K. And you could run 4K 120 gaming with VRR, all that active without affecting image quality as it did last year. So yes, the processor on the U7K and U8K and the algorithm definitely improved. I see it, in the, and you'll see the, some of the banding stuff we'll talk about as I run movie content. So after the calibration is done, we're gonna go through all the settings, and then we'll run through Spears and Muscle really quick, just to show you the differences at 10,000 nit, what you're getting with OLED, how, you know, what QM8 falls behind. We're gonna run real movie content in HDR, and you can see, okay, well, in real movie content, now that it's calibrated, do they really look different and where, right? So we're gonna have fun with that. That shouldn't take too long. Oh, now I would like an 8K TV that can also run 4K 120. Oh, the love for 8K is out there. Ah, I don't think 8, I think 8, 8K gaming, maybe because you're seeing resolution that you're supposed to see, I don't know. But on a TV, you're asking the TV to do way too much. There's just too much processing. It's not worth it. Any gains you're getting in 8K pixel, reserve it for an 8K OLED gaming. Don't do 8K on an LCD TV. It's not going to look good because infinite contrast on the OLED will look better, way better than 8K on an LCD TV. 8K on LCD TV doesn't have infinite contrast. Its dimming zones are compromised it's going to look washed out. You got more pixels, but then on the 4K, you're like, wait, why does the 4K look sharper? Because infinite contrast and latency is better, right? It's just, and you would want to game on an 8K OLED at whatever hertz, but do not choose 8K gaming on anything but an OLED. And yeah, so, you know, Z2, Z3 for you. Otherwise, it's pointless, right? Pixel density cannot beat infinite contrast all day long. And the follow-up, I have ever really used Samsung 8K and I'm hearing bad things about the Q900C versus S95C. Well, if you cut my live stream, we had gaming of the 77 inch S95C versus the 85 inch Q900C. S95C looked the same in terms of brightness. It had better spectral highlights. So I don't know about bad things because Q900C is still a great TV, but it's an LCD TV. It's got limitations. The S95C is so emissive. It's naturally going to have certain advantages. And in gaming, its SDR was a match for the Q900C. The Q900C has to move or process 8K, and it has to put out more brightness than a 4K TV just to get through all those pixels, just to get you the same brightness as a 4K TV. It's just, it makes no sense at all why you would put yourself through 8K TV. In the past, it had more dimming zones. I get it. 
today, the Q95C has the same number of dimming zones as the Q900C. So no-brainer, get the Q95C if you need to get an LCD TV. And hey, thanks for that super chat, Jeremy, Jermaine Brown. Currently have a Q65Q, looking to get a QM8. Will it be a major difference? I would say so, because it's 85 inches. That's the biggest difference if you're getting a larger TV. But your specular highlights will be better. So if the QN65 is Samsung's entry-level QLED, Neo QLED, you're not getting specular highlights. I know you're not. So with the QM8, the specular lights, highlights will be brighter, and you'll have better saturation. Off angle, on angle, black levels will be better. So with more dimming zones, it's you'll notice the difference for sure, especially in the specular highlights. And Getty G Man, should you wait for the 85 inch UAK versus the UX? So it's not guaranteed that there's an 85 inch UAK. There should be one. Is the 85-inch UX going to be the 85-inch flagship from Hisense? It may just be the UX as 85-inch from Hisense. So now I will be reviewing the 65-inch UAK. So that's worth waiting for. But if you're in the market for the 85-inch, definitely you're comparing the Hisense UX with the Sony X95L. They should be within $1,000 of each other. You know, the UX will be around just over 4,000 street price, and the Sony will be just under 5,000 street price. It's still within 15% price that you can decide, and that will be at the shootout in October. Hey, are you done? Uh, yeah, for the most part, we're gonna match it now. Oh, okay, match. Um, yes. Oh. And the player is right there, so you might have to point to the player over here. Oh. <laughs> All right. So we're almost done. Last lap. Now we're perceptual matching. This is the, this is Mark II. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question, Giddy. Hmm. Best Buy has the LG OLED G3 for $300 off. Is that a good deal? No. So it's still too early for any good deals for 2023 LG or Samsung TVs. The best deals from LG is going to come closer to Black Friday. That's just how LG works. The best deals for Samsung will start in September, depending on the model, and will build up. But you'll get the best Samsung deals in September, October, and LG is actually closer to Black Friday around there. And then Prime Day will be the first round of discounts. So if you are looking at the G3 and you cannot wait until Black Friday, Prime Day would be the time to go. And you know, and it'll be flash sales. You got a quick trigger finger. So the minute I post, hey, G3 on sale, there's like maybe a hundred of them available and it'll be gone in the first hour because people are waiting for that. But yeah, now is still too early. Definitely wait for Prime Day, which is like July 12th or 11th or something like that this year. Mid July, sometime. I think it's the 12th this year. Or you can call, I keep forgetting, if you call Electronics, they will match the best deal and bundle something extra for you. If you say FOMO sent, sent you, right? So I like sending people over to, to, uh, John, uh, to Robert Zone at Valley Electronics because then he will add this, that, the other to, to sweeten the deal for you. And he pays the tax. State tax, sales tax. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for holding on. We're almost done here. They're perceptually matching right now. Hey, good question, CE Critic. Did the MLA add any complications to calibrating on the G3? Matt, maybe we can ask the question 
Does MLA make calibrating harder, easier, or does it make any difference at all for the G3? So from the ones I've done, oh, here we go. So from the ones I've done, which I've done a lot of them for the studios now, mm -hmm. I've had zero issues. So MLA doesn't make any harder, or you don't have to do anything special, really. Not exactly. So the fact that MLA magnifies the entire grayscale and color gamut and everything, mm -hmm. um, you can usually calibrate through it. Okay. So I think maybe if you're lightly touching it, you might have more issues if you have like less you know granularity in the controls. But generally, if I'm building like a 10-bit 1D LUT for HDR, SDR, like the MLA hasn't really... They do anything. If anything, it helps. Oh, so as it, long as it doesn't hurt. I think that's the concern. I'll let people, yeah, oh, MLA, you know, I've heard, lifted this and bad for, that. For so. 100 nits on a G3, generally your OLED light is like 8. Yeah, yeah you don't even need that. <laughs> right, right, so right. So you just have to be in the right position. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Matt. And Yeti G Man, thank you for the super chat. 75 inch U8K versus 85 inch UX. Yes, let's wait for the reviews. Well, first of all, completely different price ranges, right? The 85 UX is going to be over four thousand dollars. Five thousand at launch, it'll drop in price, probably end up a little over four. And then 75 inch U8K is under two thousand, so or at two thousand at worst. But I think under 2000 it, twice as much. Definitely wait for the reviews. Other than the size increase, how good is it, right? So I think it's going to be phenomenal. But that's my optimistic side talking. When I see 5,000 dimming zones, I get excited. Here we go. Question from Colby. Hey, FOMO, I have a 77-inch G2, but am looking to get an 83-inch or 85 for the extra screen size. Yes, I agree. I'm eyeing the Sony X95L. Good eye. Am I crazy for thinking of going to Mini LED from OLED? Mm, no, you're getting size, but you have to keep in mind, you are now used to the G2's infinite contrast. And if you're in a, a slightly brighter room, you won't notice that difference as much because the ambient light diminishes. The, the impact of that infinite contrast that you would normally see on the G2. So in a brighter room, I think it's fine. How And, and the size more than makes up the difference. But in a slightly darker room, I don't know. You might want to hold off on it until you get an 83 inch, mostly because you're very used to perfect black bars. We're talking cinema enthusiasts here, right? So And the specular highlights, I spoke to Brian, and he thought the specular highlights were better than the Q95C and the 85 inch. So at least there's some good specular highlights, but ultimately you're used to OLED. And my general rule is if you are now a fan of OLED, you will notice these differences, but if it's in a bright enough room, you may not. Like the QM8 right here, I'm looking at OLED on top and it's very subtle. Um, scenes like this, you really cannot tell. I would have to hand select certain scenes where all that aha, perfect, and it's always a black bar, right? Or specular highlights. Here, I don't have the specular highlights that's small enough to really expose the LCD TV. And you might not have that with the X95L. So more often than not, you won't notice the difference, especially if it's in a moderate, moderately lit or brighter room. So, but the size, I think you'll enjoy. Or maybe wait for the 98 inch QM8, $10,000. And thank you, Austin. You are still around. Thank you for that super chat. Thanks for the streams. You're welcome. Because of this one and the one with Brian, I'm going to go with a 77-inch S90C. I would too. If that's on your list, there is no reason not to consider it. And Xbox Series X Gaming, you'll love it. Don't look back. Come out and hang out, and you know we'll share settings and stuff. But the S90C 77-inch, tentatively, I think it's, it's my favorite TV right now for 2023 because of the price, the performance, the all around nature, right? It's good for gaming and HDR and it matches the performance of the S95C. So I'm just really liking that 77 inch S90C and for the price especially. But the other TVs on the list is because we're thinking value. 
But if it's cost no object, the fact that the S90C can go hand in hand right there with the S95C, blow for blow, is just so impressive. And it's $1,000 cheaper. So congratulations. Hey, Nighthog, LG AK OLED is so expensive. Yeah, it's not worth it. it. The only thing is it comes in 88 inch size, right? Oh, 88 inch OLED. But other than that, you'll be ha just as happy with an 83 inch 4K OLED, like the C3. And then wait until 8K goes up to maybe 110 inch, 98 inch, 110 inch 8K OLED maybe at that point. Because you really need a larger size. But thanks again, everyone, for coming by. We're in the, the last stretch, last lap of this calibration. They are perceptually matching the TVs now. Now, you won't benefit from it, obviously, because YouTube compression being what it is and the color differences or white point differences because of the LG G3's WOLA technology will make it look slightly cooler. But now that it's been calibrated, at the beginning of the stream, if you notice, you notice slight differences in the whites, right? Maybe one is a bit warmer, one's a bit cooler. Now they all look very similar. Even the G3 looks very similar in terms of the clouds and the white points. So the calibration gets everything standardized, and then we just talk about the other differences rather than, oh, this looks too yellow or whatnot, right? You're not distracted by color differences, if any. And yeah, July 11 and 12 is prime day. Okay, if it's two days, what? <laughs> What's it called? Prime day. It should be prime days. Or, or it's a day because it runs from 11th through the 12th, right? It crosses over two days. So I, I don't know. But that's uh, crazy. And let's see here. Try to catch up with some of these comments. But you guys are awesome. And. There you go. Thank you, buddy. Tony Danza. Really wish the QMA came in 55 inches. Tony, is that really you? Who's the boss, right? 65 inches is too big for me. So the U8K comes in a 55 inch. Given what we've seen of the U7K, I expect the U8K to be very similar to the QM8. Just think of the U8K as a 55 inch version of the QM8 and you'll be very close to the performance because the dimming zones, there are just so many of them at that size uh, for this price point. I think it'll be a match. So U8K 55 inch, that could be the TV for you. Is Hisense going to make 85 inch U8K? That remains to be seen. I'll ask Hisense, but that remains to be seen. It could be that the UX is the 85 inch and they don't want to steal sales from the UX because if the 85 inch U8K is awesome and the UX is just barely more awesome and it's twice as much, what's, what's the reason <laughs> to get the, not to get the $2,000 U8K? So now you have a separation of products in TCL and Hisense. TCL offers the QM8 at just above 2,000 in the 85 inch. But if you want better, even if it's slight, you can go to Hisense UX, right? So I think they want to have that competition between brands that is somewhat helpful. We'll see if it works out for them. Any idea when Hisense is going to release the U8K anytime now? So I'll be getting the U8K from Hisense next week for review purposes. And normally, I'd say by the end of the month, I'm expecting by the end of June, we'll see the U8K release as well as the U7K. <clears throat> we'll see. <laughs> Y'all pulling an all lighter? I hope not. I don't think so. We're, we're doing perceptual matching. We're almost done. So after it's matched to their satisfaction, what I'm going to do is run through all the settings real quick 
so that we have it all in one segment at the end, and then go through a run through of spears and muscle real quick, and we're going to capture luminance differences, and then at ten thousand minutes, and then we'll run through movie samples, and then that's it, and then we'll call it a night. Thank you for putting up with us. No, maybe it's an all nighter for you. I forgot to ask. Where are you from, right? If you're in Europe, it is an all nighter. Here in California, it's only six thirty. I want a 65 inch or 77 inch for 5,000 or below. You can get it now. 77 inch G3 or S95C, 4,500. Boom. Except the Sony A95L is likely above 5,000. Oh. The Q7 looks like a pain and a half to calibrate. Yeah, we'll see. Well, we're going to talk about it. Hey, yes, Demetrius, we'll do it right now. Once they're done, we're going to run through all of them. And I'm going to pull it out of the stream and put it out there as a separate you know, couple of minutes long. But we'll summarize it really quick. So, play. we did this on my live stream at Valley Electronics, <clears throat> excuse me, two months ago. So if you check my live stream, I have a day one and day two. So in day one, at the end of that stream, and that was another five-hour stream, the last two hours, we were streaming on the G3, and the, or gaming on the G3 S95C. And the next day, <clears throat> excuse me, we did it again. So, oh, just lost it. Let's let the camera cool down real quick here. Okay, perfect timing. As it cools down, we can then do our comparisons when, whenever the calibrators are ready. But yeah, if you see that stream, you'll see the comparison in SDR. Now, this was prior, like original firmware. I think there was only one firmware update when we did this back in April, I want to say. So maybe things have changed. And it was in a dark room. It was at nighttime. Uh, ultimately, the S95C SDR was just so bright. In HDR, it's just different. One has HGIG a little bit, arguably, more accurate. The other, the highlights were a bit more, you know, more spark. But they were close enough that either one would make many people happy. So, but most people prefer the S95C look in HDR gaming. But you got to have to try both. And game specific as well, right? So you already have a game you have in mind. It's unavoidable. You're going to have to find someone who's... The thing is, if you ask an S95C person who's gaming, like, oh, I love this in this game. And you ask the G3, oh, I love it. You know, maybe it's so close, it doesn't matter which one you choose, right? The G3 is still looking like it blows away every other set out of the water from the quality of the stream. Yeah, you know, in some scenes, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty dastardly bright but we're, we're gonna go through them and i'll show you the scenes here's a good question is the satellite box quality on the s 5 c going to be better than the sony x950g so this is an older tv this is ah oh, this is right before the h series when they added that contrast uh, ultra wide contrast filter craziness so Sony, or all the TV makers, have improved a lot since. And I'd say that would be 2018, right? The 950G was around 2018 or so. So since 2018, we've got five years to improve processing. I would say the S95C is going to look at least as good, but likely better. But that's a guess on my part. I don't have the 950G. And I have found the S95C to be acceptable. I don't have a satellite box. So that's such a unique use case. Can't answer your question because I don't know how it's going to look. I honestly don't. So, but the 950G is, I don't know, processing's got to improve since then, right? It's just got to. I don't know. I mean, I'm speculating. Should be better. Who knows? And especially what, what satellite box, right? Cable box, right? You know, each box does its thing. And then what's your reception like? 
too many variables. Why? You're you're welcome, Jim Bradis. Okay, Andrew, good question. Thank you for the dedication. I'm here for you. Jumping from a TCL R646 to a Q7, worth it? No. So I, I still have the R646. Great TV, super bright. The Q7 does specular highlights a little bit better, but it's not worth it. You're, you're not, it's a lateral move. So basically the Q7 is giving you R646 almost performance for less. Specular highlights, processing, but the blacks on the R646 is better. The R646, it just, it had very deep blacks. I really like the R646. The Q7 is a, it doesn't have enough thinning zones to compete with the R646. If you have the R646, it's best to go to an OLED. You will notice more of a difference. It's going to be really difficult to see a significant jump other than a larger size. Even going to a QM8, you'll be like, it's a little bit better, but I bought another TV for this. Now, if you go to an 85 inch QM8, okay, now you got everything. It's larger, it's got this and that. But if you keep the same size, honestly, few TVs are that much better than the R646. So, especially sports, Netflix, occasional gaming, that's it. Just hold on to it, wait until it breaks, then. Uh, it doesn't need to be QM8. It needs to be a QM8 for you to preserve what you're used to. Q7 is a drop. Don't go Q7. You gotta go with a QM8. The num but we'll have it right here. QM8 versus the Q7. But the QM8, I can already tell it has better contrast. It has deeper blacks. And that's what the R646 has. So yeah, good question. Don't, don't, don't replace it with a Q7 unless it's really big, right? You're going from a 55 to an 85 Q7. Now you're going for size. Oh, you know, I think this is a European thing, Demetrius. What is the difference between a 65U7KQ and a 65E7KQ Pro? We don't even have those, so you're going to have to ask your local Hisense team. I have no idea. The USA does not have that many variations. <laughs> How is the, it's a good question. How is the details in processing in the TCL and Hisense compared to the G3? Generally speaking, the G3 is a better processor. They designed their own processor for their TVs. I mean, it's in-house. You're not going to beat that. Vertically integrated design for that TV. T-cell Hisense, it depends on what TV, are they using MediaTek? Hisense does not design its own chips, it's using MediaTek, right? T-cell, who knows, they do technically have a chip sub, but are they designing it with T-cell TVs in mind? Who knows? If you're talking processing, I would take a G3 all day long. And it's an entirely different price level. This is a flagship level processor that's better than the S95C. If you're talking just pure processing power, so the G3, I would say, is a flagship processor that you're going to have a hard time matching any TV. It doesn't matter if it's Hisense or TCL. It's then everything put together. So the G3, its natural competitors are the A95L, the S90C, S95C. TCL and Hisense, they are a value brand hoping to give you 95% of the G3 for one-third the cost. But that 5%, is the little things, right? The calibration settings, the processor. In those scenes where very few people see, you'll see it better on the G3. It's the little things that you're paying for, that last few percentage points of performance. So TCL and Hisense are great for what they are, which is they're still a value budget TV. And, and don't worry, the signal's coming back. I'm just letting my camera cool off for our last round. Oh, Rody, old client. Hello, FOMO. Back in 2020, you advised me to get the A8H, 65-inch. Yeah, back then, all of, all of those were so dim. Remember that? I need something newer and bigger for the bedroom. 90% YouTube, 10% movies in the bedroom. And my girlfriend is 100% cable news. <laughs> 
newer and bigger. So newer and bigger. 77 inch, I want to say 77 inch C2 or C3 is all you need because YouTube in the bedroom, I mean, you don't need a bright, you, you know, it has enough art, it has enough HDR impact in a dark room, it's in a bedroom. 10% movies especially, YouTube doesn't have HDR impact per se. I would say even a B2, if it's still available, B2, B3, C2, C3, 77 inch, or you can even get away, ah, 83 inch is still a bit expensive, but yeah, I wouldn't go as low as an A2, I think that's actually dimmer than the A8H, but C2, 77 inch, if it's still around for a good price, C3, uh, A80K, 77 inch, also should be fine, mm. but yeah, definitely. Maybe a B2 on sale. Good times. This is this is an easy one. You gotta stick with OLED though. Even the A80J, 77 inch, if it's available at a good deal. And Jerome has a question. Hey, Fomo, would you rather pick a 55 inch S90C or a 65 inch QM8 for movie watching and maybe some gaming? Ah, but maybe some gaming has me at the S90C because. If there may be some gaming, may end up being a bit more gaming. S90C has it. Even though the 65 inch is a little bit larger, unless you're 75, I, I think the 10 inch difference, I would appreciate the S90C image quality for gaming and consistency more than the QM8 size, because I think 10 inches isn't enough to justify going to the QM8, especially if you do have some gaming. So I'd recommend the 55 inch S90C. Everything else being equal, meaning the price. But the QM8 will have lou louder audio, I'll tell you that. The QM8 audio is pretty loud. The S90C audio, not as loud, if that's important to you. Yeah, I think the 950 was 2018. Hey, Miles, will you, I'd be providing these settings to us after the podcast. So it, it will be at the end. So we're, we're almost there. As soon as they say go, we will start hitting all the settings real quick for you guys. And then we'll do some comparisons, some movies. And then, you know, we can set Sammy free. Hey, Christopher, have we talked about the LG G3 calibration yet? Yes, we did. And I'll just give you a quick summary. It's great. There's not much to fix. And it, you know, you got the 3D LUT, it took a lot of time, but you can get the precision there that none of these TVs are able to get as precise with color accuracy within the DCI P3 space. And it's great. So unless you have a specific question about the calibration, like, I don't know, the black crushing can be addressed with calibration. Dolby Vision also with calibration addresses some of those issues that maybe out of the box might be either crushed or lifted, depending. But since no TV is perfect, you have to choose your poison. In adjusting one thing, you end up over adjusting elsewhere, right? So what we want to do is adjust where it's most visible and you may compromise something else. Ultimately, the G3 is still a reference quality TV after calibration. And the S95C is amazing too. So, but if you've got any specific questions, ask and, and we'll see. In what cases is the G3 processor superior to S95C? In high quality content, none, indistinguishable. It's low bit rate. We're not talking low resolution. It's the same, right? If you're taking high quality 480p and you upscale it to 4K, it looks indistinguishable as far as I'm concerned. What is different is low bit rate, meaning the internet is dropping in quality. So Netflix or YouTube or YouTube TV, gives you just enough bit rate to show an image, it's missing information. G3 fills in the blanks better, and uh, the artifacts you see on the s 95 c that you don't see on the G3 is macro blocking. So, you know, those squares, pixel squares, right? And you have a gradient. Normally the gradient, like, oh, let me turn this on, you'll see it right here. Okay, so. 
as this image. There you go. So you see that gradient right there? So if you make that gradient a little bit darker, high, high bit rate, high quality, they'll look great. If you start subtracting, lowering the bit rate, there's not a lot of information. When there's not a lot of information, the TV doesn't know how to smooth it out, right? It doesn't have that color information in between that gradient. So on the S95C, you see little blocks, right? Pixelated blocks. On the G3, it's a little bit smoother. Now, and, and, and the blocks aren't as clear. So what they choose to do works. It looks very smooth. And on the S95C, it's just you know, giant blocks of blue, then white, and blue, whatever. And it doesn't happen all the time. But when it does happen, I freeze frame, and that's when I capture it. So that is when I see it. Other people see it in motion. They see the stutter is like kind of bad. So it, it was pretty consistent that YouTube TV is the biggest culprit for, and that's where I caught it. If you don't watch YouTube TV, new guy, you may not see it. I don't know if satellite has this issue. This is seen on YouTube TV sports where we're watching sports a bit on the S95C. It feels a bit stuttery, right? It's, it's just, it, it looks like it's pixelated or issues, but since I exclusively only watch high quality content, whether it's Kaleidoscape or disc or streaming, I have, thankfully I have gigabit. Then my Netflix, my prime, my Disney, all high quality, I never see these issues. It's only when you guys tell me, oh, you know, I see this and that, that I know, right? And then I have to go back and go to YouTube and I check it out. So those are the cases I've seen, but again, these are edge cases. And if you're in the edge case, you might want to go with the G3 because you're playing it safe. Hey, Martin, great comment. Hey, thanks, Fomo. I had a Vizio 65-inch MQ8, and I was thinking of upgrading to the QM8. Found the G2 on sale, and it continues to blow my mind every time. Yes, infinite contrast. That's what we're talking about. OLED is great, period. If you've never had infinite contrast before in a dark room, it just looks great. Bike my ride. Definitely wait for the U8K. Don't rush into the Q7 or the QM8. If the U8K possibly will be exactly the same as the QM8. In that case, okay, so you wasted a few weeks, right? At best, it may follow the UOTF curve a little bit better than the QM8 out of the box, but at least you have options. So we're going to talk to Sammy about the differences he sees between the QM8, the Q7, and the U7K, but it's always good to have options, right? But for sure, the U8H motion is a little bit improved. Now, are you sensitive to stutter or are you sensitive to soap opera effect? If you're sensitive to kind of both, the G2 does have good motion processing. I'm very happy with that, but I'm also happy with the S95 and S90C motion processing. Excuse me. So G2 and Sony or LG and Sony, modern LG OLED, modern Sony, all the TVs, great motion. If you're sensitive to motion, I just play it safe and stay away from high system TCL. Because for me, I need to take their motion processing up a little bit. So I, I do notice a little bit of soap opera, but then the stutter is gone because I cannot stand stutter. But if you don't like soap or stutter, you're kind of stuck with the LG or Sony because they're the ones that get it into the right setting that minimizes both. That's feeling better. Yes, I was cooling the camera down. down. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, apparently, every hour or so, after streaming for like you know sixty minutes, seventy-five minutes, the Sony A7 IV just shuts down and needs to cool. And when you're sending HDMI 4K 30 out of it, it just happens, right? It's, it's not used to that much live streaming, I guess. So, but I just cooled it down, so it should be good for another hour, and, which is all we need, hopefully. Yeah, I should have used the FX30, which has an internal fan, and that does not shut down no matter what I do. So next time, I'll put that on my face, and my face will shut down at worst, and the FX30 will continue on ticking. Yay, internal fans. Okay, T. 
question. I'm in the market for a new TV, 65 inch for HDR movies and gaming. Any suggestions? Yes, S95C. We're done. <laughs> Budget? So the easy answer is always, oh, movies and gaming, S95C. Why not, right? That is a flagship TV for 2023. It's 3,500. If that's your budget, go for it. If it's not, S90C or C3 or G3, what is your budget? And you care that there is some burn-in risk. We're not saying it's huge, but it's always going to be mentioned that maybe you might have it. I don't think it's an issue if you vary your content. So yeah, T, I'd start with the S95, ugh. depending on your budget, S95C, 3500, S90C, no, 25, 2600. Um, if you like LG, then the G3 is great. Uh, dropping in brightness, you go down to the C3, and then if you have no budget, the Sony A95L coming in August is 4,000 for the 65 inch. So yeah, it's nice to have money, right? Is the G3's lower saturation in game mode fixed? I don't know if they can fix these things. Oh, hey, maybe maybe this person could answer the phone. Hey, Classy, can you hear me? Hey. All right. Hey. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I hear you. All right. So. Everyone, let me know if you can hear Classy. And oops. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so what's up, buddy? How are you? Is your day, is your day over? Ready I got a few more minutes. Uh, I keep seeing the same questions about the LG game mode, so I'm going to reiterate <laughs> it again. <laughs> Go uh, for it. So LG's, it's not just the G3. Uh, it's past models, too. The the color the outer edge of the colors and the gamut and the you know the higher brightness range, they are restricted. Um, so the G3 game mode colors are basically on par with the G2. Yeah. So the only thing you're actually getting brighter with on the G3 is white. Um, and then the A90J is also, you know, color brightness is actually a little bit higher than the G2 and the G3 um, until it starts dimming and then it dims down to about probably about the same. Different problem, um, but yeah, that's a that's a thing with LG. Um, the colors just don't get as bright when they're in the you know, the the brighter range of HDR color, and they're more towards the outer edge of the gamut. So it's not color saturation that's the issue, but it's the luminance, right? The color, the brightness yeah. of that color. So new guy, yep. it's not saturation per se. It's color luminance. So that color doesn't get as bright as it could, or if it does, it dims over time or whatever and this is and this is something that's been around as a w oled thing it appears right this is a limitation no no it's an lg thing because like it's i said the a90j thing. the a90j doesn't have the problem okay uh, uh, but it's just the way lg well i guess you can kind of say a90j has the problem because they do dim in game mode you know and you can't do anything about it to disable it so right i guess you kind of say it but as far as measurements go, the A90J colors in game mode will measure higher than a G2 or a G3. Um, but then, like I said, as it dims, it'll even out. Okay. Well, so, thank you for adding color to that, Classy. And I think that's another thing is, <laughs> I mean, what is the best game mode for HDR gaming in a G3? Because I think part of it could be also, well, you don't know what mode they're in. Like, if they're in the... Mm -hmm. If they don't have the right setting, that could also screw it up. So, for you, yeah. So that kind of like I, I do have a video on it. You're still just gonna use game mode with HGIG because of the way games are. If you try to use 4,000 nit settings with Filmmaker, then you're gonna raise shadows in most games. So it's not a. There's a few games that works for, or some games it works for, but not all games. Right. So if you really want it fixed, you have to have a tone map upload done to Filmmaker mode to cause a hard clip. And then you can play with ALLM in Filmmaker mode. You still are going to give up one frame of input lag, and the highlights won't be exactly right, but they'll be close enough, um, and then you can do that. Okay. But that involves calibration, uh, or at the very least, you um, you know, knowing how to do it. 
But yeah, while they're doing the matching, remind them about the uh, the skin tones thing with all the girls, and because it has a white background and the color checker, so it'll oh. probably be good for matching. Yeah, they're, they're they're still appreciating the cows first. Come on, we gotta work up the animal food chain, my friend. <laughs> Eventually, we'll get to the ladies. <laughs> we're, we're into mammals now, right? We were at trees, uh, the elements, clouds, forests. Now we made it to hot-blooded mammals, and then we'll, we'll eventually get to the ladies. But so let me ask you, when you are doing your minimalism uh, perceptual, how important is skin tone to you? Is that your last step? The like skin tone, is that the first thing you do? No, I, I start with white, and then I go straight to skin tones because that's the most important, and especially other, um, things like blonde hair. Um, that's a because blonde hair will pick up if there's too much green or red very easily. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, like, I have the Disney Wow disc, so it's just like twelve scenes of, in a row of Disney stuff, and there's a lot of you know whites and you know yellows and whatnot so like i can just quickly go through a bunch of different scenes and then that disney wow disc also has um you know color patterns with uh yeah. you know, clouds and whatnot so that that's one of the things i use well that makes sense right people could try to do that oh, wait and it only works if you have two tvs or a reference and a yeah, you cannot it, do. Right? There's no point in doing matching unless you have a display that either you know is very close to reference, or like if you work on a certain display, like you have mm -hmm. a monitor that's you're mm -hmm. you're doing your grading on, um, then you would match to that. Uh, or if you just happen to be, you know, someone who has a bunch of TVs and you just want them all to look the same, makes sense. And then you just mean, pick I mean, one to be your reference. A, holding up a magazine photo isn't good enough, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, Giddy Man, for that super chat. Giddy G Man. Hey, no, I gotta you, head out. But... Oh, yeah, run, do your thing, buddy. Thanks for coming by. Yep. yep. So, I would say. Hey, FOMO, any review of the H6K? I guess you mean the U6K? <laughs> if not, thanks. So, the U6K, I know I've been saying that the U7K was the least expensive mini LED you can get from Hisense. It's actually U6K. It is. There's actually a U6K Mini LED TV, but because it has so few dimming zones, I guess I can't do it. Um, now, if Hisense sends it to me, but you know what's going to end up being? It's going to end up being, oh, look how great the U7K looks. Oh, look how great. So unless I also drag in the Q60C or the Q70 or the Q80, then you have something to compare it to. Otherwise, it's not going to look as good as U7K. Hey, you guys done? Is it yeah. frozen? Well, I want this to. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. Places. Here we go. I have this one. The other one's SDR, so I only have those two. Looks like an authentic copy to me. <laughs> it's my pre production copy. I still have to get my final production. Oh, you know what? It works fine. Okay. There's a remote right there. I'm going to start packing up. Okay. And Miyako has a comment. Can it looks so good for LED? Yes, it looks great. Just a shame it's so noticeably brighter. I know, right? Nothing is perfect. So the hope is that the U8K did address that. That's the hope. We will see. You know, I gotta hold you guys in suspense. There's gotta be a reason to tune in for the U8K, right? We will see for sure. The skin, oh yeah, the skin tone should be on the original disc you had, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Okay, hey, they're looking for something else. Who needs skin tones? That's what we're saying. They got the cows matched up, come on. Is the BT2020 still oversaturated on the S95C? I think, uh, Sammy, after calibration, it's, it's, it's matched, it's good? No, it's, it's pretty good, it's still a little bit oversaturated. It's a little bit oversaturated? Um, the, at the outer edges. The outer, outer edges, yeah, once okay. Once you start getting up to like, 80, 85% stimulus. Then that's why. Starts to see a bit so it's in the brighter, the brighter end. The more saturated. Got it. Right. Okay. So, you know, guys, if it's brighter, you get more color. Who's complaining? No, not, not if it's brighter. If it's, it's literally just more saturated. So oh, it's more saturated. You have your, you have your gamut. Uh -huh. bucket, right? If you are on the outer edges of those gamut. Oh, bucket, that's when it's saturated. That's when it's a little bit oversaturated. 
Sure. So if you're looking at, say, BT2020, mm-hmm. and you're measuring, say, uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. 20, 40, 60 are pretty much dead on, maybe a little bit of slight oversaturation, still on target, mm-hmm. just a slight amount of oversaturation. But once you start getting upwards to, like, 85 percent mm-hmm. that's when it's not really on target got it got so it. but that's when you're measuring um p3 okay within 2020 and also it also uh, applies if you're measuring 709 okay. in 2020 but it's close enough that you really shouldn't notice any difference unless you're comparing it to something so the biggest difference if you're in 2020 mode on the QN90C and the, I'm sorry, the S90C and the S95C, mm-hmm. your gradients are so much better mm. that you want to calibrate it in 2020 mm-hmm. because that's the consumer envelope anyways. All the right. content's delivered in 2020. I still don't understand why Samsung hasn't fixed their auto. You know, <laughs> no, right? right. It shouldn't even map to P3. P3 they is not even used by P3. P3. Right. P3 shouldn't exist. Right, because exactly. all the streaming is now right. packaged in that yeah. container. Right. So if anything, they should be mapping P3 inside the 2020. Okay. So hopefully I can get that information to them or through Dave so they can never fix it, you know, <laughs> which, no. it might, which it does. So like if you take take a triple laser uh, projector, mm-hmm. you d- will display everything within 2020. And then whatever you're sending it, it's just going to map that color space within 2020. So for the most part, P3 shouldn't even exist by all rights. Like, it really shouldn't. We, we At least not as an option to choose. Right. Okay. So outside of a studio, mm-hmm. the studio work, the, the reference monitors, you know, can hit 100% P3. We work in P3. That's what the monitors can do. Now that we have quantum dot OLED, oh, wow, now we have 90%, you know, of 2020. Well, now things are changing. So hopefully that starts changing in the studios, but it's going to take some time. Now... You're in the process, you're perceptual matching. Tell me the process here. We have five TVs, five versions of the face in the background. What are you matching? What are you doing? What are you looking for? So they have an idea of, because the calibration with the meters is done, what more are you doing now? So generally you're looking at like hue and tint. And you know, if you have the eye for it, if you've done this long enough, you can tell, oh, she has too much blue. Mm-hmm. And then we have to go, wait a minute. What level of blue are we at too much of? Where do we need to take blue out, add green in? And which one's the reference for you? Like, so it shows too much blue compared to the S95C. How many is the S95C? Okay. Yes. Okay. And all right. So you guys are making that adjustments to her face more than the wall, right? Because this is, this is kind of like the shootout issue where you have to choose. Am I going to have an accurate white wall or an accurate skin tone because there are more reds, whatever? You shoot for both. Okay. Yeah, that's why if you perceptually match just on white, yeah, you can do that, but you don't know the consequences of it later on. So okay. generally, it's best to get a complete reference baseline, mm-hmm. then look at real content, and then make your adjustments and get the best compromise. So right now, I can tell this bottom one we're going to have to play with. That, that would be the QM8. Okay. Correct. And the S95C is going to serve as the reference yes. skin tone. So yep. for everyone watching... With the exception of the G3 because of the color blues, sure. uh, WOLED, which one is the closest to S95C? Just a quick look right now. Um, I mean, in terms of APL and matching, the G3 is probably the closest, but it could maybe take a little tweak. And then what, what you'll find on the LCDs, like both of the TCLs can get very, very bright. Yes. So when you look at full screen, that brightness is going to cause so, your eyes to think it's a color yeah. shift when it's really not. It's just right. an APL shift. Right. And, okay, so as soon as you're done with that, we'll go through all the settings real quick, and we'll talk about the differences in software. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. This remote. All right, so obviously you guys will not see, you'll see more differences than are there, mostly because the LG G3 W OLED has that W OLED, white so pixels, so it'll throw off the color a bit once my camera gets a hold of it. Okay, let's go through some questions here. Uh, 
Hey, MacGyver, I know your question is, Sammy, what's the result on the G3? But be more specific. What are you asking about specifically? Because the G3 is great. You know, there's no complaints. It's just that there are certain things that QD OLED does better. That's all. So let us know specifically about the G3. What is it you want to know? All the TVs are, are now calibrated meter-wise, equipment, all done. They're now perceptually matching to make sure that skin tones and the whites and all that match that they can make adjustments beyond the meter because your eyes see differently than what the meters see. Hmm. Let's see here. Oh, here's a good question. Kurt Hugger asks, I just got the Spears of Muscle calibration disc how are you supposed to adjust the color and tint without a blue filter? The calibration disc is not supposed to be used independently to calibrate your TV. You need, a, you, you need meters. You need a reference. You don't know what it's supposed to look like, right? So the Spears and Muscle disc, as a reviewer, I use it to compare TVs to see how they do with the same source that I know what the source wants it to do. This is supposed to be 10,000 nits. Does it clip? This is 1,000 nits. Uh, does it have all the colors? It has all the things I can play with when comparing TVs. So that's my use case. But it's not supposed to be used on its own with just a disc in one hand and your TV. Okay, I'm going to start calibrating my TV with just this disc. Can't be done. Uh, so let us know. What are you using the disc for? And maybe we can help you a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's more than just a blue filter you're missing, my friend. What was the Delta error on the G3, Sammy, if you remember, at the um, end? Offhand, I do not remember. I have to put my report and already shut down my... Uh, oh, we will get the Delta <laughs> error later. But it was low. Come on. It's, a G, it's yeah, typical. It was, it was definitely low. I know it was like point... It was like between like point 0.5 and point 0.7, okay. um, depending on what you're looking at. And unless, but that's in DE2000. As soon as you start looking at ITP, it's high. Sure. You're talking about like fours and sevens and so on. So. Okay. And there you have it. It's consistent with other G3s. So it's not like this is any better or worse. Does anybody know what happened to Joe Kane? This is a random comment. Oh, you know, he's he's a bit older now. Have, have you been working with Joe Kane? Are you heard any hair of him? I saw Joe Kane at the... I saw Joe Kane at the NAB. No, not at NAB. He's probably at, at NAB. I saw him at a Simpy conference in Culver City. Oh, yeah, yeah, Simpy Saturday conference. Yeah, so there you go. Great. Yeah, so he's, he's still out and about, guys. Joe Kane's still out there. Hey, John. Thanks for the super chat from John Odom. How big of an upgrade is the S95C over the S90C? In the 77-inch, none at all, unless you consider the One Connect box an upgrade. In the smaller sizes, very subtle uh, because Gen 1, Gen 2, and it's mo but really, do you want the One Connect box or not? The differences are so subtle. For most content, you're not going to notice the difference. So I would say... If you've never had an OLED before, get the S90C and join the hell out of it. If you've had an OLED before, like an LG or a Sony, then going to the S95C gives you the maximum upgrade available for OLED, right? So I would normally say just get the S90C if you've never had an OLED. It's a great first OLED. It's better and brighter than the C3 and very close to the G3, beating it in some scenes, right? So, yeah. Uh, not not much. This is this is Samsung giving you guys a free lunch. It's like, wait, I mean, you, I can get the performance of a flagship for a thousand dollars less. Absolutely, especially the seventy-seven inch S ninety C. Congratulations, Lisa. She paid her bills while while watching. Was it, was it watching us? That's wonderful. Get something done. Yes, yeah, Samsung still claims they didn't know it was broken. I, 
I brought it to their attention. Like, what? How? We didn't know this. That is the claim. But who knows whether the engineers knew and just didn't tell anyone because where's the quality control, right? If, what, what is it? Having the fox watch the hen house. If the person who's supposed to catch this doesn't care and then he's being told about it, he goes, ah, don't worry about it. It's, it's a bunch of people, crazy people, overstating things, right? Okay, and what is EOTF? It is the brightness accuracy of a TV. Is it accurate to the source? So either you track it perfectly, which means if the source wants this much brightness, you're there. If you're over tracking, that means the TV wants it or the source wants it to be this bright, you're a little bit brighter. What you'll notice is the QM8, it over tracks EOTF. So in some scenes, it's a little bit brighter, but that's not accurate. I mean, it might be pleasant, but it's not supposed to be that bright. So Samsung used to do this. They over-tracked EOTF, meaning the brightness curve is this way, and it's riding on top a little bit above it, meaning it's brighter in scenes that it shouldn't be. And there are some TVs that under-track it, where it should be a certain brightness, but it's actually a little bit dimmer. Calibration often helps. In this case, after calibration, the QM8 continues to be a little bit brighter than it should be in HDR content. Hopefully, that's helpful. Our uh, EOTF also stands for Electro Optical Transfer Function. <laughs> That's all what you were asking. I mean, I can see where when we change it, it can make a difference for the shadows to go underneath the cow. Like, that was obvious. Sammy, did you bring your glass loop or jeweler's lens? Uh, I don't use one of those anymore. He doesn't use it anymore, Classy. Sorry. I use a microscope. Oh. Um, Lucas was just curious if you could tell the difference between the TCL and the high sense, if, if there's any, uh, as far as VA versus IPS, or if you can tell. Cassio says it looks different. That's why he was wondering. They do look different, for sure. So the high sense U7K on the modern right hand corner, yeah, on, I mean, on my screen, it looks like it's pushing green a little bit, but obviously. Camera, YouTube being what it is, it's, it's, we'll see. We'll talk about it once they're done. Does the G3 really run that warm or really hot? You know, let me go to the back of the TV and see. Let's see. It's been running for seven and a half hours, nonstop. My camera's been overheating, but does the G3 overheat? Let me go in the back of the panel and see. Oh, let me get around you real quick here. And the answer is no, it is. Okay, on the very top, it's a little bit warmer, but I wouldn't call it overheating. So there's some spot, there were some warm spots but not hot. So G3 is fine. It's doing its thing. Actually, I would want it to be warm on the outside because that means the heat's being released, but not even uncomfortably hot. I'd say warm in some spots at most, but the QD OLED is actually cooler. I'm looking for similar hot spots on the QD OLED. And there is no spot. Oh, wait, I think I found its PSU. There's one area that's warm same, you know, this is not scientific, it's my hand, but similar warmth as the G3 in one area, probably where the, but remember the, G, the S95C separated the processor on the One Connect box, so it's pulling away some of that heat into the external box, so that's very helpful for sure. And the LCDs are all running pretty good. Warm, they're all warm, but I wouldn't say overheating. Okay, good question there, CJ. Is the Hisense U7K better than my Samsung Q98? No, come on. 
It doesn't even have as many dimming zones as your Samsung Q90A. I would choose the Samsung Q90A over the U7K for many reasons, but most of which the black bars on the Q90A is untouchable, right? The U7K, only the U8H has matched it, and the Blooming Control has matched it, and the QM8 is the only one that beats the Q90A in black level and blooming control and specular highlights. The U7K is, yeah, it's, it, it can't even compare. It's not as good. So no, be thrilled with your Q98 for sure. The only shortcoming of the Q98 is the specular highlights are a little bit dim. And we're talking the tiny specular highlights, right? It just does not get bright enough. That's when you gotta go OLED. The U7K does that better, that one specular highlight, but I wouldn't do it just for that specular highlight because, you know, you've got lifted black bars and the contrast is not as good. Will I be going to Cydia this year, CE Critic? No, I, you know, I've never gotten into Cydia. I might, but I don't know, maybe, but I don't think so. Um, I think it's in September, right? I have to prep for the shootout at the end of September, so... Probably not this year. I've never gone. Maybe next year. <laughs> Robert, is Hisense still using 8-bit panels? As far as I know, 8-bit FRC is a big thing. So the, the answer would be yes, maybe. Does it matter? And this is a great point, Miyako. Overtracking OTF, meaning it's a little bit brighter than it should be, is more pleasing. This has been Samsung's thing ever since the Q9FN, right? They overtrack and people love it. Like, oh, it's brighter, blah, blah, blah. And of course, the cinema enthusiasts, oh, no, it's not accurate. The Sony's more accurate. And then you get the Sony home. But I like the Samsung more, it's brighter. Well, it's a little bit brighter than it should be. And they're just following, TCL's following Samsung's footsteps. Ironically, Samsung is now accurately tracking, but you can make it brighter by active, putting tone mapping to active makes it brighter, keeping it in static, keeps it accurate and QM8 should do that giving you the option to activate that slight bump in the EOTF that's fine but have an option to drop it to accuracy and it took Samsung a while to get that option right it took let's see since the Q9FN then 90R 90T 900T or 90T 90A so four five six years before they got that right so maybe a few more years TSO will do it Kurt still using his 2010 Panasonic Plasma. Good job. Steel cage match. Q7 versus QM8. Who'd you waste the cash on first? Get out with the QM8. Come on. It is clearly the better TV in many ways. Now, EOTF, EOTF tracking aside, a little bit brighter. I would rather have that. Q7 may also be tracking it brighter. It just loses out in blooming control and black levels and contrast. Not enough, not enough dimming zones drops the contrast, and you'll notice that. Okay, thank you for that question. A third. Just bought the 83-inch G2. Good purchase. Excellent TV. But was also looking at the 77-inch G3 MLA. What can I say? When it comes to regular watching like 4K streaming and 4K Blu-ray, how much of a difference does the brightness actually make versus size? Okay, it's not 4K streaming. It's not even the Blu-ray. It's HDR. If you are watching Mad Max, you will notice that difference. If you are watching certain movies, Aquaman, maybe if you're watching, there are certain HDR movies that are graded above 2,000 nits or above 1,500 nits. And you have that pop with the G3, you get it. And it's very satisfying. So you'll notice the difference. On the 83 inch, not bad, but MLA allows the G3 to get you those explosion of Superman versus Batman, where you have that bright scene, right? So the G2 does the darks very well, 
But then when it gets super bright, it just can't push that brightness, especially if the window's a little bit bigger. So in Batman versus Superman, the showdown in the dark, they have these big, bright explosions. The G3 explosions will get a lot brighter, and you'll, you'll feel it. The G2, you cannot. It just it doesn't have that MLA to get there. So if you watch those kind of movies, the G3, you will notice the difference. Now, if you watch romantic comedies, you watch Friends, right? You watch... 4K, but it's SDR. It's not HDR, and it's not graded bright, like impactful, the latest Netflix action flicks. The G2 is fine. So it's not 4K. It's the HDR, dynamic range. Bright, dark, in the same scene, right? The G3 does that better than any other LG prior. The G2 is large, great TV, 83-inch, SDR, just basic 4K. It's fine. I love it. And HDR is not always a good thing. Like Game of Thrones, <laughs> those dark scenes where you can't see, that's HDR. People go to SDR so they can see everything, right? So I would rather watch some of those Game of Thrones scenes in SDR because I see everything. And so that's something to keep in mind. HDR isn't always good, right? Sometimes the creator screwed up. And in that case, the HDR was just not bright enough for me, even in a dark room. So definitely content dependent but yeah share with us the kind of 4k movies you watch and we'll see like i don't know alita doesn't matter if it's a g2 or g3 it's not graded above 600 nits right but aquaman mad max there's certain movies where the extra explosion pop is unique to either the s90c s95c or the g3 you don't get there without that Okay. Why is the S95C looking dimmer than the others? I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. I mean, she's just kind of doing the same thing as the darkness. Okay. Dimming? If it's on the static image this whole time, maybe it considers it a static image. So the G3 might be following right after. We had this before where we keep on rotating these faces, although the faces change. Having that static image, that color checker there the whole time, the TVs think it's a static image and they will dim to protect itself. So it didn't happen with dynamic images, but this will be considered a static image. So keep that in mind. Hey, thank you for the super chat. Giddy G-Man. Hey, FOMO, have you seen the MBO Max soundbar? If yes, what do you think about it? And is it worth the price? So, I haven't seen it, like, reviewed it, but conceptually, the fact that you can add four subwoofers is great. Is it worth the price? I don't believe it's worth the price because it's more important to have discrete surround, and the Samsung Q990B or the Q990C gives you the additional speakers you need at a much lower price. So although it's base, is not there because with the MBO you could add like what, three, four subwoofers, my goodness. So you're gonna get even powerful base. But I just like having the surround being discreet. I think that adds more to the immersion. The 990B and the 980C soundbar from Samsung has enough base for a soundbar. And it's not gonna be quite as much as the MBO, but that surround, the rear surround is just so much better oh, oh, oh. with it. And so MBO is relying on yeah. algorithm and sound bouncing. And there's only so much you can do. It really is. So if it costs the same, maybe, because possibly it's better in music quality or whatever. But if we're just talking immersion, you can't replace discrete speakers that's available on the, uh, the 990B. This is why it's like the Nakamichi systems. Nakamichi has two subwoofers and four <laughs> surround, right? So Nakamichi, you don't have to go to the Dragon to get there. The other, the lesser expensive Nakamichi systems have four surrounds, right? And two subwoofers, and it's less expensive than the MBO with four subwoofers, so, or two subwoofers. So I think MBO is overpriced for what it is, but I'm sure the sound quality is good. But for me, you can't replace the number of discrete speakers that surround you. Good question. You took out all the dimming on the Samsung too, right? 
they're like the LG tracking right. Okay, did Samsung ever fix the low bitrate issue? It appears not. Some people who have the SNA 5C, including ratings, they said no. They've watched a ton of YouTube TV, should I get a G3 instead of an SNA 5C? Yeah, because you're not, you're not benefiting from the SNA 5C. YouTube TV does not benefit from the advances in QD OLED. The S95C is better because certain HDR scenes, certain color luminances, certain content is more complete on the S95C. YouTube TV does not get you there. So G3 would be the go to, way to go when you're watching YouTube TV because now you're going to benefit from what does affect you, the processor, the motion, the brightness. You can get Vivid on the G3 brighter than dynamic mode on the S95C. So these are things... That I think work better for YouTube TV watchers, and that's kind of my recommendation right now. But if you're critically watching movies on a high quality from a high quality source, like I do, like Cladoscape or a good Blu ray disc, then the S95C you can see some of the subtle color luminances that the G3 cannot render, right? So it really depends on your use case. But for YouTube TV, get the G3, you'll be happy. And here's someone with the Nakamichi, Iceman and Bob. Yes, Nakamichi 9.2.4. Sounds great. I highly recommend it over the MBO. Yeah, that's a, one of my favorite because it's that 0.4, right? That's the extra speakers. Can't replace it. Correct. Everything is in accurate mode. We're not artificially bumping it up with any kind of dynamic tone mapping. So film record mode, no dynamic tone mapping on anything. And static on the S95C, G3 Filmmaker, no dynamic tone mapping. And same with the TCL and the Hisense TVs. The Hisense UAK is listed at my local retailer as limited quantity. I don't know how many of them there are, and that could be possible. I know for sure that the UX, the Hisense UX, is definitely limited quantity. Maybe 500 units is what I'm hearing, maybe less. But if you're interested in the UX, definitely you have to keep your eye out for that. Whenever it's released, you got to snatch it. There's not going to be a lot of those. The UAK, I didn't hear it would be limited quantity, but it could be. So yeah, yeah, let us know if they're sold out already. Hey, Fjord, Fjord says, thanks. I just realized that I buy a new OLED every year and the most content I watch are TV reviews on YouTube. <laughs> it's awesome, thank you for watching. I love watching HDR. G2, a big upgrade from my G10, so it's an inch, even brighter than my A90J. Yeah, right? Isn't that crazy? The A90J with this much vaunted heat sink didn't do much, did it? So yeah, it's crazy the C3 is brighter than the A90J. Okay, Jesse, I can answer this question. Does anyone know if watching YouTube TV using a TV's native app on the TV would be better or worse than external streamer? Generally speaking, external streamers are better just generally speaking. Native apps in a TV, it's an afterthought for the TV maker. I would always recommend, if you have the option, and convenience is not a big deal, go with an external app, like Apple TV or whatever, and then start from there. And then you know, have your complaints. Because the internal app relies on the TV, the ecosystem for the app updates. I mean, it's sometimes they don't even update properly. So I'd always go with an external streamer if image quality is what you need to go for. However, if you have low bit rate, it doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> Native app, internal app, or external streamer, if you have a bad internet connection, nothing helps it really. You might have to go with an NVIDIA Shield or something where it may have better low bit rate scaling, but ultimately the TV's internal apps generally are, are not as good in rendering as the external apps. Facing him to his right, to our right, he has that part to do throughout. 
Which TV has got the more accurate white point? You know, we'll ask. Good question, new guy. Which TV has the more accurate white point now, or are they all the same? Well, I guess technically the S95B, because everything is being perceptually matched to, or not ah, S95B, C. S95C, because everything is being perceptually matched to that. Okay. So the S95C, because we're all perceptually matching to that, but you could make the G3 white point you can make a, accurate yeah. to a certain degree. I mean, they have that magenta tint issue, but... Yeah, I mean, you... White points kind of... You have your target. You, you have your target, and then once you go to reach your target, if you're perceptually matching everything else to it, like the white point is kind of irrelevant because it's mm -hmm. a perceptual match. So. All right. It, it just gets you to that foundation, and then you go from there. Right. So technically, before we started doing this, they were all D65, mm -hmm. right? But the question is, is which one actually looks like D65? Right. right. Just because the meter says it... Doesn't mean different... that it's actually going to look like it due to like metamorphic curve. So... And that's a great point, and a lot of people realize that. Yeah, so like a good example is... Um, say you have a bunch of projectors. Say you had a bulb-based projector and a laser projector. Or take the shootout at um, M-Wave last year. Okay. Okay, you have one bulb projector and the rest were lasers. Right. The bulb one probably had kind of a greenish look unless they matched the bulb to all the lasers. Because mm, like, the meter will show it's the same. The, yeah, the meter will show that they're exactly the same. Yeah. And that's the whole metamerism issue that we talk right. about is what your eyes see on the different technologies is different than what the meter sees. Yes. Yeah. All right. Because we're just targeting a coordinate with the meter, and then you... And then you go from there. Yeah, you go to make it actually look, have the look of D65. Yeah. So, like, one thing is, like, D65 does have a coordinate, mm -hmm. but it's an actual look. Like, that's what D65 is. It's, a, it's an actual look. It's not necessarily a coordinate, because perceptually matching the G3 to the S95C, does it measure D65? Mm -hmm. No, but it will look it like will D65. Look like and that's critical. Yeah. Once your perception matches, it looks like it, but then you throw out the meter, hey, something's wrong. It's not measuring D65 anymore, but that's the point. You want to see D65, right? Right. Uh, you know, what's interesting is on my monitor, the QM8 looks just like the U7K, the white walls, the D65. Right. But again, you know, it's going through layers of processing before it gets here. But I can, I do see a slight pink tint on the LG though, but yeah. I don't see it on the monitor. I mean, when it's we slight. Were, when we were matching that, uh -huh. there were certain mm -hmm. parts of the screen that we could not look at or consider for. Right, because like, it's like DSE. Part of the match. Yeah. yeah, because it was like, okay, this part right here looks like it has too much blue in it, but mm -hmm. it's like, or it's like pink or magenta. It's like we can't get rid of it because that is the actual panel. Yeah. So you have to look at very specific parts of it. So, like right where the uh, the clip is, it's holding the color checker chart. Yes. Like kind of around that area, there's like a very strong amount of magenta. Yeah. Around there. I can see that, and that makes it yeah you know, that makes it really difficult because now it's DSE, not the actual panel. You can't correct for that. Right. Well, it's like when Classy's mentioned that. You can measure one spot, and then you can move your meter just slightly to the left or to the right, That's and different. have something totally different come yeah. back. Yeah, he's not joking. Like just looking at it, you, you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. <laughs> you can eyeball it. That's a problem. You eyeball it. And I think that's why a lot of people, especially color readers, they can't go back to W OLED because you don't have to deal with that with uh, QD OLED as much. Yeah, that's why I'm I'm switching. I'm just waiting to see what happens with the so, N95L. Yeah. yeah. All right. Like now that there's something that fixes the problems that I don't have to deal with <laughs> or that always bug me, I'm going to do that. Like I'm going to resolve that problem. Man. It was just before that WRGB was just the best thing that you can get. Yeah. That's not the case anymore. Not the there's case anymore. <laughs> you know, this is the thing. It's like educating Consumers, it's one thing if it's a lot less expensive, but when it starts costing the same, LG is going to have to do something special to make the argument that 
this is why you pay more for our LGW OLED because the calibrators will be against it. They look really good, actually. I mean, well, I bought. We needed that blue offset adjustment. Remember, we did the blue on here; it needed that too. Oh, okay. You could see it in her face, but now they're matching better. And the contrast, I turned it all off. Is this S is this this is yeah. HDR? The HDR is this is HDR. Okay. So this it was crushing, but what about the scenes that it was all white? It was like the deer and the horses. That's its tone mapping. It doesn't tone map as well. Raise the exposure okay. just a little bit. There we go. Because there's actually, the, the black shirts have some shading. So I'm hoping to capture some of that subtlety for you guys. So the high sense, mm -hmm. it's got some panel issues. Yes, we saw that. So I wouldn't say that's really a calibration thing. It's got these yellow bands through it, which are going to cause a casting. The, <laughs> the horizontal bands. Yeah, yes. so perceptually, it's kind of difficult. Because yeah. um, I, I see it as like almost green in the black. So you're you're in the final stages of this perceptual matching, right? This is kind of like making sure it's as close as it's gonna get. Yeah. Okay. And then um, as soon as that's done, is Sammy over there, or did he go in the back? He might have. Oh, he went to the restroom. Okay. okay. All right. Here's here's the next question. Unknown. I watch all your videos, but I still am unable to buy the right TV. I want a huge screen. No real budget. That's good. It's a good start. No budget. Mixed use movies and gaming. Located in the basement, but it is well lit. So, 77 inch S95C. Let's start with that. And if you're unhappy, unknown, let us know. Let's start. If you have no budget, you're a gamer and you're in the basement, but it's well lit. 77 inch S95C. You, you could, it's hard to get better from that unless there's something specific about it you don't like. Then you can let us know, and then we'll make adjustments. But start with the top, and then we'll make adjustments laterally or specific to your use. Yes, metamorphism is... And you guys just type in metamorphism. <laughs> it's just Google metamorphism, right? Chat GPT metamorphism. But basically what your eyes see is different than what the meters see. And the meters are looking for something specific. Your eyes will see, wait, how come the meter says it's white, but the two TVs look different, but they're both the same, measure exactly the same. And this is the difference between you know, WOLED, QD OLED, LCD TVs, and so forth. Hey, Asaf. Here's a great question. And I purchased a Panasonic 4K Blu-ray player, but it could not keep a solid HDMI signal. I lose the signal every five minutes. Try different cables using the X95J. Any suggestions to fix? Oh, well, buy the exact same player and test it and see if it happens on that player as well. If it does, then it could be your, so you have three points of failure. The, the player itself, the cable and your TV. So it sounds like the cable is not the issue, right? Assuming you tried a couple of cables, then it's either the player or the TV. So buy another player. I hope you still have all that. See if it still loses a signal. If it yeah. does, then it's your TV. I won't say it loses. If, yeah, and then, you know, return the player. If it doesn't, then, well, it's the player. <laughs> so um, that's the only way to know. Uh, but you need to get an identical player or any player, really. <clears throat> get any. Blu-ray player, it doesn't have to be the Panasonic, but it would be nice if it's the same player because then you, you have an apples to apples, but even, but if it's the TV, then it doesn't have to be the same player. Um, yeah, so let me know, Asaf, what it ends up being. Let's go through your questions here. Been working all day on this. Yeah. And 
of course, the burning question. And what about burn-in from ratings that say QD OLED is worse than W OLED? For their testing conditions, sure. How many people watch under those testing conditions? That's the problem. Extrapolating what we will have as burn-in and what ratings. The, the connection between cause and effect is, I think it's too distant. It's not proximate enough where I could say, oh, you know, I can extrapolate this. I know I'm going to get burned in, in three years or whatever. Yeah, you can't. I, I don't think you can. I really don't think so. <laughs> Unknown. I just dropped 50 Gs for a basement renovation. Oh, yes. So setting aside about 4,500 for the 77 inch S95C, and now you're down to 43 Gs, right? 45 Gs. Come on, unknown, you know, you cannot completely soundproof any room. I'm assuming even with floating everything, right, it's very hard to soundproof. If there's any part of that room touching any part of your house, it's going to leak out. That's just low vibrations, baby. This is going to happen. So new guy says, so calibrators prefer skin tones to white point. Well, they would like both to be perceptually matched, but here's the thing. You will see pale skin. If it's too green, you're going to notice it more than a wall that may or may not be the correct tone. So it's not that they prefer skin tones, but rather calibrators have a client. And if they leave and the client sees skin that looks unnatural, they're going to notice it real fast. But if they see a wall that maybe should be orange, but instead it's slightly yellow, but they don't make the connection that something is off. You will know something is off when the skin tone is off, especially skin tones of, of uh, ethnicities you're very familiar with, right? You will know, like, wait, that doesn't look like it's the right shade. So getting the skin tones right is very important because it's not as annoying. If it's, if it's wrong, it's very annoying if the green is off. Now, the wall, and this is perfectly white, but even then people will say, well, it's not cool enough. Or Like, most people don't like these 65 walls because it doesn't look white. They think white point is white. You know, oh, it's a little warm, whatever. But skin tones, everyone will agree. Wow, this woman looks sickly. There's a little bit too much green. You want to make sure, perceptually, unless the creator intended her to look green, uh, they want the skin tones just boom. So it's because the client will notice that. If you're going to have something wrong, if you can have them both perfect, great. But if you're going to err on one over the other, you got to err on skin tones. Otherwise, it'll be marked down by your client. Hey, Dolby Mance, is this the longest live stream ever? Were you here last year when we did this? This is our third year of doing these calibration live streams. Uh, when you have five TVs, it's unavoidable. And I'm going to hand it to the, the team showing up, helping out. This is, it's, it's a marathon, but it's, it's, for me, it's fun. I love talking TVs. I love seeing these TVs get better with a little bit of calibration, right? You know, what is the best way to improve your TV? And Mozart Ghost has just nailed it. Get new glasses, right? The biggest upgrade I made was getting an eye exam and correcting my bad vision. <laughs> Aging eyes. We lose acuity as we age. Hearing and sound, right? Sight and hearing. Hearing and sight are the two things that go as you get older. You start losing you know, high frequency and all that good stuff. And yeah, you might not even realize. So... Don't you love it, Mozart? Like the man squinting has an 8K TV. It's like you got to address your eyesight before you upgrade to an 8K TV. Or the classic, if you guys know, bicyclists, right? They're, they're paying an extra $5,000 for carbon fiber this and that. So, you know, they're saving 20 grams. And yet, they're a little overweight. So, it'd be easier to lose a pound than pay $10,000 to take half a pound off your bike. So, bike enthusiasts... If, you, if you're any of you are one, they will pay an extra $500 for it. Two seats, the difference is maybe 10 grams. It's $500, maybe more, maybe 5,000, depending on how low those 10 grams are. Or pedals, right? Two pedals, carbon fiber, you know, $1,000, $100, looks the same, slight differences in grams, paying a lot of money. And yet, they could just lose two pounds, and that's worth how much? So this, this is very similar. I, I love that. The comment is it's cheaper to lose weight than to buy a lighter bike. <laughs> Lisa's on it. 
my appointment with optometrist is Friday. And you know what, Lisa? Suddenly, oh, my TV looks even better. It's like, now it looks like a flagship TV. What's happening? Or the best yet, I, when I had, when I was a kid, I had these glasses. And you wear it over time and it gets all scratched up. But you don't realize it, right? Because it's accumulating over time. And then when I got new glasses, like, oh, wow. The world is suddenly clear because it was just so scratched up. So, yeah, replace your glasses frequently, too. Is this stream going to break the length record of the first SI5B? Uh, most of my live streaming ones do. This is eight hours, right? So the the one at Valley Electronics two months ago was about eight hours. So it broke that one. I think that one ran for seven and a half. So this is a long one. But we got a lot of TVs, and you know, the team is kind of perceptually matching. We want to get it right for you guys. All right, it's going through your questions and you know, talking about the whole burn in test, right? So, we have to remember, ratings calls it a, I guess, a longevity test or aging, accelerated aging or whatnot. It's not necessarily a burn in test. That's the problem, right? It's like what happens if we push these TVs really hard for as long as possible in extreme conditions? What will happen then? So, it's kind of an experiment. It's, it's like saying, you know, how long does a man live if he doesn't drink water? Okay, he died three days or whatever, right? Okay, man can only live in three days, but then you have to have the caveat if there's no water. And so say with the TV, oh, the TV burns in in this much time. But you have the caveat, well, under these and these conditions. So as long as you know the conditions, you shouldn't be too worried. But as you can see right here in this, you, go, you could already see that the spectacular highlights on... The G3 and the S95C are very similar. I mean, like, hey, where did my S95C button go? Did I just lose it? Oh, here it is. For some reason, ah, it's back. There we go. So, in specular highlights on the OLED, a little bit brighter than the other TVs because that's what OLEDs do really well. You guys good? Good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's, let's flash through this. Ah, oh, thank you so much, guys. I know the perceptual matching is the most painful part because now it's all a judgment call, right? Yes. So, all right. all right. So let me go through the settings just real quick. And here's the remote. Okay. Okay. So let's go start with the S95C. So just a quick review. Settings, filmmaker mode. This is best for HDR. Expert settings, contrast, take it down to 45 because we want to recover some of that gradient. The gradient details that's lost and clipped above 45. Now that, I'll, with a caveat for that, that needs more testing because based off of conversations I've had with say like Matt and with like Classy and whatnot, they're leaving theirs at 50. I found that 45 worked pretty well. It changes where it actually um, diverges, where it starts to clip okay. within your um, your RGB balance. Okay. But theirs might track better for EOTF than mine. So it, it depends on the scene in the movie. The only reason I noticed that is in some scene, wait, how come the G3 has more detail? And then we take the contrast down, it's back. But then, yeah, you lose a little bit of something. So there's right. always a so compromise. That would definitely need to be test it more but for today that's what i settled out okay with great uh color 20 tint g1 and let's see static of course warm 2 okay shadow detail no adjustments there and there we go oh so custom you did the so these are yes so that's custom um bt 2020 mm -hmm. i did uh red green and blue Red, like green. red, green, and blue, that also aligns my secondaries as well. Right, and this is for my TV, guys, so this is just sharing what we did. Does it, at least you know what we played with, so you could have fun with it, but without a meter, you don't know where you need to be. <laughs> uh, I think the contrast, for me, makes the biggest difference because you actually see it, but without a reference, you don't know what to change. And there's so much variances between TVs. So overall, before and after on the S95C, 
was it a huge improvement change to you? Um, once you fixed it in the service menu, mm -hmm. it was pretty much, I would say, 95% there. Okay. And what did you fix in the service menu? Uh, the white balance. Ah, okay. All right. And, and now it's pretty much, this is accurate as these TVs normally get, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the G3, there's not much done to it because, well. Well, so we did uh, white balance. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you can't get into the service menu anymore. Right. So okay. uh, just did white balance within the user menu. And then um, the tone map upload. Oh, yeah, because it's a LUT. So, yes, yeah, so you have your special. did uh, Dolby Vision uh, tone, mm -hmm. or config file. So let's talk about the Dolby Vision. Mm -hmm. This obviously requires professional calibration tools. What adjustments did Dolby Vision need out of the box that you had to address? Uh, pretty much for the most part, Dolby Vision needs um, a little bit of RGB balance, and it needs to have a tone map upload. If you don't do a tone map upload, it's not going to track the OTF. So is it out of the box black crushing a little bit, near black, the near black shadow details crushed? What um, was the issue? LG put out a firmware mm -hmm. to help with the factory 1D LED for Dolby Vision because it was crushing on previous firmware. Right. Yes. So if a, if a calibrator calibrated before that firmware came out manually, then now it's lifted. This but if to you go use okay. Calman uh, to do everything, then it's negated, so it'll be accurate. Okay. And, and now for the giant killer QM8, we saw all these different... Two points, 20 points overall. Is this an improvement over the Roku 6 series? What were the issues? So it's an improvement because of how the Roku controls worked. Um, these controls don't work that great either, honestly. So you your two point will work, mm -hmm. um, but they're very, very coarse. So a small change um, or a small, you know, change within one of the values has a big difference okay so you don't have the granularity um and then when it comes to things like your 20 point they legitimately just don't work um, so you use two point and yeah, two just kind of stuck yeah. it at that and then you can get around um some of the missing uh cms features by using uh global tint and color so the most important question is after the calibration, how close does it get to like a G3 with all the tools in place? Is it close enough where you can say, you know what? It's hard to see the difference. No. Or, or it's still off. Well, see, that's where it kind of, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. Because you could have something that measures very well. Mm -hmm. But you can look at it and see that there's a lack of contrast. So it doesn't matter how it measures at that point. Right. Because that's, I think it's visible. So, exactly. I mean, it measures well. I like think it's getting like a point, like a point six and a max of one. Like, yeah, I, sh I showed you like when you came over. Like, well, so, before. so the QM eight is their flagship. It's, yeah, it's, it's accurate. Now, like, you can get it accurate, but can you get it as accurate as a G three? No. No. Um, I wouldn't expect to be able to. And even if you can, it's still an LCD, and it's still going to lack a lot of contrast. Do you have the same difficulty with the Q7? Yeah. So same, 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 so same the, all the same issues, the right? the settings are not anywhere close to one another, though. Okay, so very different settings. So, uh, yes. The, so the Q7, what are you noticing as a shortcoming compared to the, Q, the QM8? If it's obvious, because it might be very subtle. Um, tone mapping. Tone mapping, yeah. tone mapping right? It's, it's, it's not tone mapping very well at all for yeah. the higher brightness. And if you use dynamic uh, tone mapping to kind of like recover the detail for things that are getting clipped out, yep. then you're crushing yep. the lower end. Yeah. So the biggest issue that I take from any LCD, but these are very exacerbated, the TCLs do not have a wide viewing angle at all. They have a very, very narrow sweet spot for contrast. Yeah. This one is more narrow than that one. Yes. This, this one has a wider viewing angle. Right. This is the QM8. Yes. So the QM8 has a narrower viewing angle than the Q7. Oh, interesting. Okay. And now... And it's very extreme. It is 
Wow. Pretty much complete. That's that's crazy. That's crazy. So if, you, if you were to duck down, you were going to look at a completely different TV when your head is centered. Uh huh. And the issue is when I was sitting here just to the right, it looked completely different. Like the color shift is so <laughs> different that maybe if you're a gamer and you're just sitting dead on with this TV, it's great because it's super bright and you won't notice the difference. But as a family room TV, if you have like a sectional couch, uh -huh. I can't recommend that TCL because it's got such a color shift off angle that only one person is going to enjoy the TV. Oh, how funny. Well, yeah, when I was sitting here calibrating and he was sitting over there, he was just like, oh, what's, what's wrong with it? Then he actually got up and sat where I was sitting. I was like, okay. And then you also, so it's so narrow that you can see a difference just by changing your height <laughs> to the television. Yeah. No, like, seriously. So, like, if you kneel down, uh -huh. you gain contrast. Like, you will actually see more contrast. Right. Standing. More saturation. More, yeah, everything. Yeah. Now, what about the high sense? So, we know that it has the, the issues with the DSC, right? You have that horizontal yellow yeah. that um, kind of pervades it. Which one was the one last year? The U8H? U8H last year. Yeah, that one's better. Yeah, that yeah, that one. Good. That one had that one almost matched the Sony in so many ways. So this is the as far as adjustments, what was the out of the box? What is it now? Like where oh yeah, I can see some of that yellowness in it. I I like the contrast on the high sense. The issue is that it seems like we just have a panel uniformity issue with mm -hmm. the backlight. Right. Which is causing it you can only calibrate one way or the other and either way you're fighting against the panel. Yeah. So, so I would even ignore settings on the high right. sense because they're there to yeah. try to combat that yellow. And I noticed you have dynamic tool mapping on. Was that you left it on, or I think it's because I didn't do much to this one myself. I was focused more on the TCL. Okay. So with this one here, settings-wise, this is very—it's not similar to say a Sony, but you know, I was saying like with this one, you only have. Um, CMS for just saturation uh -huh. color. Here you have actually like a full CMS. Oh. But the, pro the problem is, is that because you have those vertical, um, I'm sorry, like horizontal bands mm -hmm. for like the backlight, oh. you can actually measure, because Matt moved my meter <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> I'm measuring at one point, he moved my meter, is measuring something completely different because it is, it's kind of oh. on This was the one that had the Calman service, whatever that means. Yeah, that's not. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. Do you remember the black and gold dress? That image of the dress on the internet, people yeah. are like, is it? So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. From the, the illusionist or whatever. So imagine putting a meter on that dress and ah. trying to ca color calibrate. That's the problem we ran into on the Okay, yeah. got it. And it's a panel issue. I think it's just a bad issue. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, but we don't know if this is, we don't know if it's going to be like run of the mill. Them, yeah, yeah, all of them, or if it's just this particular yeah. one. Um, so this one did two point, then we did some matching. Uh, perceptual matching and then when we're looking at content i think we turn dynamic contrast or i turned dynamic contrast on because without it you had absolutely no detail in the back with the horses i think if i clipped all of it yeah. up, oh completely. interesting it does darken so the, the girl with the darker skin tones with that dynamic contrast on she was very very dark with it off she matched EOTF. So I'm noticing like lifted blacks currently because the dynamic contrast is off uh, for it to have the same like correct levels. So it's one of those issues where it's like you can crush down to increase contrast, but technically that's not accurate. So this one right here, this I was stopping here. I noticed the G3, the reds are very deep, bright, saturated, and the S and the S95C is not. Who has it right on this one? Because this is one we're talking about. If there was a reference TV, where is the issue? Or are they both right? <laughs> what are your thoughts on this scene right here? Knowing this content, I would say the S95C is correct. Uh, I feel like if there was no LUT, like a matrix LUT done on the G3, it usually pushes it usually out saturates. red. Yeah, but it, it'll push out the red channel, which is probably what you're seeing in that sunset. Now, we do have a th the 3D LUT on it, though, right? No. Or, oh, okay. Uh, and 
I'm not going to put a three by three matrix to oh, replace. Just to do that. Got it. Yeah, got it. Got it. Fashion, no, but, but it would have fixed it though. I mean, just because it would desaturate, but then you're going to have posterization. Correct. So okay. Yeah, so, so there so you go. So now yeah. I would rather have this. Yes. And not have poster, posterization, right? right? Because that's more noticeable. Because this still looks natural. It's just next to the other TVs. Are, wait, it's a little bit of red. So, yeah. so yeah. it's like you're, you have posterization already, anyways. I'm, what I don't want to do is add more, add to it, right? Because right? this becomes much more noticeable. So at that point, it's pretty much like you said, the lesser of two evils. It's it's all about compromises. So all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on. Just quick movie content. Mm -hmm. We'll go through it real quick and then you know we should be done. Sweet. So all right guys. Give me a minute here. Let me swap it out. Okay, I'll be right back. Oh, something is amiss. All right. Okay. I think they're all connected. Waiting for the Samsung to connect. Yeah, so if you look at the you know ratings charts for the burning tests, uh huh. It's gotta be going like full blast on all these TVs because if you look at the nit rating, right? It's at six hundred. Oh. Which means they're going like full more. Yeah, full vivid mode, twenty four seven. I know it's yeah, it's it's so insane. I kind of take those with a lot of skepticism. A huge grain of salt, right? Yeah. And if you really want to do it proper, do it out of the box for the energy saving mode is still on. <laughs> you know, because that's how consumer is. Okay. It's running. It's waiting for all the TVs and all the splitters <laughs> to, to, to oh, match up and sync. Oh, fun. It's almost there. And the Samsung is not seeing it. <clears throat> all right. Let's try this again. Okay. One more time. Let's plug it in one more time. Okay, let's try that. Sorry, guys. It takes a while for all the TVs to catch up, but we'll get there. It's just waiting for Samsung now. Or not. This may happen or may not happen. At worst, we'll just run it without the Samsung. Okay, then let's just do it. Hmm. Let's do it this way. Okay, we'll have to leave you out of this one, Samsung, but you look so much like a G3 anyway, so. What are you gonna do? Okay. 
something out. Can I uh, because I have to run an extra fifth one out because I only have a four-way matrix. Oh. See, so I have to split it out here and add a Samsung because there's only room for four. And so the fifth one is like, yeah. Let's try this it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let me run it again then. One more time then. Let's see. Well, I'm just going to plug it in first and see if it catches it. Yeah, sometimes it's the order you do it also, which is kind of nuts, but that's just how they are. It's like temperamental. Okay, let's see it. They might have to see it first, and hopefully the rest catch up. Will it do it? Will it stick? Will it stick? It might. I'm going to have to play something and see what happens. I don't know. Sometimes I'm... Yeah, I think the splitter, it's, I think the splitter is having, pro I think the splitter on the, on the HD series side is having trouble, so, oh well. I just have to get another splitter. This is like my, <laughs> I, I go through a splitter, a matrix, once a year, sometimes twice. That's why I have the mono price one year warranty, right? All right, guys, let's do this live stream, save content. And, okay. So maybe I just focus on those TVs, get it closer. Oh, here we go. All right, maybe we do it this way. Okay. Okay, so if you're watching real content, so spin calibrated and so forth, but ultimately everything moves so fast that when you're seeing HDR, can you guys tell that? I know you're on the side, so you're gonna see the saturation differences, but, like and right there you can see the difference. Obviously there's some I'm lifted missing, blacks right there. something on the contrast for like local grooming, because I feel like you should go black, right? Uh, I don't think we had anything. So maybe check and just see if yeah, that's that, black back. Yeah, it used to, it was black earlier, so maybe. Yeah. So go advance, brightness, and just check. Ooh. There oh. you go. Oh, wait, no, it should, the other one. Right. Uh, local dimming should be on high. Uh, not you dynamic high. There, there you go. No, there. not that one. That one. There we go. Yeah, that one has to go high. There we go. That's there the one. one I had on and you turned it off. No, so let's so same 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 with the QM8. Yeah, this one needs that back on too. So where is that? Here we go. I'll turn it on. Now we got the black. Now we have like wait, what happened to my blacks? See guys, when it's calibrated, this is how it's supposed to work. All right. We right, were matching on a bright scene. So. so that should be the local contrast. Where'd it go? Well, oh, there you go. That's like your local dimming. Yeah. All right. The specular highlights. That's such a difference off angle. You can tell which one's OLED off angle now, huh? Very easy. Yeah, you can see the lifted blacks on the U7K. The Q7 had, has a little bit deeper blacks than the black bars, because mm -hmm. the black bars is where you really see it. Yeah. But the QM8 is pretty good for... Yeah, they're both pretty good. Like I said, the high sense from last year was so much better than this one right here. Yeah, the U8H, yeah. after calibration, was excellent. So this is testing for just the APL in a bright scene. This QM8 going to be... This Q-Mace, yeah. 
so the G3, this is a specialty, right, with the MLA. And this scene goes long enough that it's, the QM8 preserves the contrast in that scene. Whereas the other ones, it's bright, but it's kind of washed out. The, the... Well, off angle, like if you sit here, uh -huh. Keanu looks like he's a ghost. <laughs> he's just a beard, <laughs> a when floating he beard. Ephemeral, he looks washed out. Right. Um, where the G3 looks best, you actually get contrast off angle. Right. You're not still seeing that blue. Yeah, I'm sorry. Off angle, I am. You are. Yeah. Off angle. Oh, yeah. Blue. He was dead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not even Keanu. That's not a real actor. So this one is the Mad Max scenes where you have the nice and bright areas. And other than black bars, inside the scene is actually pretty good on angle. Off angle, you're going to notice the desaturated colors, obviously. This is the 7? Yes. Yes. The, the Q7 is actually pretty good. I think the Q7 looks better than the U, UX, the U7K. I'd say the Q7 has yeah. deeper blacks. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Good specular highlights. I'm a fan of the Q7 for sure. And the Q7 doesn't have mini LED. So it's all about what you do with similar number of dimming zones. And the mini LED right. didn't do much. I'd say motion's better than the high sense too. Just that one scene. I know that scene that movie has very weird motion. Yeah. But it looked cleaner. I think if it wasn't for the black bars, it was full screen. And on angle, you'd have a hard time saying that one technology, because they really have the dynamic range. It's not clipping in all the wrong places. So this is a great one with the bright scene with the fluorescent light. The U7K, without dynamic tone mapping, it cannot keep up. But here, like these whole screen scenes, you can tell which is OLED or not, unless you're off angle, right? But on angle, it looks very similar now. Yeah, so you really need to be sitting right in front of this Q&A to yeah. appreciate it. I, this is what I'm thinking, like, as a full screen TV, it's almost a waste of money to get the G3 because you're not getting those critical elements in a dark room, right? You're just blasting it in vivid mode. So this is the one where, well, this the, is show the tone mapping. Yeah. On, on the, there you go. Now, letting it go full. See, on the QM8, it's lacking that contrast. Right. But playing with contrast doesn't do anything. No. On the S95C, bring it down to 45, brings it back to where the G3 is. Yeah, and you can see on the 7 series, it doesn't tone map as well, mm -hmm. most likely to the, to the actual like local dimming zones. But it can't tone map as well as the 8. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great scene just to look at the... Yeah. the detail. I mean, it gets as bright, but you're losing it completely in the Q7 and the U7K. And the high sense looks like it's just not hitting the brightness levels. Yeah, it's just Doesn't, not as much pop. It's, it's all it could do. So this is the one where the U7K actually does not have that overshoot, chrominance, yeah. pulsing, banding issues. It yeah. did a pretty good job. Uh, Classy says no one can see the TCL. What was that? He said no one can see the TCL. No one can see the TCL? I can, I can yeah. see all four. What? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, is something happening? What the heck? Oh my goodness. So how weird is that? What, what is it? I don't know. It's not, is my exposure, exposure totally off? Let's try this again. I'm sorry guys, is exposure completely off? Oh, the image 
the oh. cutting right here. See? Hello. Hello. Hey guys. Sorry. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, you know what? Let's do this again. You guys? Here. I want to throw it at one more time. Sorry, I apologize. My bad. I, I moved everything, but then like an image blocked everything. So, all right, we'll do it real quick. We'll skip through it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, let me adjust exposure a bit. Apologize for that. I'm glad someone's checking the chat. So in these sort of movies, they're very similar. Full screen, bright, things are popping. Now, if you pause and you look at the details, you'll notice maybe the contrast difference between the TVs, but ultimately they're so similar because it's just so fast moving. Okay, let me see how this one looks. So this is a great one because it's got HDR pop, it's got the contrast, and it's difficult without the black bars. Inside between the black bars, they look great. So look at the specular highlights. Right? Very similar. The U7K is a touch behind, the Q, and of course the most color saturation is in the S, is in the G3. Let me take this off. There you go. So this is completely off. Sorry, guys. Okay, more confusion. Got to be cleaned up. All right, so that should be better. Okay, we continue. There is no S95C. It's just the G3, the Q7, the QM8, and the U7K. All right, let's try that again. So spectral highlights, you see how the G3 pops the most because it's OLED, but look at the U7K. It's the closest which is pretty good, but then everything else is kind of not so good. So, oh, yeah, nailed it. So, you have all these specular highlights. The Q7 probably has the weakest specular highlights, but it's very close. In the past, you would not get this close to the G3 or any OLED. It's those little specular highlights we talk about. The QN98 cannot get as bright as any of these TVs. Okay, let's move to the next one. Now, oh, you guys know what happened here. It's just bright. They all do brightness well. Let's move to the next one. Oh, the G3 appears to be the brightest in this case. So G3 bright room for this movie, well done. The fire breathing guitar and okay. So right there, they all look really good. Of course, if I increase exposure, you'll see slight blooming of the black bars on the U7K, just so you'll see. See that? That's what happens. But between the bars, they all look pretty good. Okay, so this is super bright. So a little exposure, so you guys can catch that. 
the contrast is actually pretty good on all of them, but the G3, because it's white, subpixel, that's a specialty, it does that the best. You can really see that separation in the brightness in the G3, and this is what you're paying extra for. And the S95C will look very similar. Actually, the G3 might even be a touch brighter because of that white subpixel. That's its strength. This scene is what the white subpixel gets you. I think. Right, let's go to pan. Here we go. All right. And there you have it, the load exposure. This is the last scene. You have more of that gradient color detail separation. On the G3, it's bright, but you have everything there. The other TVs, when you hit that brightness, even with dimming zones, you cannot match self-emissive. And this is why you pay the big bucks, is for scenes like this where you get everything. But look how fast this scene is going, right? Do you really notice that? Well, it's still the sun. It's still the bright sun. It's still impactful. But you know now, right? So you cannot unsee that detail when you see the scene. So if you go through a scene that's typically moving, and this is not even fast moving, do you notice it? They're all relatively bright, but does the G3's additional detail, does that make a difference? Okay, so... Oh, you're yeah, going to pause on this one. So last one. Maybe we can catch the pulsing. And... Okay. Hopefully. Okay. So on the G3, you see that ring around the... The ring around the flare. The G3 is unable to fully... I guess make it red. There are banding, color bands around that, whereas the other TVs, it's okay. But you can't have everything right. The S95C does not have this issue, but this is just what happens with WOLED right now. And this is why a lot of calibrators or enthusiasts, they watch these scenes, they rather get the S95C, which doesn't have these issues. So, all right. And, oh. This is just pure brightness, and the G3 does this better than the C3. So if there was a C3, it just cannot get as bright in the explosive the explosions, the flashes, right? The G3 is a match for the QM8. Very low exposure, you guys can see how bright that gets. Right now, wow, the brightest is the Q7. Isn't that crazy? That the Q7 is actually brighter than the QM8 in that brightest part of the scene. So this is what we're talking about. But the G3 is close. Let me see. Yep. The G3, so the, Q, the Q7 is the brightest. Then the U7K, then the G3, and the QM8 in the scene. Not as bright, but it's very subtle. So unless I had my the exposure on the camera, I would be unable to tell the difference. But very subtle. It's not like you guys would be able to tell without it being side by side. This is a great HDR movie because this is why you get at least a Q7. So right now I'm looking at it, the Q7 edges out the U7K, no doubt. All right, I think that's it. Oh, now that's it. Okay. All right, let's wrap this up. It's been over eight hours, almost nine hours, guys. Thank you. Let me throw myself back in there. And hey, okay, I'm back here. All right. So quick wrap up. I mean, how, how quick can it be? Thank you for showing up, everyone. I will kind of look through this and try to pull out the important stuff. But ultimately, the G3 and the S95C, amazing. And if you're watching movies, the G3 really is going to look exactly like the S95C. It's when you have things like Spears and Muscle, 10,000 minutes, specific scenes that we hand select. Otherwise, there is very little difference between the S95C, the S95C, and the G3. So shop between those three as flagship TVs. Now, as for the Q7 versus the U7K, 
after calibration, the Q7, well, let's just take the DSE and the yellow <laughs> horizontal banding aside. The Q7 appears to have brighter specular highlights and just better blooming control, deeper blacks. So Q7 wins, and those are important things that you will see without calibration. And the QM8, what can I say? You know, wait for the U8K. It's, we know off angle, it's got issues, but the question is on angle, it looks great. It's got the deep blacks, it's, it's got the pop. And so can the U8K unseat it? Let me know what you guys think. And thank you for hanging out, everyone who's here and still here. Until next time, stop the FOMO.